Today, the House Oversight Committee heard testimony from FBI officials, including the Bureau's general counsel, Howard Shapiro. Representative William Klinger, on your screen right now, chaired this three-hour and 45-minute hearing. The Committee on Government Reform and Oversight uh, will come to order. Uh, this morning we are uh, going to have a panel from the FBI with us this morning to discuss a number of matters. And as we have proceeded in full committee hearings of this nature in the past, uh, I will give an opening statement, be followed by an opening statement by Mrs. Collins. Uh, we will then go to uh, the witnesses to hear their uh, statements and comments, and then members who have opening statements may use their five minutes uh, to make them or may submit them for the record, either one. Back in the wake of the May 1993 travel office firings and the White House's struggle to explain why they had called in the FBI to investigate the employees, the White House called the FBI communications director to the White House for a press strategy meeting. Mr. Collingwood, uh, amended the FBI statement, and the White House promptly reported the FBI was initiating a criminal investigation. The White House and the FBI were properly chastised by Congress, the press, and subsequent reviews of this matter for this abuse of the FBI. Justice Department spokesman Carl Stern, in a memo written in May of 1993, observed, quote, once Collingwood arrived at the White House and found the President's lawyers, three of them, attending the communications huddle, shouldn't he have backed out and called for reinforcements. Even at that time, the administration's Justice Department spokesman recognized the FBI needed reinforcements to resist politicization by this White House. Upon taking the reins at the FBI, Director Free observed, quote, I want to cite the lessons that must be learned from an event that occurred shortly before I became FBI director. It concerned a White House official calling directly to the FBI with instructions to investigate alleged wrongdoing by employees in the White House Travel Office. It was an unfortunate incident and an example of matters that we will avoid at all costs. When I was asked to become FBI director, I told the President that the FBI must maintain its independence and have no role in politics. President Clinton fully agreed, no politics in the FBI, no exceptions." Close quote. But the travel office firings were not the end of this White House's attempts to use, and in my view, abu abuse the FBI. On June 14, 1996, following an initial review of the Filegate matter, the FBI director issued a report stating the FBI had been, quote, victimized as a result of relying upon the good faith and integrity of the White House. Today, we will further explore the practices and policies that led to what the FBI director called, quote, egregious violations of privacy. On June 14th, the June 14th FBI report demonstrated that the FBI engaged in a practice in which it deferred to the White House and didn't ask questions. But clearly, questions had been raised. The FBI had a background report on Craig Livingstone, which we now know raised questions for the Secret Service. The FBI had even more information about Livingstone. Why didn't anyone raise questions about the person in charge of this sensitive position, or at least alert staff to be on guard? Of course, Ms. Larson, who headed up the name check unit, couldn't be expected to know about Mr. Livingstone. The fact that Ms. Larson and others trusted White House officials should, of course, not be held against her. We would hope that career officials throughout the government would not have to be suspect of shady characters and positions of trust at the White House. It has been pointed out repeatedly over the last two months that neither the FBI files nor the responsibility for handling them should have been entrusted to Craig Livingstone. After the June 14th report was completed, Attorney General Reno briefly requested a full investigation by the FBI. However, on June 20th, she turned over the investigation to independent counsel Starr in order to avoid a conflict of interest. Uh, Attorney General Reno stated, quote, I have concluded it would constitute a conflict of interest for the Department of Justice itself to investigate the matter involving an interaction between the White House and the FBI, a component of the Department of Justice. 
As we proceeded to take depositions in this matter, FBI Director Free requested the committee allow the FBI to provide the background, FBI background files themselves instead of questioning the agents. Dennis Scalambrini, the agent who conducted Craig Livingstone's background investigation, was deposed by the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight on July 15, 1996, but in keeping with the FBI's request, Agent Scalambrini did not disclose information from Mr. Livingstone's background file. On this same day, my Chief Investigative Counsel, at the suggestion of Director Free, had scheduled a meeting at the FBI to review the FBI background files on Mr. Livingstone and Mr. Marcisa. Apparently, in preparation for this anticipated review of Mr. Livingstone's file, the FBI reviewed the file and came upon the interview notes, which state that Mr. Nussbaum claimed that Rick Craig Livingstone came, quote, highly recommended by the First Lady, Hillary Clinton. FBI General Counsel Shapiro was informed of this information and shortly after, thereafter, we understand, gave the White House a heads up, reading the notes verbatim over the phone to Deputy White House Counsel Kathleen Wallman. Prior to doing so, he contacted Deputy Attorney General Gorlick's office and notified her chief of staff and told him he was going to pass it on to the White House. Ms. Wallman notified White House Special Counsel Jane Sherburn. Ms. Sherburn then spoke with FBI Deputy General Counsel Tom Kelly and put put out what appears to have been an all-points bulletin to people throughout the White House and interested parties on the outside. The following is a listing, perhaps still incomplete, of the people who were alerted to the White House, in the White House, to, the, to this information by Ms. Sherborn or her associates. The First Lady, the First Lady's Chief of Staff, Maggie Williams, White House Deputy Chief of Staff, Harold Ickes, to whom Ms. Sherborn reports, White House Deputy Chief of Staff, Evelyn Lieberman, two attorneys for Bernard Nussbaum, two attorneys for Craig Livingstone, senior White House advisor George Stephanopoulos, White House damage control spokesman Mark Fabiani, and other White House associate counsels, including John Yarowski, Sally Paxton, and, quote, perhaps others, according to Ms. Sherburn. On July 16, 1996, my chief investigative counsel reviewed the FBI background files on Craig Livingstone and Anthony Marcisa. No one from the FBI called me to read a verbatim account of the Nussbaum notes. Apparently, no one at the FBI read a verbatim account of these notes to anyone at the Independent Counsel's Office, and I did not review the file personally until July 18th of this year. On July 16th, there was another unusual occurrence. Two senior headquarter FBI agents appeared at the home of FBI agent Dennis Scalambrini to talk with him about this interview of Bernard Nussbaum and ask for his notes of the interview. According to Mr. Shapiro, this action was taken at his direction and without any consultation with the independent counsel. Why, after the Attorney General had clearly stated that these matters would be handled by the independent counsel because they presented a conflict of interest for the Justice Department and the FBI, did Mr. Shapiro take this, I can only characterize it, disturbing action? On July 18th, when I reviewed Mr. Livingstone's FBI background file, I inquired as to whether or not any of this information was going to be communicated to the White House. On July 19th, Mr. Shapiro wrote claiming that he, he had indeed informed the White House about the information because, quote, it was determined that the Bureau had a responsibility to advise affected parties, close quote. Since some of these so-called affected parties were individuals who were being called before the grand jury in a matter that the FBI was designated to stay out of, why did Mr. Shapiro, a former prosecutor, think it appropriate to give the White House a heads up? And now we learn that this was not Mr. Shapiro's first heads up to the White House. On Jan February 21st, 1996, Mr. Shapiro personally delivered the White House counsel, Jack Quinn, a copy of a draft manuscript of the book written by retired FBI agent Gary Aldridge a full four months before it was published. For what official purpose was this action taken? And since Mr. Shapiro claims to have attempted to do things in a nonpartisan manner, who else did he provide copies of the book to? Today, we will also learn Mr. Quinn's recent letter to FBI Director Free attacking the credibility of FBI agents and attacking me personally was first read to Mr. Shapiro to get his opinion on the tone and content of the letter. Is this in keeping with Director Free's wishes to keep the FBI independent and out of politics? So we have the heads up 
the FBI general counsel notifying the White House about book publications, the Nussbaum interview, and being called by the White House counsel for editing consult. I would note the White House and over a dozen present and former staff obtained the information in Mr. Nussbaum's interview prior to my having reviewed the file. Yet we have the, the dismay expressed by some regarding disclosure of the information regarding the notes on Mr. Nussbaum's interview on the House floor in the course of my legislative duties. Is it the President's position that the White House Counsel's Office and individuals of its choosing, such as Bernard Nussbaum and Craig Livingstone, are the only people who had the right to this information? Were all of these White House officials who were notified of this information notified against the President's direction? Unfortunately, I believe this is just one in a long line of actions taken by the White House Counsel's Office in which it has adopted the role of adjunct defense attorneys instead of the institutional role of counsel to the office of the President. We have learned that the White House has been regularly briefing and debriefing attorneys of individuals being called before congressional committees as well as a grand jury. We don't need the FBI general counsel contributing to these troubling activities. As I made clear in my statement on the House floor last week, I was very troubled by the discrepancies between the various statements regarding who was responsible for Craig Livingstone's hiring. I did not make, I repeat, I did not make a determination of the veracity of the statements, but rather referred it and the, the issue to the proper authorities to do so, which is exactly what the FBI should have done in light of the Attorney General's admonition. Clearly, the White House has its own reasons for adopting Mr. Nussbaum's representations, as it has on many other occasions. But I would hope that the White House would not continue the pattern of attacking career civil servants in order to shift the focus from questionable activities of political appointees past and present. Just last week in our hearing, we learned that the White House's attempts to use the Secret Service as a scapegoat in the Filegate matter were misplaced and highly unfair to these dedicated public servants whose mission it is to protect the President. I also note Mr. Nussbaum has disputed the accounts of many individuals regarding statements uh, he has allegedly made and actions he has allegedly taken. He had, has differed uh, with the recollections of events given by everyone from his own staff to the former Deputy Attorney General. Mr. Nussbaum also claimed that on July 22, 1993, during the review of Vince Foster's office, that he showed everyone in the room the Vince Foster Travel Office Notebook. Yet no one there recalls seeing it that day, and the only reference to something regarding the travel office in notes taken that day was a cryptic reference to the White House Management Review, which was not part of Mr. Foster's travel office file. Further, Mr. Nussbaum's own staff claimed he never told them about the notebook or showed it to them. He didn't even show it to the individuals at the White House who were responsible for producing documents in the various travel office investigations. We now learn from reviewing the 2,000 pages of White House notes that the committee has subpoenaed but not yet physically received from the White House that Mr. Nussbaum didn't inform anyone at the White House about the travel office file until after a grand jury appearance in May of 1994. Also in the 2,000 pages of documents are notes which indicate the White House investigated whether or not Nussbaum told anybody about the Foster travel office notebook. The counsel's office learned that nobody but Mr. Nussbaum knew about the Foster Travel Office notebook for close to a year. Are we going to hear similar denunciations of White House staff misrepresenting Nussbaum's statements, or are such denunciations only reserved for career law enforcement officials who conflict with Mr. Nussbaum's account of events? I understand why the White House may have wanted to keep quiet the information regarding Mr. Nussbaum's statements about Craig Livingstone and who recommended him uh, to the, recommended him from the public. But given the dissemination of this information throughout the White House, before I even had an opportunity to review the file, and long before I discussed this information on the House floor, the White House objections ring hollow and hypocritical, and I trust the public and proper law enforcement authorities can and will discern the facts in this matter. And I'm now pleased to recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Ms. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, we continue our hearings on the FBI files. As I have noted at previous hearings, we all agree that the requests for files on former employees were wrong. The issue for these hearings continues to be whether the files were requested with an intent to get the dirt on the former employees or results of errors. 
So far, there is no evidence that the individuals who requested the files had been ordered to purposely obtain them by higher-ups in the Clinton administration, nor is there evidence that anyone higher than Craig Livingstone was aware that the files had been improperly requested. Even more importantly, we have no evidence that the files were improperly disclosed to anyone outside the White House personnel office. Ironically, the only public disclosure of a FBI background file to date has been our chairman's disclosure of the contents of the FBI file, which he recently reviewed on Craig Livingstone. Contained within this file was a summary report by Special Agent Dennis Scalambrini that White House Counsel Bernard Nussbaum told him that Craig Livingston had the backing of the First Lady, who was a friend of Livingstone's mother. Now, this tidbit was the first item of news from our investigations and hearings on the FBI files that the, cheering deemed imp the chairman deemed important enough to take to the House floor. Your special order, Mr. Chairman, insinuated that Bernard Nussbaum, Craig Livingstone, William Kennedy, and the First Lady must have lied because they had denied this allegation. Now, perhaps you were just raising the issue for investigation, but that could have been done by a letter to the independent counsel. So as I see it, the clear purpose of the floor statement was to plant in the mind of the American people the unsubstantiated thought that the first family and all of their lawyers were lying about this matter. Indeed, after your special order, who wouldn't think they were lying and raise the question of why an FBI agent would write this note if it weren't true? Well, just like every other time that there has been a wild, unsubstantiated accusation hurled at the occupants of the White House, only half of the facts were released. In this case, neither my colleagues on the floor nor the public who was watching were given information on the credibility of the agent who had written the note. That apparently will be left to me and the members on this side of the aisle to point out today and in the future. The allegation that Mrs. Clinton was behind the hiring of Craig Livingstone and knew his mother was hardly news. Agent Gary Aldrich, a friend and colleague of Mr. Scalambrini, had made the charge in the Wall Street Journal and in his book, Unlimited Access. Now, for those of you who might not have been paying attention to that book, it has been widely discredited from all sides. The Wall Street Journal on June 25th, but in this case, Mr. Scalambrini was reported to have attributed to the remark not to Mr. Nussbaum, but to William Kennedy and Craig Livingstone. Then on July 15, in what the chairman described in his letter to me, not as a deposition under Rule 19 of our committee rules, which require three days written notice, but something called a sworn interview, Mr. Scalambrini told the majority staff that it was Mr. Livingstone who actually told him this fact. He also said he didn't put the statement in Mr. Livingstone's background files. So now it turns out that Mr. Scalambrini has told numerous stories about how he came to know this so-called fact. We might have never known about the discrepancies in Mr. Scalambrini's statements to the majority staff in his interview if we hadn't insisted on getting a transcript. In assessing Agent Scalambrini's credibility, we must also look at a very important FBI memo in the committee's possession in which Special Agent David Bowie stated that Mr. Scalambrini's behavior was, quote, abnormal and indeed irrational, end quote, uh, during a conversation with him. Agent Scalabrini, who is described in the memo as a close personal friend of fire travel office head Billy Dale, is recalled as, quote again, voicing very bitter political feelings against the Clinton White House, end quote. Agent Bowie expressed his concern that Scalambrini, who appeared as a defense witness at the Dale trial, might again quoting, provide erroneous testimony. Now, Mr. Chairman, I can't help but wonder why, if this allegation was truly troublesome, the committee's investigators didn't just go to Craig Livingston's mother, Gloria, to ask her directly whether or not she knew the First Lady. Of course, she subsequently denied that she does. Perhaps a, cur a, a cursory review of her background could have revealed that there were, if there were any truth at all to the allegations. So I suspect the reason was obvious. They knew she would deny it, and they knew that the more they investigated the matter, the more implausible the allegation would become. Now let me briefly turn to the issue of whether the FBI should have told the White House about the existence of this summary in the file, although I'm sure we will probably deal with the issue at length 
during today's hearing. First, I suspect that most of us here know that the reason the other side of the aisle is upset about the notification is simply that the White House had an opportunity to present his side of the story at the same time the chairman went to the floor as opposed to a day later. I doubt any of us believe that this information would not have been released by the chairman and become available to the White House. When asked by the FBI, the independent counsel had no problems about Congress reviewing the files, nor did they ask that any conditions be placed upon its release, which could have included release to the White House. They didn't even want to know or, or they didn't want to review the file, as a matter of fact. To the extent Mr. Nussbaum would have been testifying to a grand jury, the issue would not have been who hired Craig Livingstone. Finally, Mr. Chairman, your fourth statement criticized two FBI agents for going to Agent Scullenbrini's home and telling him that the White House was unhappy with what he had written about Mr. Nussbaum's interview. And once again, the question is, what type of investigation did the committee do to determine the veracity of this charge against the two agents before making these public charges? At a sworn deposition, Mr. Shapiro testified that the agents in questions deny the allegation. Therefore, it appears that this may be one more case in which Agent Scalabrini's account of a conversation is disputed. The concern of the FBI that in light of the denials, Agent Scalabrini's report may have been inaccurate was a real one. Let's keep in mind that just recently, FBI agent Halbert Harlow was convicted of falsifying over 50 White House interviews. All of us have on occasion had cause to criticize the FBI. It's clear to me that the FBI has been caught in a crossfire between congressional Republicans and the White House and has been attempting to act in a fair and impartial manner. They have certainly given this committee broader access to their files than I have ever seen in the past 23 and a half years that I've been a member of this body. Whether the FBI acted prudently in telling the White House about the existence of this document is more of a political call than a legal one. As the FBI has already testified, what seemed a nonpartisan decision at the time may appear different after the fact. When this committee began its hearing into the FBI files, I noted that I fully concurred. I want to get to the bottom of how and why the files were requested and what was done with them. However, it appears to me that as our investigation is increasingly coming to the conclusion that the requests were in fact a bureaucratic error and not a sinister plot, the committee hearings keep shifting their focus. The issue of who hired Craig Livingstone is an unfortunate diversion from the true issues involved in this affair. I sincerely hope that we will soon get back to seeking the answer to the pertinent questions of one, why the files were requested, and two, what was done with them, and yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentlelady. Um, with the unanimous consent, I would ask that the deposition transcripts of our witnesses today be placed into the committee record and made available to the public. Mr. Chairman, I object. Which one is this? Uh, this first is the first one. First one. Just, these are just the depositions of the witnesses that are testifying today. Give them the name of those, uh, please. Uh, these would be the witnesses on our witness list. Mr. Ms. Larson, Mr. Shapiro, Mr. Kelly, and Mr. Thornton. Okay. Without they have, objection. They have not been deposed? Uh, no objection the heard. Well, the, the ones we have are Ms. Larson, Mr. Shapiro, Mr. Kelly. Those are the ones you want to put in? Right. Okay. No problem. Uh, I would ask unanimous consent that this chart showing the people who were contacted with regard to, the, uh, to this matter would also be made a part of the record system. together with the uh, editorial appearing in the, in the Washington Times today without objection so ordered and I would now further ask unanimous consent that the following deposition transcripts be placed in the record FBI agent Burke FBI agent Garner Carner FBI agent George FBI agent Mark Gargle FBI agent Renningham FBI agent Robertson FBI agent Schwartz FBI agent Scalambrini FBI agent trailer FBI agent Woods is there objection mr. chairman I object Objection has been heard. Let me say, out of respect for our witnesses today, I'm not going to uh, wage a battle over placing these documents in the record at this time. It is ironic, I would note, that uh, at each of our previous hearings, I have been criticized for not disclosing enough of the uh, 
deposition transcripts. I even received letters from some in the minority asking that the deposition of Agent Scalambrini be included in the record today. Uh, but I understand uh, that objection has been heard. Mr. Chairman, in Mr. any case, Chairman, all, of the com inquiry, all the completed depositions will be released, and I want to make this announcement. All of these depositions will be released to the public tomorrow. That is on Parliamentary Friday. Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman will say it. Is, is, uh, if an objection is heard, can a vote of the committee be taken to go ahead and put these uh, in, into the record? It can, but I think in view of the fact that we do have uh, a long uh, hearing today and, uh, and the, the, these depositions will be part of the record as of tomorrow, uh, it would be my hope that we would not uh, we would not battle this out. At well, the Mr. Point. Chairman, uh, with all due respect, I think this is a, a, a very important part of this investigation. We've had these depositions taken. I, I really believe that uh, they ought to be part of the committee record and part of the congressional record, and I don't see any reason why they should not be put into the record. I don't understand Mr. why Chairman. the minority is objecting, but I really think we should have a vote on this and put them in the record. Mr. Chairman, I'd, be, I'd like to have the opportunity to tell the, the membership why I am objecting. The gentlelady is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'm objecting to that request, not because I object to the release of the deposition, because it will be subject to release with all the other depositions tomorrow with my concurrence. I'm only objecting because you have objected to our efforts to place depositions of individuals other than witnesses in the record. For example, at our last hearing, when Congressman Waxman sought to place into the record the deposition of Cecilia Woods, who gave testimony that related to the testimony of Mr. Cole, whose deposition had been made part of the record, you objected. So we, there, I think we ought to apply the same rules to the minority and the majority, so that's why I objected. I and still do. I would point out that the, the specific uh, depositions that uh, I asked the unanimous consent be made a part of the record do indeed relate to the subject matter of the hearing that is before us today. Uh, the gentleman from Indiana. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Was, yes. There's history uh, will we'll record these hearings for, for good or ill. And I think that to, to leave out depositions that are relevant to this because of rejection by the minority is a mistake, and, and I, would, I would urge a, a, a vote on this, a roll call vote. Mr. Chairman, I would urge, urge some fairness. It seems to me that since Mr. Waxman was not able to insert in the record uh, the deposition on Cecilia Woods, I think it's only fair that we do the same with the majority and the minority, and therefore I continue to object. All right, Mr. Chairman, I'll withdraw my request. Thank the gentleman. Uh, we are now prepared to uh, hear the testimony of our witnesses, and if they would please come forward and remain standing. Uh, lady and gentlemen, it is the custom of this committee that uh, not to prejudice the rights of any witnesses, that all witnesses would be sworn. And if you have no objection, would you raise your right hand and swear on the testimony you're about to give this committee would be the truth, the whole truth, and no, nothing but the truth. Let the record show that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. And uh, we would now please be seated. I understand, Mr. Shapiro, that you have a, an opening statement to present at this time. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have an opening statement for three of the members of the panel. I request permission, as I mentioned to counsel previously, to go s just somewhat beyond five minutes. Uh, that's what that is understood. There's uh, the, th the fourth member. Also, uh, Retired Agent Thornton has a uh, statement of his has own. A statement. Up. Very yes. good. Would uh, Mr. Shapiro pull the microphone a little closer to that? Yes, sir. Very good. Mr. Shapiro, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to answer your questions regarding the access by the White House to FBI records. Before I discuss the process of providing background reports to the White House and the reforms that we have made, I would like to touch on two issues that were the subject of Chairman Klinger's floor speech on July 25th and which I know are of concern to this committee. My notification of the White House Counsel's Office of certain information in Craig Livingston's background investigation file and the interview of Agent Scullumbrini by two FBI agents. FBI Director Free has on several occasions made it clear to every employee that the FBI must be fair and nonpartisan when dealing with sensitive issues that have political implications. It is a principle to which I deeply subscribe. The decision to simultaneously notify the majority and minority of this committee, the Department of Justice, and the White House 
about the information discovered in Mr. Livingstone's background file was an attempt to maintain that posture. It was part of an effort to be and to be perceived to be even-handed and impartial. It is apparent that in this case, my effort to convey impartiality, although well-intended and for the right motive, has led to consequences which I regret. In this instance, what was a good faith attempt at being nonpartisan has been interpreted, interpreted as exactly the contrary. I understand fully the concerns that have been expressed, but I can assure you that there was no malicious or partisan motive, nor was there any intent to interfere in any way with the inquiry being conducted by this committee. Beginning with the notification Director Free made to Chairman Klinger on June 5, 1996, of the discovery that former White House Travel Office employee Barnaby Brousseau's file had also been provided to the White House inappropriately, we have particularly made efforts to keep this committee informed. Briefly, here is what happened. When the FBI first learned that committee majority staff wanted to review the background files of Mr. Livingstone and Ms. Mr. Marcisa, the files were immediately processed for disclosure to them. During that routine processing, a paralegal in my office noticed a statement attributed to Bernard Nussbaum that Mr. Livingstone had been recommended by Mrs. Clinton. This fact was, later that same day, brought to my attention. I understood that majority staff from this committee was scheduled to review that file that same afternoon. Because the circumstances of Mr. Livingstone's hiring had already been the subject of a very public controversy and dispute between this committee and the White House, I also decided it was appropriate to notify the White House Counsel's Office. This was a de decision which I made and for which I alone am responsible. My intent was to notify roughly simultaneously both the committee and the White House for whom this information had originally been gathered. Knowing that committee, committee majority staff was due to examine the materials that same afternoon, I placed a call to the Justice Department where I advised Dennis Corrigan, the Chief of Staff to the Deputy Attorney General, of the information and of my intent to advise the White House Counsel's Office. I then called the Counsel's Office and spoke with Deputy Counsel to the President, Kathleen Wallman. Because of a last minute rescheduling by the committee staff of which I had been unaware, the majority staff did not in fact see the information until the following day. In order to ensure that the information was equally available after the staff had canceled their scheduled appointment, we made an extra effort to ensure that committee staff would come to see the files and placed calls to both majority and minority staff to encourage them to do so. When I notified the White House Counsel's Office, no one there was given access to any documents. The Counsel's Office was advised about the substance of one paragraph and read the text of a single sentence on an issue that had already been widely discussed in the media. The file itself was only made available to Chairman Klinger and a member of his majority staff. Let me now address the decision to send agents to interview Agent Dennis Gullambrini on July 16th. The purpose of this interview was strictly and entirely for internal FBI reasons, and neither the Department of Justice nor the White House was either notified of it nor given the results of it. It had no partisan or ulterior motive, and it was not part of any investigation of the White House files controversy, criminal or otherwise. Moreover, it was not, as some have suggested, to intimidate Agent Scalambrini. Instead, the purpose was solely to determine whether the information reported by Agent Scalambrini and disputed by those reportedly involved was accurate and reliable. The record in our files reflecting the interview of Mr. Nussbaum 
is an unsigned, undated, uninitialed insert on plain paper. It purports to summarize in one paragraph each the interviews with three separate people over a three-day period. The date when the summary was prepared is unrecorded. I was advised that the information summarized by Agents Columbrini had previously been publicly denied. I knew that Agents Columbrini had himself told the Senate Judiciary Committee of a different recollection about this same subject. I was also well aware of a regrettable recent history of unreliable information emanating from some agents assigned to the White House, and more generally, that questions had been raised by both houses of Congress about the accuracy of FBI reporting. Accordingly, after the document was brought to my attention, I recognized that the integrity of FBI reporting was likely to be placed in issue. I readily concurred in the recommendation of my deputy to interview Agent Scullumbrini to see what, if any, recollection he presently had of this interview and whether he had any notes or other documentation of the interview. Agent Scullumbrini was not surprised. He was not ambushed. He was not intimidated. An agent called Agent Scullumbrini, advised him of the purpose, excuse me, advised him of the subject matter and the purpose of the interview and made an appointment to see him. Nearly two hours later, two agents arrived at Agent Scalambrini's home. The interview was brief and cordial. Agent Scalambrini was cooperative and professional. The two agents declined to discuss other issues which Agent Scalambrini tried to raise. They departed on cordial terms after Agent Scalambrini gave them a tour of his home and discussed his planned retirement home. At no time, at no time did the agents tell Agent Scalambrini that the White House was unhappy and concerned about this particular interview. No such thing occurred. Nor is there any reason to believe that Agent Scalambrini, a 20-year veteran of the FBI, was in any way intimidated. As it turned out, Agent Scalambrini had no recollection of this particular interview of Mr. Nussbaum, and he did not have any notes. Because I have been advised that the entire Livingston file had previously been offered to the independent counsel and had been declined, and that they had raised no objection to the file being made available to the committee for use in your ongoing public hearings, I did not believe that these two questions to Agent Scalambrini about one document in that file were within the scope of their inquiry. Had I thought otherwise, I would neither have informed the White House nor sent agents to interview Agent Scalabrini. In hindsight, my attempt at appearing nonpartisan by keeping the White House and Congress equally informed has obviously failed. It is an outcome I neither intended nor desired. I am, Mr. Chairman, one of those career officials you made reference to. I do not hold a political appointment, nor have I ever. I can assure this committee that the actions I have described were not done for any nefarious or partisan reasons. My purpose here, as with the internal inquiry I conducted of the provision of FBI file information to the White House, has been to be utterly fair and impartial and to discharge my responsibilities without regard to political consequences. In nearly nine years as a Department of Justice employee, I have never allowed a political calculation to enter into any decision I have made. I'm neither competent to do so, nor would it be appropriate for me to do so. Let me depart from my text for a minute to address, Mr. Chairman, your statement about the supposed heads up to the White House about the Aldrich book. The first draft of the book provided by Gary Aldrich and his counsel was replete with sensitive internal White House information that went to their internal procedures and went to White House security matters, as well as to the, uh, directly to the results of his conduct of his official business. I delivered a copy of that to the White House counsel's office 
because as I, in fact, somewhat presciently advised them, I could not ensure, the FBI could not ensure, that Mr. Aldridge would not go forward and publish that book prior to receiving clearance. And in fact, that is what he did. Let me now address the internal inquiry that produced the report of June 14th that you have cited, Mr. Chairman. This is a report. Let me now address the internal inquiry that produced the report of June 14th that you have cited, Mr. Chairman. This is a report that I wrote, and it's based on an inquiry that I conducted in June of this year. In that inquiry, I found that for more than 30 years, the FBI had been providing background reports and other information to the White House upon request. After examining this process, I concluded that the FBI had failed through the years to afford sufficient protection to the privacy interests of those whose files we maintain. Unfortunately, in striving to rapidly and efficiently respond to requests from the White House and other agencies, we were not sufficiently attentive to our own responsibilities to safeguard the information in our files against negligent or intentional misuse by others. As a direct result, the FBI disseminated background information without insisting on proper justification and for no apparent official purpose. This was a massive invasion of privacy. In response, and without hesitation, Director Free immediately implemented a series of procedural changes to assure that such infringements of privacy never recur. These changes have been approved by Deputy Attorney General Jamie Grelick, and they are now in place. I began my inquiry on June 5, 1996, at the instruction of Director Free, after he learned that the White House had, in December 1993, sought background information relating to Billy Ray Dale several months after he had been fired. The following day, I learned from the White House that they were in possession of additional FBI records obtained in the same matter, manner. By June 13th, additional investigation revealed that the White House had improperly requested previous reports relating to a total of 407 individuals. These files are now in the possession of the Independent Counsel. The requests relating to these 400 plus individuals sought copies of previous reports and each provided as its justification the single word, access. No questions were raised by the FBI about these requests, although the unusual volume of this type of request was noted. And they were processed routinely by the personnel of the Executive Agency subunit of the Information Resources Division of the FBI, consistent with the guidelines that existed at that time. As I sought an explanation for these actions, I discovered that the system had been in place through every FBI director essentially unchanged since the Johnson administration and was designed to maximize speed and responsiveness. As a consequence, the FBI processed all facially valid White House requests without reflection. Even though, as I found, the FBI had acted in compliance with the Privacy Act, we had clearly failed to accord adequate weight to the protection of privacy. Over time, a tradition of considerable deference to the White House had developed, and questions were rarely asked. It should not be forgotten that the provision of background information to the White House and other executive agencies is an integral component of the federal employment and security clearance system. Carefully investigated and accurately reported information is essential for making determinations regarding a person's suitability and trustworthiness for employment or access. The FBI personnel who process the request for this information perform a valuable and necessary service. Nothing in my inquiry suggested any significant failing on the part of these employees. As to their supervisors, however, I reached a different conclusion. Although I found no intentional misconduct, I found a complete abdication of management responsibility at the level of the unit chief and the executive level management as well. 
What is clear is that a policy of benign neglect cannot be tolerated in an area sensitive as the dissemination of information from FBI files. Close and active oversight is an essential prerequisite to the fulfillment of our obligation to safeguard the information in our custody. Director Free has made it clear that he will tolerate nothing less. It is incumbent upon all of us involved in this process, at the FBI, the White House, the Congress, and elsewhere in government, to achieve the proper balance between the very real and significant needs of the government for the information contained in our files and our profound obligation to ensure that the information only be, dis be disseminated in appropriate and fully justified circumstances. In an effort to ensure that this balance is better achieved, Director Free implemented a series of procedural reforms and redundant safeguards which will prevent negligent or improper incursions into our files and preclude any such wholesale invasions of privacy from recurring. First, in an effort coordinated with the White House Counsel's Office, which oversees the White House Office of Personnel Security, we redesigned the manner in which White House requests for information from FBI files must be made to require, one, either the consent of the person whose files are being reviewed or a letter from the counsel to the president through the deputy attorney general to the FBI general counsel, explaining in writing why such consent cannot be obtained or should not be sought in the circumstances. Two, that all requests reflect the actual signatures of both the requesting official and of an attorney in the counsel's office who will have reviewed and approved the request. Three, considerably greater specificity regarding the reason for the request and four, that a copy of all White House requests for information be provided to the FBI Office of the General Counsel for review. Nine other changes made by Director Free were approved by the Deputy Attorney General, all designed to protect against improper disclosures. Finally, Director Free has instructed the FBI's Inspection Division to routinely audit the entire process to independently ensure absolute compliance with these requirements. It should be emphasized that the inquiry I conducted between June 5th and June 14th was limited to an examination of the actions of FBI personnel. In deference to the wishes of the independent counsel, we did not interview any White House personnel involved in either in the request for background information generally or in the specific series of requests which occasioned my inquiry. Accordingly, neither I nor Director Free reached any conclusion about the actions or motivations of any White House employee. <coughs> Let me state again that both in my conduct of the internal inquiry into the provision of FBI file information to the White House and in my actions in deciding to notify the White House Counsel's Office, I have consistently acted to what I believed was right and appropriate at the time and without, utterly without regard to political calculations. No one regrets more than I do any appearance I may have created to the contrary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Spiro. Now we'll recognize Mr. Thornton, I believe. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Vernon R. Thornton and I'm a retired FBI special agent. At the committee's request, I have flown in from my home in Hawaii to answer questions concerning your investigation of the White House's access to FBI records in 1993. I began my employment with the FBI on June 18, 1962 in a clerical capacity and was appointed to the special agent position on September the 23rd, 1968. Upon completion of special agent training at the FBI Academy at Quantico, Virginia, I was assigned to the Albany, New York FBI field office. And from Albany, I was assigned to the Springfield, Illinois field office and subsequently transferred to FBI headquarters at Washington, D.C. At FBI HQ, I served in the intelligence, criminal investigative, inspection, records management, and information resources divisions until my voluntary retirement on August the 31st, 1995. One of my responsibilities while assigned to the information resources division was serving as unit chief of the executive agency's dissemination and personnel unit. My responsibilities as chief of this unit included managing the FBI's national name check program. The primary subunit involved in processing name check requests was the executive agency subunit. The day-to-day -day operations of this subunit were managed by supervisory research analyst Peggy J. Larson. 
Mrs. Larson, along with other subunit supervisors, reported directly to me. I initially assumed responsibility for the management of the National Name Check Program in March 1991, following re a reorganization within the Records Management Division. During my review of each subunit's responsibilities, I quickly learned that the executive agency subunit was responsible for processing requests from the White House and for FBI file information, and that a separate entity referred to as the White House desk existed within that subunit to respond to the White House request. This White House desk was staffed by two of the subunit's most experienced research analysts under the direct supervision of Mrs. Larson. Mrs. Larson, who at that time had worked for the FBI for 35 years, had spent most of her employment in the National Name Check Program. Mrs. Larson had personally worked on the White House desk for many years before being appointed to a supervisory position. And because of this, I had the utmost confidence in her handling of the subunit's day-to-day -day operations, including those affecting the White House Security Office. During discussions with Mrs. Larson, I was told that there had never been a problem in processing name check requests received from the White House and that the subunit had an excellent working relationship with the White House Security Office. In November 1993, the FBI's Records Management Division and Technical Services Division were consolidated into the Information Resources Division. As part of the reorganization, I was assigned responsibilities in addition to the National Name Check Program. Specifically, I became responsible for the division's personnel, staffing and position classification matters, space and facilities, security office, mentoring program, and office of re professional responsibility matters. Reorganization issues occupied a considerable portion of my time over the next several months. During this time, I continued to have bi-weekly meetings with my subunit supervisors and managers, as well as individual daily contact to discuss work-related issues. Any problems or issues raised by my supervisors received my immediate personal attention. At no time was a White House name check operation perceived to be a problem. In December 1993, Mrs. Larson advised me that the research analysts assigned to the White House desk were very busy and requested that I authorize overtime for the employees to enable them to get current with the work. I also recall Mrs. Larson mentioning to me that the number of name check requests being submitted by the White House had increased, and this was partially responsible for the backlog of work. Mrs. Larson also reminded me that one of the research analysts assigned to the White House desk had taken a lot of leave because of a severe heart attack suffered by her husband, and Mrs. Larson did not raise the problem or as anything other than routine. It, if she had, I would have brought this to the attention of my supervisors and in turn to the appropriate White House personnel. This was merely a request from Mrs. Larson for overtime, and I did not consider it to be an unusual or significant, uh, or significant since other entities within the subunit routinely required overtime to maintain current with their workload. This is the only time I can recall wherein Mrs. Larson and I specifically discussed a problem pertaining to the White House request for FBI information, and this problem pertained strictly to the FBI's internal processing of the request. There was no apparent reason for me to question the legitimacy or validity of these requests. On a personal note, now that I realize this FBI file information was released to the White House improperly, I sincerely regret it happened. I hope this information is helpful to the committee's inquiry, and I will be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Thornton. As I understand it, Mr. Kelly, you have no uh, opening statement. Do you have any comments that you would? I appreciate the committee's uh, kindness in asking, but no, I have no statement. Thank you. Ms. Larson, do you have any? Very well, I think we will now proceed under the five-minute rule, and uh, I will ask the first series of questions if we can activate the clock. And my questions go to you, Mr. Shapiro. On June 21st of this year, Attorney General Janet Reno filed an application for the expansion of the jurisdiction of an independent counsel with the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia to include the file gate investigation within the jurisdiction of Ken Starr. Mr. Shapiro, you were aware of that action by the Attorney General, were you not? I certainly was, Mr. Chair. And you were also aware that, in fact, the court did so refer the, uh, the file gate matter to independent counsel, uh, Ken Starr? Yes. Were you also aware that Janet Reno stated it would constitute a conflict of interest 
for the Department of Justice itself to investigate the matter involving an interaction between the White House and the FBI, which is a component of the Department of Justice, and that, that was the justification for making that request. I understood, uh, Mr. Chairman, that Ms. Reno in her court document stated it would be a political conflict of interest for the Department of Justice to investigate whether Mr. Marcisa violated federal criminal law in making the request and obviously in any related portion of that right. investigation. Yes, sir. Uh, you stated that in your statement that you felt it was the FBI's responsibility to notify affected parties of information, and I think that's what you said. Are you aware of any FBI policy that would require you to notify anyone in a situation like this? Is this a matter of, of FBI policy uh, on the books? Actually, I don't believe I said that in my statement, Mr. Chairman. I, I believe I did say something to that effect in the letter that I sent to you on July 19th. Um, and <coughs> what I, if I can go to that for a second, if you permit me. That's, of course, the end of a sentence, not the complete sentence. I guess the basic question is, is there a policy <coughs> in the FBI to notify affected parties in instances like this? Well, it depends exactly how you would define instances like this, sir. What I had said and what I meant to convey and perhaps didn't use the clearest language in my letter to you was that on a matter that was of uh, already of considerable public controversy um, that in this investigation we had sought to treat everyone even-handedly, right. both the Congress and the White House. Is there a specific written policy about it? None that no. I'm aware of, sir. And particularly, wouldn't that be the case where the Attorney General had uh, herself indicated that this was a matter that the FBI should not be involved with? Well, I think I've made it clear, Mr. Chairman, and I understand you may disagree with me on this, but that I did not understand, I did not think that this information specifically was, at the time, part of the independent right. counsel's investigation. I have said quite clearly that had I thought that, I never would have told the White House. The White House didn't really have any need for this information, did they? Mr. Nussbaum and Mr. Livingstone had already left the White House, had they not? I mean, what would be the purpose of informing the White House since the principles that were alluded to in the statement were, uh, were no longer employed by the White House? Again, Mr. Chairman, and I, I, I'm sorry that I can't make this any uh, clearer than, uh, than I've said, uh, my purpose was uh, in a matter that had already uh, achieved great public controversy that uh, the FBI not be seen on one side of this controversy or another and that we be seen as even-handed. All right. I, cer I certainly recognize that my effort there failed. Now you speak about being even-handed. Um, you, you did, in, the, in this case, uh, call and read the the information, the, the pertinent information over the phone to, to uh, an individual in the White House. Uh, you didn't personally call and read the information to anybody on the committee or indeed anybody in the independent counsel's office, did you? Well, let me address both of those, if I might, Mr. Chairman. Again, I didn't call the independent counsel's office because it was my understanding, uh, based on their both having no objection to our providing it to your committee for your public hearings about this, uh, and their declining uh, an offer of the file themselves that this was not a matter of which they were interested in. That's why I didn't call them. I didn't call your committee, sir, because at the time I called the White House, your investigative counsel was scheduled, to my knowledge, to be there within the hour to read it herself, whereas no one from the White House was scheduled to be there to read it. We have been interviewing FBI agents as part of our investigation into this whole FBI files matter. Director Free indicated he did not want the committee to question line agents about matters included in background investigations, which they had conducted. And as a result of that, the director requested that I review the background files rather than question the line agents about the <coughs> investigation. Were you, Mr. Spiro, aware of this request by the director that, uh, that, I, that the committee not interview agents directly about background information? Yes, sir, I was aware of that. Uh, and isn't that why your agents reviewed Mr. Livingstone's file? I'm sorry, which agents would that be, sir? The, I mean, that you went into Mr. Livingstone's background file, did you not, to, uh, as a result of the request from this committee? Paralegals working for me processed uh, that file for discovery to you, for uh, dissemination to you, processed them looking to see if there were any individuals who had 
uh, specifically requested confidentiality and that their names not be disclosed. That's why people went in in order to make it available to you and your uh, and your majority staff. Yes, sir. Did you uh, confer or consult with anyone before making the determination to contact uh, the Justice Department? Or did you confer or consult with anyone prior to con contacting the White House? Or was yes, this a this yes to both, Mr. Chairman. Um, I discussed the matter uh, with my deputy, Mr. Kelly, here, uh, or, or briefly, at least, uh, advised him of that, that I was intending to do that. I discussed the matter uh, with John Collingwood, uh, the chief of the <laughs> FBI's Office of Public and Congressional Affairs. Then I, before calling the White House, I uh, placed a call to Dennis Corrigan, uh, chief of staff to Deputy Attorney General. Just one final question. Uh, when you talked to the Department of Justice, wasn't, didn't anybody there give you any indication that since this matter was, had been referred to the independent counsel, that it was something that the FBI should not be pursuing or involving itself with? No, sir. Obviously, had they done that, I probably would have stepped back, taken a second look at it, and, and not have made the decision which has caused me to be here today. Mm -hmm. Ms. Collins. Mr. Shapiro, one of the reasons you give in your opening statement for interviewing Agent Skull and Brainy about his 1993 interview with Mr. Nussbaum is the inconsistent statement uh, that uh, Agent Skull and Brainy gave to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Now, is that the uh, interview with that committee majority staff on June the 19th, where he stated that Mr. Kennedy told him that Mr. Livingstone had a job, got the job because of his mother's um, connection with the First Lady? Yes, Mrs. Collins. I, I, I can't vouch for the date, but that was the information I was aware of that was inconsistent. Are you aware that on June the 25th, the Wall Street Journal uh, reported that Agent Scalabrini is attributed to claiming that both Mr. Kennedy and Mr. Livingston told him that Mr. Livingston's mother knew Mrs. Clinton? Uh, I don't recall whether I was aware of that then. I've become aware of it since, that's for sure. Are you aware, as I said in my opening statement, that in the sworn statement to this, com to this committee, Mr. Scullenbrini changed his story again and testified that Mr. Kennedy didn't tell him that Mr. Livingstone got his job because of his mother's connection with the First Lady, that he said that he was Mr. Livingstone who told him that? I was not aware of that at that time. Okay. In that same sworn statement, Mr. Scullenbrini was asked if he would ever have recorded in Mr. Livingstone's background investigation statements whether Craig Livingstone's mother knew Hillary Clinton and Mr. Scullenbrini responded, no. He was then asked why he wouldn't have recorded that information in Mr. Livingstone's FBI background file. And he responded that that's an agent's call. And since I'm quoting him now, he says, that's an agent's call. And since I really didn't know whether it was true or not, it was more or less irrelevant. And so I ask, um, I'm aware, Mr. Shapiro, that um, Agent Scullenbrini claims that he suffered memory loss from an unfortunate accident. But with these types of inconsistent statements, give you any concern about the accuracy of the interviews? Yes, ma'am. And I was aware of some of them. I don't know uh, which of them my deputy was aware uh, at the time that he uh, recommended, and I concurred that we send somebody out there. And, and when, you, when you send somebody out there, what happened? Well, we sent uh, agents called and made the appointment to go out there. They went out and, and asked him uh, uh, the sort of narrow questions about whether he had any recollection of this interview uh, and whether he had any notes or documentation of it. Uh, he neither had a recollection of it nor notes or documentation, though he did say that the document was in the form that he would typically prepare. Um, there was a letter dated July 22nd from Richard Hauser, who's an attorney representing Mr. Scalabrini, uh, that was went to you regarding the FBI's interview of him. Are you familiar with that letter? Yes, I am. In that letter, Mr. Hauser, Mr. Hauser states that Scal Mr. Scalabrini was unexpectedly visited at his home in Haymarket, Virginia, by two agents for the purpose of conducting an urgent interview. Is that a true statement? Uh, it is not a true statement to the, f to the extent that I'm aware of the facts. Could you tell us what happened? Uh, I'm, I'm, as far as I'm aware, it was neither unexpected nor was there any indication that it was urgent. Uh, Agent Duncan Wainwright contacted Agent Scalambrini on the telephone at approximately 9.15. He told him uh, basically the subject matter of the interview that he wanted to conduct. Agent Scalambrini said, fine, he should be there. Uh, they set a time at 11 o'clock. Agent Scalambrini was very accommodating. He said, let me go out and put back up 
uh, mail, the numbers on my mailbox so you can find my home. I've taken that down because the media has been hounding me. Uh, he, he put that back up. They got there at 11 o'clock and they uh, had a brief and cordial and professional interview. Well, Mr. Hauser goes on to state that uh, Agent Scalabrini submitted to the interview after re receiving assurances that the subject of the interview was not related to the White House Travel Office. And then he states that he was surprised to subsequently learn that the focus of the questioning was an interview that was conducted by Agent, C uh, by Agent uh, Scalabrini in 1993. The question is, did the FBI surprise Scal Mr. Scalabrini or his attorney and his attorney about the focus of the interview? The answer is no. Um, and in fact, well, the agent spoke with Mr. Hauser uh, prior to uh, initiating the interview. They told him, or so they tell me, uh, that they specifically what they wanted to ask him about. And he uh, commented to the agents that the reason for doing the interview seemed reasonable to him and that he had no objection to it. Uh, they then went on to do it. We, have, we sent Mr. Hauser back, as you can imagine, a letter. Uh, disputing a number of the allegations in there, uh, and he uh, subsequently acknowledged to my deputy uh, that he was not quite sure of some of the allegations he had made. How do you explain these inaccuracy, uh, the inaccurate statements made by uh, his attorney? I don't know the answer to that, Mrs. Collins. In Chairman Klinger's fourth statement, he said that FBI agents who were sent to interview Agent Scholar bring about his 1993 interview with Mr. Nussbaum told Mr. Scalabrini that the White House was unhappy and concerned about this particular interview and about what had been said about Bernie Nussbaum. You have indicated in your opening statement that this was not the case. Uh, from your discussion with the FBI agents who interviewed Mr. Scalabrini, can you tell us generally what the agents said to Mr. Scalabrini? Uh, I can tell you very specifically that they both uh, of very adamantly state that they never said anything of that kind whatsoever, that they said they wanted to ask him uh, if he had any recollection of a particular interview of uh, Bernard Nussbaum, that they showed him the document, he read it, they asked him if he recalled doing that interview, he said he recalled interviewing uh, Bernard Nussbaum on a number of occasions but did not specifically recall that, um, and they asked him if he had any notes, and. Uh, he said he didn't. He had routinely destroyed them as he, as he would have. Um, and he did say um, that he seemed to recall Craig Livingstone telling him that his mother, uh, where's the, uh, let me get this <coughs> correct. Let me refer to the document if I might. Well, while you're looking for that, could you also answer whether anybody on the committee called you to get the agent's version of what they said to Mr. Scullin-Brini before uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Klinger's floor statement? Oh, no, ma'am. The first I was aware that that was a, even an allegation uh, was when I heard Chairman Klinger stated on the floor of the House. Thank you. If I could finish the earlier question, he, uh, Mr. Agent Scalabrini advised that he had no recollection of being told by Mr. Nussbaum about uh, Livingston having been recommended by Hillary Clinton, but he said he did recall Livingston telling him that his, Livingston's mother, was a friend of Hillary Clinton. Gentlemen, time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, I recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton, for five minutes. I want to make sure I understand this uh, correctly, Mr. Shapiro. You believe that there should be fair and equitable treatment between the, the parties concerned, right? Yes, sir. And yet, on July the 15th, on Monday, you contacted the White House, and every one of these people, every one of them, knew about all of this information before our committee and before the chairman did. Why is that? Mr. Burton, I contacted a single person in the White House Counsel's yeah, Office. I know you did, but, but, but by, you know, that's, that's like pouring water uh, in, into, a, into, a, uh, into a strainer. It's going to go everywhere. You know, everybody in the White House knew about this before the relevant committee and the committee members. The chairman didn't know about this, neither did the counsel for this committee. And yet that's supposed to be fair and equitable treatment. Uh, let me, let, can I address let, let, that, Mr. Burton? I believe me, there's let, a question to me there. No, I don't believe that's a question. That's a statement. Oh, okay. That's a statement. I don't think that's really fair and equitable treatment. And you're also talking about being nonpartisan. In Mr. Aldrich's book, before it was published, you took it over uh, to Jack Quinn, the counsel to the president, and I believe you said that in your sworn deposition, I can't find that right now, 
that uh, that you didn't send, you didn't you didn't take that over there for review. Is that correct? No, I said I did not take it there for them to participate in our pre-publication review. Here's what your deposition Could I says. see my deposition, sir? Your, your dep yeah, you, you're welcome to see it. It has not been made available. This is your deposition, but I'll read it to you. It says, since I hadn't invited them to have... Oh, that's not fair. Make the document available to the witness if you're going to call... His, ca his, counsel, his counsel reviewed it last night. Reviewed it last night. I would like to have to it. see it. See it. I'm going to be questioned. Can the... Uh, Clerk, provide the uh, witness with a copy of the. Uh, Hope this doesn't statement. take away from my time. No, we'll, 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 we'll just spend the time. <coughs> Are we getting it? Mm -hmm. Are they getting him a time? Keep track of how much time we're What's happening here? What page of the deposition are you? This is page 83, Mr. Chairman. Page 83? I'm sorry, page 83. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, Thank you. Restart the time. In your, in your deposition, and you have it in front of you now, it says, I hadn't ever thought that that was a question since I hadn't invited them to have anything to do with the review process. And yet just recently in your testimony today, you said uh, you asked them to review the, uh, the, the manuscript for accuracies. The review process that I'm referring to was in response to previous questions about pre-publication review, a process undertaken at the FBI. I did not ask and I have not stated to the contrary, the but White House to participate in our pre-publication review process. Well, well, what was that? What were they doing? What were they doing? I was giving it to the White House because the original draft of that document revealed all sorts of sensitive internal White House procedures, White House security matters, and others I knew that Mr. Aldrich could publish that document, as he did, without waiting for our approval, without, without uh, concurring with our objections, well, and it, that uh, they should know and have it in their hands before internal uh, White House procedures well, when, were disseminated to the world. When, when did the White House become a part of this review process for the FBI? They were not made a part of the review then process. Then why did you do that? I'm sorry, sir, I thought I just explained that. Well, I, not to my satisfaction. Let me just ask you this question. Janet Reno said on June 20th that she concluded this would be a conflict of interest for the Justice Department to investigate the matter involving an interaction between the White House and the FBI, a component, a component of the Department of Justice. And yet you sent two FBI agents out to see Mr. Scalambrini. Uh, you also uh, sent all this information over to the White House uh, to uh, Kathleen Wallman, who gave it to Jane Sherborne and everybody else at the White House on uh, June the 15th before our committee uh, did. Does that seem to fly in the face of what the Attorney General said because, and that's why she wanted to turn this over to the Independent Counsel, because it would appear there'd be a conflict of interest for the, for the FBI to be involved in all this investigative process? Mr. Burton, we, my intent in calling the White House was to tell them simultaneously or roughly simultaneously with the committee. Uh, that goes responding to an earlier statement of yours that I intended to disseminate it to the world through the White House prior to anyone at the committee knowing. At the time, Ms. Olson was scheduled to be over within the hour to see the same information. She, in fact, canceled that at the last minute and came the following day at our urging to come the following day to make sure that then the White House did not have advance notice. We took steps to ensure, to encourage the committee staff to come in order to make it as simultaneous as possible. But you, you, you called over and read all this information to the A White House? A single sentence, sir, yes. And, and, but you did not call the independent counsel whom the Attorney General of the United States wanted to charge with this responsibility? Wanted to charge over the criminal investigation of the provision, the acquisition and request for FBI files from the White House. You, you, don't, you don't think you're splitting hairs here? Uh, I didn't think so at the time, no. Do you now think you split hairs? 
Well, I don't think I'm splitting hairs. I can understand how, in retrospect, one could see this as, as part, a peripheral part can, of can their you, investigation. Can you understand why the Congress of the United States and the investigative uh, committee would be a little bit of concern, a little bit concerned when we were told that this was being turned over to the independent counsel because of a possible conflict with the FBI, that you folks continued to go out and see uh, individuals like uh, Mr. Scalabrini and went ahead and gave information to the White House before you gave it to the committee? Don't you think that would, that would seem a little bit uh, of concern to the members of the Congress that's investigating this? Again, we didn't interview people like Agent Scalabrini. There wasn't a series of interviews here. There was not an investigation. There was a single decision to interview Agent Scalabrini about a matter which had been hotly contested and disputed about our internal concern about you the, it, excuse me, sir, about the integrity of FBI reporting. Some very serious and troubling questions had been raised, uh, in part by a subcommittee of this committee, about the integrity of FBI reporting. And our concern was that there was an FBI issue here, wholly apart from, wholly apart from any criminal or congressional investigation into the other questions. But when, you, but when, he, when your agents went out there, his attorney was not there. He was informed on very short notice they were coming out, and so he was there by himself uh, when your two agents went out. Is that correct? Whenever we interview our employees, we, they're usually there by themselves. Yes, sir. Gentleman's time has expired. <coughs> Chair Nock recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shapiro, I thank you for your testimony. You're a very credible witness. You've told us exactly what has happened on this issue, and uh, I think your testimony speaks uh, for itself. Thank you, sir. And what it says to me and to the American people is, again, the Republicans are digging another dry hole. Let it, if I could use my time to set out for the press and the American people what has happened with this committee, it really is quite astounding. There has been an enormous waste of taxpayers' money for this committee to do the depositions. I think there are close to 70 depositions that have been taken, hours and hours of uh, of activities by the staff and everyone else, all paid by the public. And what has this committee taken us to? Well, we started off with uh, an accusation that um, there's some kind of enemies list being accumulated at the White House. And that uh, this is a very serious charge. And we started to look at whether that charge was accurate. There's no evidence of that at all. The only thing this committee has uncovered is that there, was, uh, there were two people involved in getting the files for the White House from the FBI, from the list provided to them by the Secret Service, and they were not doing it competently. Uh, we then heard from this committee, the Republican majority, well, th that couldn't be true because the Secret Service files are always correct. But then we found out that the Secret Service files are replete with errors. The Secret Service does not take anybody off the list uh, in terms of having access to the White House until they turn in their pass. So someone like James Baker didn't turn in his pass, and the Secret Service kept him and other people on the list. We then had the chairman make a very serious accusation. He went to a press conference and said that Bernard Nussbaum, in fact, what uh, Nussbaum was trying to do was to order the FBI files on Billy Dale. That turned out to be inaccurate. The chairman never was willing to make an apology when he found out he was wrong. Then the, then the inquiry was no longer on the files. It was no longer on something that for which they had no evidence. Suddenly, we have a hearing on whether uh, Craig Livingston was hired because his mother was a friend of Hillary Clinton's. Come on, give me a break. There was no evidence of that other than a statement by Mr. Scalabrini in the FBI file. That's the only evidence of it. Mr. Nussbaum was asked about it, and he declared under oath it's not true. Mrs. Clinton was asked, and she said she didn't know Mrs. Livingston. Craig Livingston denied it. Bernard Nussbaum denied it. William Kennedy denied it. You have all these people who have firsthand information about this issue. They've all denied it under oath, and yet the chairman went to the House floor having gotten this information from the FBI files and made it public. This is the only invasion we have of the FBI file privacy. I mean, there's no evidence that the White House used FBI files in an improper way and invaded people's privacy. I mean, after all, that was the 
original reason for this investigation. No evidence of anybody at the White House doing it. Now we have a clear demonstration of the chairman doing that. Now, I just think that what we have in this long, exhaustive investigation is the spreading of innuendos, of partial and improper statements, half-truths, in order to attack uh, President and Mrs. Clinton and anybody else that gets in the way of this committee in trying to get to the Clintons. And I think that the American people and the press ought to take note of that fact. Uh, then the issue no longer was well, I, whether Craig Livingston's mother was friends with Hillary Clinton, because that obviously doesn't stand up. The question is, did Bernard Nussbaum think that was the case? Well, if Bernard Nussbaum thought that might have been the case when he talked to Mr. Scalabrini, that's not a controverted decision. That's not an internal cons inconsistency in Mr. Nussbaum's statement. That's a contradiction with Mr. Scalaprini's statement. Now, I wrote to the chairman of the committee, and I pointed out to him the Democrats weren't there at that deposition, because under the rules, we were supposed to have been given notice of Mr. Scalabrini's uh, deposition, and we weren't given adequate notice, and we weren't there. Then I was inquired whether we had a copy of that deposition. I was told by the Republican staff, oh, no, there's no uh, copy of that deposition. In fact, there was one full 10 days later uh, after uh, uh, I, I tried to get the deposition. We found out that there was a copy. Uh, I wrote a letter to the chairman saying, did you do anything to find out whether there was some independent accuracy to Mr. Scalabrini's statement? As far as I know, he never even did the simple thing of calling Mrs. Livingstone and asking her that question. This committee is not doing a fair job. They're not trying to get to the truth. They're trying to use the House of Representatives and the committee process and the deposition process for partisan political uh, motives. And if there's some wrongdoing, the independent uh, investigator is supposed to investigate that. Give the evidence to the independent investigator and ask him to look at it. Mr. Chairman, not go to the House floor and make a serious accusation and say, I don't know whether it's accurate or not. I just want the American people to know about it. The press is being used. The press would never report these kinds of statements if they had as little evidence as the chairman has. But once the chairman makes an accusation, then the press uses that accusation and sets it out there. And uh, then there's a denial. And a majority of the American people in a late, a late poll think that the original accusation was accurate, that the White House had an enemies list, Gentlemen's when in fact that uh, claim has, has been expired. discredited. And the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Maryland. Ms. Morella, and just Thank ask you. her to yield to me for one Yes, indeed, second, I just yield in to you, Mr. Chairman. To the fact that we're really not here talking about whether or not Mrs. or Craig Livingston's mother recommended. We're asking the questions as to whether the statement that uh, Mr. Nussbaum said he heard from Hillary Clinton uh, that uh, this was the man they wanted in that job. Mr. Chairman, I asked and that I Mr. Scalabrini be brought before the committee. Have you given the we will uh, take response that under, to that? We will take that under consideration. It seems unfair not to have I now recognize the gentlelady the from, from Maryland. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Is thank you Mr. Chairman. I, actually, I want, to, I want to commend you for your outstanding work in trying to allow us as a committee to piece together this jigsaw puzzle of very troubling issues. Um, you know, remember this started with the uh, travel gate situation, the White House travel office employees, and led to this whole chain of troubling discoveries about the involvement of both the White House and the FBI. And, and, and frankly, you know, in response to what my colleague had said, I, I was here for the uh, last hearing that we had, and the Secret Service, I thought, uh, com comported themselves with great demeanor and integrity and, and reflected the fact that um, they uh, uh, are dedicated public servants who protect the president. Um, I also want to, um, to point out that the FBI director, Louis Fries, suggested that Chairman Klinger review Mr. Livingstone's FBI background file. And what Chairman Klinger found contradicts statements and sworn testimony of White House officials. And when he announced this on the House floor as part of his legislative duty, he was not the first to reveal this information. The FBI had given a heads up to the White House, as we discussed earlier, about Mr. Livingstone's file.
before Mr. Klinger even reviewed it, setting off a chain of telephone calls to White House officials. And furthermore, the FBI sent agents to the home of Dennis Scalabrini, the agent who interviewed Mr. Nussbaum during Mr. Livingstone's background check to let him know that the White House was not happy with that routine interview over three years. Um, all of that on top of the fact that I and the American public have been very concerned about the FBI's role all along, wondering how the FBI could have processed this unusual number of, of requests without question. But I have a few questions, and I, I'd like to basically direct them to Ms. Larson, who's been a great public servant, who's given 32 years um, to uh, this uh, uh, profession and position. I want to clarify some things. Ms. Larson, a lot of people are confused by um, all of the different processes and checks that are going on in the FBI. I want to make sure that everyone understands that a copy of a previous report is something entirely different from a name check a full background uh, investigation, a limited update, or any of the other various requests that the White House can make of the FBI. Our investigation concerns the Clinton administration's requests of hundreds of Republican administration officials' FBI background files. The White House requested copies of previous reports from the FBI, and that's what was sent to the White House. When responding to my questions, I wonder if you would please focus on copies of previous reports only, although I do realize that your unit performs other functions. Um, Ms. Larson, you were the supervisory research analyst at the executive agency's dissemination subunit during the period of December 1993 through February 1994, correct? That is correct. Right. Your subunit handled requests for copies of previous reports from the White House, did it not? That is correct. Right. I just want to be sure that everyone is clear on what a copy of a previous report is. When you compile a copy of a previous report, someone in your unit obtains the entire file and looks through all of the summary reports and memoranda and determines what was previously sent to the White House. Those memoranda are then copied, sent to the White House. I, I'm just looking for some general understanding of the procedure. I realize I may have left out some details, but is that basically correct? Basically, yes, the, the copies of previous reports uh, actually to us are probably summary memorandums which were conducted by the background investigation unit. Mm -hmm. And they go, rather as a report, they go in summary memorandum form. Right. I, I believe that your subunit would place a stamp on the back of the first page of any document which was sent to the White House. The stamp would identify the document as being sent to the White House per a request for a copy of a previous report and would have the date and the initials of the analyst that is involved. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Basically, what you were trying to do was recreate a file that the White House had at one time. Is that accurate? Well, the reason for our dissemination stamp uh, is because this way we have a tracking system. We know right who requested it, when it came in, when it went out, and the individual responsible So it would be pretty it obvious that anybody who saw it would know who Anyone was responsible, that came who upon requested it. In the future it. Would, yeah. Right. Did there come a time in late 1993 and early 1994 when you began to receive a large amount of requests for copies of previous reports? Yes, ma'am. Right. In fact, in your 32 years of experience with your unit, can you recall another instance where, when um, you received more than 400 requests four copies of previous reports within a two to three month period? Uh, probably not within a two to three months period. It's not unusual that we would have received that many requests over a longer period of time, but, but not uh, I can't that recall in that period short period of time. Of time. Right. Um, uh, did you report the unusual number of requests to your supervisor? I made Mr. Thornton aware of the fact that we did have an increase uh, in the number of requests for prior backgrounds only. Uh, I only brought it to his attention because uh, I was going to have to get some overtime. Uh, I believe it's in the record that one of my employees, uh, her husband was ill, and the other analyst was uh, rather backed up. Did, did he indicate that he would follow up on this? I wondered, you know, what his response was. Well, his response was, did I have enough help and how much overtime did I need? And uh, 
were there any problems? And I said no, that uh, just because of one of them being out, uh, that the other analyst uh, was in need of some overtime. And uh, so he said that was fine. But uh, as far as the nature of the quest, uh, there was no problem with that. No the problem the with lady. that. I wonder if I just might ask Mr. Thornton if he would uh, like yes, to respond to that, if I have any time left. If, if just responding on that same question, Mr. Thornton, if you wish. In, in following up when she made the comment to you about well, the yes, unusual Yes, ma'am. When, when Mrs. Larson brought this matter to my attention, as indicated in my opening statement, it it was not in a matter of bringing it as a problem with the requests or the extraordinary number of requests. It was, as I saw it, and can pass was strictly to ask for overtime to uh, process a request. And this was around the time of the holidays and so forth. And as I indicated earlier, one of our uh, research analysts had assigned to the White House desk had taken uh, an extraordinary amount of leave due to the illness of her husband, and so. I did not look at this uh, request from Mrs. Larson as being anything other than a routine request for overtime. It was not presented to me as, uh, you know, the White House is uh, asking for uh, a large number or volume of uh, previous reports, and this is unusual. Uh, do something about it. it. That was not, you know, it was not presented in that light at all. I guess I'm the, surprised uh, that she would not time. have surmised that, hey, this is an unusual The lady's number. time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Spratt, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Shapiro, thank you for an excellent statement, forthright, and so far as I'm concerned, you have no apologies to make to anyone. Let me ask you, under what authority were the files of Mr. Marsica and Mr. Livingstone made available to this committee? Let me take a step back just to explain the sequence of events there. Uh, Mr. Klinger and his staff were, de his staff were deposing agents of the FBI, line agents, and asking them uh, about questions about their background investigations. Mr. Free, the director, wrote a letter to Mr. Klinger on July 10th um, talking about our long-standing policy to try and shield line agents and particularly our concerns to have them uh, de deposed about information that they did in background investigations and offered uh, as, if necessary, as a substitute, that the files themselves be made available. Uh, well, so they were, a, re a request came in letter form, and they were. You, you spoke earlier about this practice sort of growing up without anyone taking an intense look at uh, which files were made available, what sort of need to know there was. Mr. Spratt, I believe we'll complete your questioning in recess after that. Are we are recessing now? No. Well, uh, I'd like you to complete your questioning. Oh, thank you, you very would. much. Thank and I'll give you, you an much. extra. I'll give you an extra Good. minute because of the interruption of the bells. I understand. What sort of safeguards and sanctions under the law apply to the use of these files once they are made available to committee staff or to members of the committee? Mr. Spratt, or to anyone, this is, for that matter, uh, to the independent counsel. Well, it, th this is a, a somewhat unprecedented occurrence. The, uh, in the past, uh, as far as I am aware, and I've consulted with others who've been at the Bureau much longer than I, uh, background investigative files have never been made available to members of Congress or their staff outside of the confirmation process. In the confirmation process with the various Senate committees, there are very detailed MOUs that govern how the information will be provided to the Senate and the Senators and their staff and what, if anything, they can do with it. Uh, this request, as far as I know, and this offer by Director Free, uh, was in all respects unprecedented. There is nothing uh, that governed, uh, since the Privacy Act does not govern the Congress, uh, there is nothing that I'm aware of that actually limited its use. So if a non-member of Congress or a non-congressional staff member had for whatever reason, obtained access to these files. Let's say it's a paralegal working in the independent counsel's office who has access to the files, and then releases this information to the public and to the media. What sanctions would apply to that individual under the Privacy Act? What penalties would apply? Uh, 
depending on the motivation, both uh, the possibility of both civil and criminal penalties exist, sir. And what is the statutory citation? Can you give? Is it the Privacy Act itself? Privacy it Act character? Five, United States Code, Section Five Fifty Two, Small A. So, for everybody except a member of Congress for whom this act is not made applicable, the disclosure of information from a confidential personal file is a criminal violation of the law. Is that correct? If it is done without uh, falling into one of the exceptions of the Privacy Act, yes, sir. Now, given this incident, do you think that there should be some consideration given to safeguards and sanctions when anybody, member of Congress, staff, whoever it may be, obtains access under extraordinary circumstances to the contents of these files? Well, actually, sir, prior to this incident, incident, the Deputy Attorney General had instructed me to have my staff look into uh, the full universe of, of the possibility of who would get access to the FBI files. As you know, we'd already looked very carefully at the White House access, but she asked us to look across the board uh, to cover congressional access as well as uh, other executive branch access. Now you testified that you found that going back to the Johnson administration, this process of obtaining these files had become very loose and not very rigorous. If the White House wanted it, they'd simply say access, and on the most perfunctory sort of basis, they would be provided access. Have you found, in looking into the past, uh, similar cases where there was mishandling or, or the obtaining of files which weren't strict, strictly required for personnel purposes? Well, the problem, sir, is that the records simply don't exist. Uh, we have computer records going back only till 1990, uh, and it is very difficult to determine. In fact, even in this case, we could not independently determine from the FBI's information whether these requests were legitimate or not, because we don't know at any given time who has a legitimate need for access to the White House, as opposed to for whom information is being sought where there is no legitimate need. So the short answer is uh, we just are without the ability to, to entirely address that. There are certainly anecdotal information in the files how in the past uh, a president or a member of, uh, of a president's staff would pick up the phone and call uh, Mr. Hoover or one of his top executives and ask for information on someone uh, and it would be provided. Uh, it did not appear that there was rigorous safeguards applied to that. Thank you very much indeed. I'm informed that we have two votes scheduled on the House floor, so the committee will be in recess until five minutes after the conclusion of the second vote. I'd ask members, particularly members scheduled to uh, uh, do questioning and the witnesses to be back at that time. The committee will be in recess. continue with this hearing on White House access to FBI files in just a moment. But first, a look at our live convention coverage. August is the month for conventions on C-SPAN. Sunday the 11th from Long Beach, California, the Reform Party convenes. And again on the 18th from Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. August 12th through the 15th, we'll bring you the Republican Convention, live from San Diego. And looking ahead, August 26th through the 29th, the Democratic Convention, from Chicago. Complete convention coverage, live and without interruption, on C-SPAN, the political network of record. This week on Road to the White House, remarks by Bob Dole to movie producers, Hollywood executives, and film critics in Los Angeles. Also, a news conference by Pat Buchanan concerning the upcoming Republican National Convention. Road to the White House, Sunday at 7 and 10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific Time on our companion network, C-SPAN, the political network of record. You can learn more about modern presidential campaigns in the book The Road to the White House Since Television. It's available for $12.95, including shipping and handling. To order, call 1-800-523-3174 or send a check or money order to C-SPAN Publications, 1616 Main Street, 
Lynchburg, Virginia, 24504. Now we continue with this hearing on White House access to FBI files. This final portion lasts three hours. Resume sitting, and the chair will now recognize the vice chairman of the committee, the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Schiff, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, before uh, before beginning with my questions, I just want to make an observation. Uh, following our colleague Mr. Waxman's earlier statement, that the Secret Service list contained some names that were outdated on them for access to the White House. I think that's true to an extent. I think the Secret Service still showed people as eligible to uh, enter the White House who no longer had a need to do so. But the point related to this issue is the Secret Service never put a name back on the list once it had been removed. And Mr. Livingstone and Mr. Marcisa asked for many files from the FBI on backgrounds of individuals who, whose uh, access to the White House had been removed years before. And those names are not on any Secret Service list that can be identified. So we still don't know why Mr. Livingstone and Mr. Marcisa would be asking for names uh, for background files on individuals who uh, had not requested and were not eligible for access to the White House. Maybe we'll get that answer someday, but we don't have it today. Uh, Mr. Shapiro. Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to ask, it's my understanding that you, you personally authorized the two FBI agents to interview Agent Scolombrini, uh, is that correct? That is correct, sir. Did, uh, did Director Free or anyone else ask you to do that, or was that your decision, your, your level of responsibility? Uh, it was my decision. It was based on a recommendation made to me. Uh, I did not check with any higher authority. Okay, thank you. And the, a, at least a subject of what you wanted your agents to interview Mr. Scolombrini about was Mr. Scullumbrini's interview with former White House counsel, Mr. Nussbaum. Is that correct? That was essentially the subject. Sir. That was yeah. the subject. And the, the main issue in Mr. Scullumbrini's interview with Mr. Nussbaum were the, the indications from the interview notes that Mr. Nussbaum had reported that um, Mrs. Clinton in some way was involved in hiring uh, of Craig Livingstone in the White House. Is that right? Yes, sir. I think that's a fair, sta fair statement. And if, if I understood your, your testimony earlier, you said the agents reported back that uh, Mr. Scullumbrini could not recall Mr. Nussbaum saying that Mrs. Clinton was involved in Mr. Livingstone's hiring, but that Mr. Livingstone may have told uh, uh, Mr. Scullumbrini that himself. Is, is, did I remember that right? Uh, something close to that, sir. That, that while he did not have any recollection of this particular interview of Mr. Nussbaum or of Mr. Nussbaum saying that particular fact, that uh, he did recall Livingston tell him not that Hillary Clinton had some connection to his hiring, but that his, Livingstone's mother, was a friend of Hillary Clinton. So the same essential information, but coming from Mr. Livingstone, not from Mr. Nussbaum. Well, or at least a, a, an, an aspect of that an same aspect information. Of yes, sir. Now, Mr. Shapiro, I, I'd like to uh, refer to a portion of uh, Title 28 of the United States Code, specifically Section 597A, and it's talking about matters that are assigned to an independent counsel, as, as this matter was assigned by the Attorney General, at the Attorney, at the Attorney General's request, to indis, independent counsel Kenneth Starr's office. And this reads in part, whenever a matter is in the prosecutorial jurisdiction of an independent counsel, or has been accepted by an independent counsel, the Department of Justice, the Attorney General, and all other officers and employees of the Department of Justice shall suspend all investigations and proceedings regarding such matter. And they give some exceptions, but I don't think the exceptions uh, apply here. Uh, what I'd like to ask is, are you familiar with that section? I am now, sir. You are now? Yes, sir. You weren't familiar with it before well I just read it to you? No, I was familiar before you read it to me, yes. And okay. I was, although I can't say I was, I could have recited the section at a previous time, I was certainly familiar with the principle 
and with the, the standard that it sets forth. Yes, sir. At the time that, you, were you familiar with the principle and the standard that it set forth at the time you dispatched the two FBI agents to interview Agent Scalambrini? Yes, sir. Now, it says here that the, that the Department of Justice, the Attorney General, and all other officers and employees of the Department of Justice shall suspend all investigations and proceedings regarding such matter. As the, as the uh, General Counsel for the Federal Bureau of Investigation, do you think that, that you fall under the definition of all other officers and employees of the Department of Justice in that section? I don't think there's any dispute about that, sir. You, so you agree that you do? Yes, I certainly do. All right, so even though that section says, and the principle is, that all investigations and proceedings were suspended, you chose to send two FBI agents to do some more investigation. Is that right? Not exactly, sir. Not exactly? What did you send them to do? It says, first of all, it says regarding such matters. And my misunderstanding, if I had one, was whether the question of uh, how Craig Livingston came to be hired was a matter within the... Uh, scope of the criminal investigation of the independent counsel's office looking into what I understood to be the criminal investigation was the uh, request for an acquisition of the FBI files. So uh, there is that aspect to it. Oh, excuse me, just to clarify, are you saying that you did not think that Mr. Livingstone's hiring was related to the matters to be investigated by the independent counsel? What I am saying, and, and have said before, is that at, at the time, based on their having uh, interpose no objection to those files being released to this committee for use in its public hearings and had declined access to those files themselves when we had offered them that I did not believe that they were investigating uh, those underlying matters. Did, did you check with the independent counsel specifically before you asked two of your agents to interview Mr. Scalambrini no, before sir. doing so? No, sir, I did not. Right. And, and had I thought differently about the matter had I focused on the fact that this might have been something within their uh, purview of their investigation. I certainly would have, as I had worked very closely with them over the sort of preceding two months to ensure uh, that we did not trample into their investigation and vice versa. Mr. Chairman, I, I see my time is up. I ask unanimous consent to make uh, Section uh, Title 28, Section 597A of the U.S. Code part of the record. Without objection, so Thank ordered. You, Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Slaughter, for five minutes. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry that Agent Scalambrini isn't here this morning because we're taking him apart pretty well and he's not able to defend himself. But I want to ask you, Mr. Shapiro, if you're familiar with an internal memorandum dated August 7, 1995, from Special Agent Bowie, in which Agent Bowie recounts a conversation he had with Agent Scalambrini. Uh, I am somewhat familiar with it, yes. In that memorandum, Special Agent Boy states that, and this is a quote, Scalambrini has allowed both his personal and political feelings to obscure his judgment relative to the entire matter, in parentheses, the Dale case, close quote. Special Agent Boy states that Agent Scalambrini alleged that he had sent memoranda when he had not. And Agent Boy goes on to state that Agent Scalambrini's conduct and behavior were clearly outside the norm. And that's the clo in closed uh, quote. Agent Boy concludes by stating, quote, the writer is persuaded that Scalabrini's behavior is abnormal and indeed irrational, close quote. Are you familiar with that? Uh, I am for, familiar with that, yes. Now, in that same memorandum, Mr. Shapiro, Agent, Special Agent Boy states that Scalabrini stated that Billy Ray Dale had confided to him, Agent Scalabrini, that he had used travel office funds to pay bribes to foreign officials. Now, as you may be aware, Mr. Dale has testified before our committee that the reason he deposited travel office funds in his own account was to keep a lower surplus at the Riggs account. Are you familiar with those comments by Agent Scalambrini? I'm familiar with the fact that Mr. Bowie uh, attributes those comments to Agent Scalambrini, yes. Did the Boy Memorandum, Mr. Shapiro, play any role in your decision to have the FBI agents interview Mr. Scalambrini? Well, not specifically the Bowie Memorandum, but I was aware more generally of the controversy about Agent Scalambrini's conduct and, and, uh, and his views about some matters. 
there was concern in the agency, obviously, or you would not have the memorandum special agent. Boy, I assume would not have been looking into this issue. Had there not been some concern that he uh, obviously maligned Billy Dale, which to this committee is heresy. Yes, there was certainly concern by, by Agent Bowie, who was a, a supervisor involved mm -hmm. in the matter. I'd like to go back for a moment. I, I wanted to get that on the record, but I'd like to go back for a moment to something that my colleague, Mr. Spratt, talked to you about, and that is uh, basically I'd like, again, if you would characterize the cooperation the FBI has given this committee regarding the travel office investigation. Well, if I might, uh, Mr. Slaughter, I think uh, at least from my perspective, this FBI has been extraordinarily cooperative with this committee. Uh, we have produced a large volume of documents, uh, thousands of hours of paralegal time and time with people in congressional affairs and elsewhere have been used in processing that. And uh, we have contributed, uh, we, we in, in fact, the very offer of uh, Director Free to Chairman Klinger to have access to these background reports is, is unprecedented as far as anyone else is aware in the conduct of any other oversight investigation. And you've also made this all aware of this committee without any written agreements or understandings, correctly? You just handed them over, uh, sir, sir, which uh, is unprecedented. As far as, as I'm aware, out. yes, ma'am. Now, I want to comment, man. I know that, that uh, Congressman Spratt talked about what happens if a person outside the Congress who has some access to these files, leaks or gives out information. I would like to talk for a minute about, as you pointed out, the only time that you've routinely given background checks is for the confirmation process with nominations before the Senate, correct? That's correct. And even then, we do not make the full files available as we did here. Uh, in almost all cases, we simply make the summary reports available. Tell me what kind of agreements you have with the Senate when you hand over that partial information to them? Well, I can't go into great detail of that on personal knowledge, but there is an MOU that very specifically describes who may have access to it, how the information is to be handled, how it is to be stored, in whose custody it may be, and, and for what purposes the information can be used. As I understand it, uh, Mr. Shapiro, you require an FBI clearance, that there are no copies to be made, no verbatim notes, and a warning that an unauthorized release is cause for summary dismissal. Does that sound accurate that, that to you? That is consistent with my general understanding. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to move on to something. It's my understanding that former FBI agent Halbert Gary Harlow was convicted last year of falsifying at least 50 interviews that he claimed to have conducted. Is that correct? Uh, I'm sorry, as to Agent Harlow's uh, Agent falsifying Harlow. interviews, yes, right. uh, I understand that uh, he is uh, admitted to, uh, as part of a criminal prosecution, falsifying approximately 50, uh, entirely fabricating, I believe is more the point. Well, if a member of Congress or this committee or any other committee had relied upon those falsified interviews to make referrals to the U.S. Attorney for perjury, would you not say they would have unfairly tarnished the reputation of that person? Well, I, uh, regrettably, I think that, that would have been the inadvertent result of that if someone did that, yes. Did the criminal conviction of Agent Harlow play any role in your discussion to interview Agent Scalambrini? Yes, the, our general awareness that there had been some very serious and significant questions raised about the accuracy of information uh, emanating from the agents, some of the agents at least, assigned to the White House uh, was a very substantial portion in our decision very substantial factor in our decision to do that. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. You'll back the balance of my time. I thank the gentlelady, and I would now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Hornan, if you might yield to me just for one question. Chairman. Uh, just this, Mr. Shapiro. As a result of the interviews which your agents had with Mr. Scalambrini and in looking into this matter, did you find any reason to doubt uh, Mr. Scalambrini's word uh, that he had uh, falsified uh, that report? Other, sir, than the fact that every person involved has denied the information reported therein? No. But so you don't, do you believe your agents? I generally do believe our agents. Yes, there are 10,000 agents of the FBI, sir, and I'm sorry to say it is a regrettable fact. Uh, not every one of them is as good as the best. But there's no evidence that Mr. Scalambrini is other than the best. Is, there, is that correct? 
Well, other than the best, I'm not sure. But I have certainly not now, nor have I ever made an accusation Against or an Mr. allegation that Mr. Scalambrini has falsified that information. I, I do not uh, mean to be at all understood to be suggesting that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Larson, when you have the request for the files to go to the White House, uh, do you take a look at uh, what names are on the folder at all uh, before they're sent over? Well, the requests uh, are brought into the area, a desk called, uh, typically, call, typically called the White House desk, and the research analyst on that desk, of course, have to look at the names. Uh, if there is a problem, then it might be brought to my attention, but Were just any of these after somebody looked at the names, like James Baker, former Secretary of State, did anybody come to you and say, this is strange, the former Secretary of State's file is being requested by the White House? Well, it's, it's funny that you would ask me that, because one of the analysts did recognize Mr. Baker's name. But, uh, and at the time, I recall that she said to me, James Baker's name is, is in this a list of names for the White House. She said, what do you think they want with him? I said, I really don't know unless they are going to use Mr. Baker on some type of a panel or a discussion. It's not unusual, sir, that they would use uh, politicians of the, you know, either, no, either party. I understand that. Were there any other names brought to your attention by any member of the staff? No, sir. So that's the one that did wake somebody up. That, yes. But nobody went up the line and said, gee, what are they doing over there? No, sir, because it was a routine thing for us, and the girls were just handling them no. and trying to get them back to the White House. Had, uh, now, you've been there several decades, <laughs> and has, has any White House ever ordered that many files that fast? Well, I wouldn't say it's a question of, of uh, ordering that many files that fast. It was a little unusual in that we did not normally <coughs> receive that high a number at one time. They were more staggered. Uh, usually when the administrations would take over, they would stagger their request. Uh, this was unusual in that we did not receive such a high number. Okay, so it was unique is what it, the word is. It was is. unusual. Who uh, picked the particular agents that interviewed Agent Scalabrini? I did. You did. Uh, how did you happen to pick them? Well, actually, the one I picked was Duncan Wainwright. I picked Duncan Wainwright for several reasons. First, he used to work for me. He's mm -hmm. very steady and reliable and intelligent. How about the second agent? Can I finish? Yeah, the fine. Second, second. But I've got limited time because I've lost a okay. minute. The second agent was picked by Duncan Wainwright. Yeah. Now, did one of the agents have a spouse with who worked for the FBI? Yes. And what did that spouse do? She's an investigative, oh, the spouse. The spouse is the assistant director of the criminal investigative division. That's right. A fairly high position in the FBI. Yes, it is. Now, if somebody with that relationship showed up on my doorstep, and I'm an FBI special agent, as Mr. Scalabrini was, I would worry that somebody's after me, wouldn't you? Don't no. you think that's intimidation? No, I don't. And I wouldn't. When the spouse is head of the criminal division within the FBI? The spouse is the spouse. His agent was on an investigative mission, like any other. Well, it's interesting. Uh, Mr. Shapiro, I'll tell you what makes me very curious. You're a very bright young man. You've obviously very sophisticated. You've conducted a major prosecution. And suddenly you get some information and you pick up the phone and you call the White House counsel. Did you want to curry favor with them to be a judge? <laughs> if I wanted to curry favor with them, sir, I would not have used the words egregious violation of privacy when I described their acquisition of 407 White House files. I would not have been involved in writing a report that, as I understand, uh, I think it's fair to say at least the White House was none too happy with, uh, based on the press. Like, I think you could say, looking at what I have done in my career uh, outside this single uh, five-minute period that we're focused on, that there's never been an effort to curry favor from anyone. Well, what uh, bothers me is that the, the, with Mr. Free coming in, we were assured that the FBI would be independent. Then we have the Vincent Foster press release bit, and it looks like the FBI is trying to curry favor with the White House. See, I don't think the FBI should curry favor with anybody. No, I think no. they should be independent, they should call them as they see them, but they shouldn't be playing one side where they're giving them all the cues as to what's in the file. And it just, it bothers me that that has occurred in several occasions. And I wonder, Mr. Free brought you in. Now, if he had brought me in to your 
job. I would have checked with the boss before I phoned the White House. Did you check with the boss, Mr. Free, who brought you in? Mr. Horn, let me first say that I could not agree with you more about the need for the FBI to act impartially and fairly and without currying favor to anyone. And I believe, uh, and I'm proud to say, that the report that I wrote just a few weeks ago I think is an example of that uh, and paid no attention to the consequences for anyone, one way or the other. I think it speaks for itself. As to your specific question, uh, Mr. Free was out of the office on the day that this happened. Uh, he was taking a uh, well-deserved day after two trips and two weeks to Saudi Arabia. And uh, he wasn't there. Uh, he was spending some time with his family. I made the decision on my own. Okay, but he was at the other end of a telephone. You didn't call. He, that, that's true. I made the decision on my own. Did you tell him when he got back? I, I advised him later that evening. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to put into the record, since we're discussing it, uh, the uh, <coughs> FBI uh, investigation or, or report on the agent Scalabrini. With, without objection, so ordered. Uh, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman without a... Okay. I'm now prepared to recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kanjorski, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, maybe before I start, I should make a note for the record that it was uh, most interesting in the last examination <coughs> that the sex and position of the husband and wife team involved in the FBI was made noted in the record. And if I recall, not too many months ago, I was criticized for uh, suggesting that perhaps there sometimes is a relationship between uh, husbands and wives that work in, in various areas of government. And I noticed the majority side uh, perhaps made a suggestion that the choice of the particular agents to make the interview may have had some effect as to why she was picked because of her husband's position in the Bureau. And I thought we were above that, and we recognized that uh, males and females can pursue individual professional careers without uh, one having the effect on the other, and now I see the other side perhaps suggesting that there is that effect. So I wish we could get our system straight here. Uh, Mr. Spiro. Yes, sir. Have you, uh, uh, at any time in your experience, uh, opened up a raw file? And I understand this is a raw file. Is that correct, this material we're talking about today? This is not the summary file that would have been sent to the White House. That's correct. The information made available to Chairman Klinger and his counsel was the complete raw file. And, and, and as I understand your testimony, this is the first time in your recollection or to your, to your knowledge that this has ever really happened so that you, didn't, you have no rules as to what people should do because you never expected to make this type of raw material available and then find it disclosed on the House floor. Uh, it is true that as far as I've been able to determine both from my own three years and from my deputies 27 in the FBI that were unaware of this happening, uh, again, outside of a confirmation process where in most cases it's limited to the summary reports. I, I have in my possession, it just came into the minority side, a copy of an interview by the FBI of uh, Mr. Scalabrini uh, on July 16th of 96, and it, it, it indicates that it was made by uh, uh, Special Agent Esperito and Special Agent uh, Rainwright on the 7th, uh, or on July 16th. And in that document, uh, the interviewed party indicates that he has no independent recollection of the comments made in the raw data uh, under the heading of uh, the interview of Mr. Nussbaum. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. Was this material, the interview of Mr. Scalabrini, made available to this committee or to the chairman prior to today? Yes, sir. The, I don't believe that the interview itself, but on the day that uh, Chairman Klinger and Barbara Olson were at the FBI on July 18th, uh, I am told that they were advised at that day that we had asked Agent Scalabrini and that he had no specific recollection. So that they were aware prior to, to looking at the raw file and prior to anyone taking the floor of the House to make the statements that, in fact, the, uh, the agent involved had no recollection.
could not state whether the information was correct or incorrect, or in fact, whether he even made that statement? I, I believe it was immediately after looking at the raw file, uh, and it would have been approximately a week before the chairman's uh, speech on the floor, sir. So that at least when that statement was made on the floor, that member of Congress would have had in his possession an interview by the FBI of that agent some week before that indicated... Would the gentleman yield to me, I would just state uh, for the record to the gentleman of Pennsylvania, we did not have that information before I went to the floor. Well, now that's what... Now, Mr. Saperio said that you did. Well, what I said, sir, is not that they had the interview in their possession, but I am told that they were advised of the fact that the uh, agent Scalambrini had been asked if he had any recollection of this and that he had said he did not. And, and, and to the best of your knowledge, when was the document itself made available to the committee? I believe the document itself was just made available last night All in right. response to a request. But the contents of this document was made available. To, now, do you know whether it was made available directly to Mr. Klinger or to Mr. Klinger's counsel? I am advised that both were in the room. I believe the conversation was with uh, the counsel, Barbara Olson. So that the record is very clear now that when the statement was made on the House floor, the FBI had disclosed to this committee and a member of Congress that the person that they were suggesting that made this comment in, in, regarding who knew whom, who hired whom, was in fact not able to be personally recollected by that agent when just recently interviewed by the FBI. That is my understanding, sir. And, uh, well. H has, uh, to your knowledge, has Mr. Scombini ever been asked to testify before this committee? Uh, I think I might be the last one in this room to know, sir. But, well, uh, well, is there any rule or regulation which would bar his ability and his uh, 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 availability? to testify before this committee. Would the chairman and would the majority have the right to call him if they so desired so we can get first-hand information here as to what recollections there are and what happened? The committee obviously has the right to call almost anyone it wishes. We generally resist uh, having line agents of the FBI testify. We made an exception, for instance, with Ms. Larson here, who, although not a line agent, is a non-supervisory personnel. Uh, when in agent, even a line agent, is directly involved in a matter in controversy, uh, we usually, at request, well, we always, upon request, make them available as, for instance, we had to a subcommittee of this committee doing the Ruby Ridge inquiries. The gentleman's time has expired, and the chair would now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. McHugh, for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Shapiro, I wanted to take a step further uh, question that uh, was posed to you a uh, few moments earlier with respect to uh, your ultimate contacts with the director, Mr. Free, with respect to your, uh, your actions. I believe uh, you noted that you spoke to him later that evening by phone. Uh, yes, sir. What was his reaction uh, after your conversation? Well, let me, if I can add a sentence or two of Certainly. context. I spoke to Director Free while he was at Six Flags Amusement Park with two of his young children who had birthdays that week. And I spoke to him over a cellular phone. I advised him of a number of events of that day. And among them, I advised him, at least to the best of my recollection, that uh, we had uh, discovered this information and we were making it available to the committee and that I had made it available to the White House, to the Department of Justice and the White House. I don't believe that he had much of a reaction at all, sir. So you don't recall he either approved or objected? He just was neutral on it? Uh, he did not object. I don't believe he patted me on the back either. I think he just acknowledged it as a fact. When you, uh, as you said in your statement, when you advised the Chief of Staff to the Deputy Attorney General, what, why did you contact that person prior to going to the White House? What did you expect uh, as part of that process? Were you looking for approval? <laughs> um, I, I don't, it's hard to say exactly what I expected, sir. I, uh, as a, really as a courtesy and a matter of typical procedure, not, not invariably followed, but the uh, 
primary liaison between the Department of Justice and the White House Counsel's Office is through the Deputy Attorney General's Office. Uh, and so I usually, I would not say invariably, but I usually uh, advise them if I'm going to notify the White House Counsel's Office. And what was that person's uh, reaction at that time? Uh, he, he also noted it, uh, noted the information, and then I told him I intended to advise the White House Counsel's Office, and uh, I don't recall exactly what he said, but I believe he said okay. Was there any uh, follow-up contact from uh, the Attorney General's Office after that time? That was the Deputy Attorney General's Office. Deputy and, Attorney General's uh, Office, or the Attorney General's Office, either one? No, neither. I did um, the following day have a very brief exchange with the Deputy Attorney General when I was over there, uh, when she had asked me to come over there to discuss uh, the matter I referred to earlier about our looking generally at uh, restrictions on the dissemination of file information, not only to the White House, but to other executive agencies and to Congress. During the course of that, I noted at some point uh, the fact, I believe I said to her, um, you're aware that we've recently uh, disseminated some of this information both to Congress and the White House, and, and I believe she nodded. Okay, fine. Wh when you contacted the uh, uh, Kathleen Wallman in the White House, what was her reaction? Was there any response also, and was there any follow-up contacts after that time? I placed the call to Jack Quinn, the uh, I, I understand counsel. that, but your testimony says you had the contact with Ms. Yes, Wallman. and that's what happened. I was referred to Ms. Wallman. And? Uh, I advised her of the information. I read her that uh, sentence. Um, I, I believe she read it back to me. She seemed to be trying to get it precisely. Mm -hmm. um, she asked me uh, what limitations there would be, if any, upon uh, Chairman Klinger or this committee using the information. I told her as far as I was aware there were no limitations uh, other than uh, individual discretion of uh, members of Congress and it's because the Privacy Act did not apply uh, and I believe that was the end of the conversation. When you uh, made available the uh, advanced copy of the Aldrich book to the White House, did you consult with anyone uh, as to uh, you're going to do that prior to the action with the director or anyone else in the office? It was back in February, sir, and I don't specifically recall. I believe, I believe that I advised uh, the director that I was intending to do that. And what was his reaction? Uh, well, he obviously, if I advised him, he obviously didn't object because I would not have gone ahead and done that. I don't specifically recall his reaction to it. Uh, but, but we can infer from what you just said that he approved. If you spoke to him, he must have approved. I, I believe so, sir, yes. I um, immediately after dropping it off, I recollected that I had not on that occasion advised the Deputy Attorney General's office. And so from the car on the way back from the White House, I called to tell them to, to remedy that oversight. Is my recollection correct in your deposition? You noted that it was not unusual for any agent who had conducted the number of uh, interviews that uh, Agent Scalambrini had to fail to recall specific uh, portions of it. I, I believe I said he had been doing applicant work full time, that he had done hundreds if not more interviews, and uh, I did not find it surprising that he couldn't recall a specific interview. W were the presence of, uh, as you said, unsigned, uninitialed, undocumented sheets in an FBI background file uh, unusual? The presence of it being uninitialed is unusual, sir. It should be an initial document. It is. Um, that was an unusual fact. How unusual? I, I, the well, people of this country are very concerned, as I think they have a right to be, and, and certainly the members of this committee are as well, mm -hmm. that the integrity of the entire process the FBI, uh, FBI has initiated, and apparently now, according to the integrity of the actual documents themselves, is in question. How unusual is it to find uninitialed, unsigned documents in supposedly tightly held secret FBI files? I can't answer that. The rules, uh, as I'm advised, require that the document be initialed. This one was not. I, I can't tell you how unusual it is whether or that, that this one was not. I see my time has expired, so I...
Uh, the I'll continue, time, Mr. The gentleman's <laughs> time has expired. Uh, the uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, I want to head off in a little bit different direction here. Uh, last Friday, I was down, went down to the Secret Service and uh, looked at their computer system uh, from top to bottom and spent a couple hours asking them questions. And most of what I found out, you know, I can make sense out of all of this, um, <coughs> that part of this whole situation. The one thing that doesn't make any sense is how this list was compiled of to how they came up with these 470 names or whatever the number was, which is somewhat in dispute. But uh, I guess, Ms. Larson, because you're here today, uh, and apparently you're the one that the request was made to, to pull these files. Uh, uh, I was told by the Secret Service that um, the only list they ever saw of this was this list here. I guess um, my question is, what format did this request come to you? Was it, a, was it this list? No, sir. Uh, no, sir. We received them uh, on individual White House forms. So you these 86 forms, whatever they're called? No, no oh. sir. No, sir. We have a, a, a White House form. It comes over uh, under the council's office, uh, the council to the president, and the information is placed on each individual form. We did not receive any type of list. Okay. So you got, uh, did you get a stack of 470 of these then? No, sir. I think they came in at different times. Uh, I know in December, yeah. I believe the count was something like 249, and, and, it, and it went from there. But each time we would receive an individual copy of a form with the name and uh, describing their background data on it. Uh, you mean what they, the background data they wanted from no, you? No, no, I mean identifying data so that, yeah. you know, we could make sure that we could identify the person as to whom yeah. the... Uh, did, did each of the um, uh, requests ask for the same thing? Each, each request asked for a copy of previous report, yes, sir. So there, there, there was no differences between any of these? They were all the same? They were all the same. They were all a uh, copy of previous report, and uh, then the access was checked. Did you ever uh, ever see this list? Have you ever seen it? Have you ever heard no, about sir, it? No, sir, I have not. Mr. Shapiro, have you ever seen this list? My eyesight's perhaps not as good as it should be, sir. I've uh, seen a list quite like that, quite similar to that, without the... Well, yeah, this hand-scratching is the Secret Service. They went through this to try to figure out uh, if there was any rhyme or reason to this. And so all of this stuff on this side is whether they're inactive or active. And over on this stuff, uh, side is uh, when, the, when the expiration of the five-year uh, form ran out, apparently, in some of that information. So. What this originally was was just this typewritten, it says up here, White House Personnel Security Files staff prior to 1-30-93. And then it's got a list of 470 names. And apparently somebody made this up. They're not exactly sure who uh, to try to figure out what to have a list of what files were sent over for. Yes, I, I, don't, I don't believe I've seen exactly that list going from one to 470, uh, but there were, and there's been, as you know, numerous lists emerging from all sorts of different quarters, but a list in format similar to that was enclosed with the two boxes of files uh, that were returned to the FBI as an inventory list on, on June 6th of 1996. Did, um did you inquire, or did anybody inquire as to who made up that list or where that list came from? No, my deputy, Mr. Kelly, went over to retrieve those boxes of files, and thank you. Um, and I believe the understanding was that that was an inventory list from the boxes. Um, but I don't, I don't believe we did any inquiry about that. You will recall at the time when I was conducting this inquiry, I had worked out with the independent counsel's office in an uh, effort to stay out of their territory and their investigation that we would not conduct any interviews of any White House personnel, that we would conduct interviews of FBI personnel. And so we did not make any inquiry or investigation at the White House about where that list came from. So there was no, never any, uh, uh, did, with these files that were sent over to you, did you have any record of them? I mean, how? When you say the files, you mean the I forms? I mean the, uh, these uh, request forms. Request yeah. forms. Uh, yes, I believe that we did have uh, some of the forms still on hand. I, I know from uh, January of 94, 
we had some of the forms that were sent over in 93, and then we kept them there. Well, I guess what I was getting at is, w would there be any way for you to be able to tell whether, uh, from your records, that you got requests for 470 people that would correspond with the 470 people that are on here? Yes, sir. There are there are two ways to tell. Uh, Ms. Larson's subunit uh, keeps a computer record of requests. We have those documents going back to 1990, I believe. Since January of 94, uh, we've also kept the hard copy of requests. Um, so uh, we have, and I produced in the course of doing the inquiry that resulted in this June 14th report, I produced a, an internal list of what these requests were, when they came in, when they went out. But, uh, and we've matched them up with some of the lists that have emerged, but not with all of them. There's been many different lists, again, as you know. Um, and you, so why did you match them up with some of the lists? Somebody asked you to do that, or you, you wanted to find out if they were the same, or what? I believe I was asked during my Senate testimony before the Senate Judiciary Committee to compare uh, my analysis with one list that they had. Uh, and did it, did it pretty much correspond? With uh, it, the, I believe the list I was shown was a subset of the larger list I had prepared, yes, sir. And it, it checked out that these had been requested and it made sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, I now recognize the gentleman from New York, uh, Mr. Gilman, and uh, ask him if he might yield to me just to make I'd one thing. Please to yield. I thank the chairman for recognizing. I would just uh, like to note for the record that the uh, insert that has been referred to and which Mr. Shapiro indicated was not initialed and that that was unusual. It, as I look at the, uh, at the, uh, the uh, insert, it does certainly indicate that Mr. Scalambrini did this, uh, dictated this himself, and that he, in fact, typed it. I mean, his initials are indicated as a typist on that, on that uh, record. So I think that was done uh, contemporaneously with the interview, which uh, took place on the first and third, or the third of, uh, first, between the first and third of March, 93. May I be permitted to comment on that, sir? Mm -hmm. the, uh, my comment on being uninitialed referred to their not being penned or inked initialed, which is what the regulations require, uh, not to their not being any type. There was no dispute. That's why we went to Agent Scalambrini about it, uh, mm -hmm. as opposed to going to someone else, that this was a document that purported to come from him. What it lacked... And, he, and that he I, did, in fact, prepare this. That, and well, he says it was. He doesn't specifically recollect it, but it is consistent with the form that he uses, and these are his initials. And yes. isn't it is likely that he had conducted hundreds, if not perhaps thousands, of interviews during this period of time? Absolutely, I, as I recently said. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I want to commend Chairman Klinger for his ongoing and comprehensive effort uh, that this committee has been making under your leadership on the potential abuses uh, at, of the FBI and the issues concerning uh, the utilization of these personnel files. However, while uh, conducting this legitimate oversight, let's not lose sight of what the current FBI Director, Louis Free, has personally brought to the uh, department since his appointment in 1993. When accepting that important and powerful position as director of the FBI, Mr. Free, according to his own annual report to his employees raised with President Clinton, the vital issue of the need for the FBI to retain its independence and have no role in politics. Before, believe me, that was an essential pledge then since the early earlier Travelgate uh, firing affair and some of the public pronouncements about an ongoing uh, investigation by the Bureau, under prodding by the Clinton White House, raised many eyebrow eyebrows, both in our committee and th elsewhere. Director Free has brought a sense of professionalism and pride back to the premier law enforcement agency in the world. And today, while he struggles with the TWA 800 flight inquiry, the Saudi Arabian bombings, as well as the Olympic bombings, he needs our and the nation's support and confidence. Let us keep our eye on the main issues here, the cavalier attitude and problems with the potential abuse of the FBI, its function and uh, very background files lies primarily at the White House. However, the Bureau should not be above criticism and review. 
And let us not forget that we are fortunate to have dedicated people like Director Free leading the FBI, a person who gave up a life tenure on the federal bench to serve his nation. And as the public record makes clear, he is fully cognizant of the need for the Bureau to avoid politics and to retain its independence. Those who would not honor, comprehend, or understand those important goals central to the Bureau's integrity do not belong in positions of trust, whether they be at the FBI, at the White House, or anywhere else in our government today. Mr. Chairman, I do have just a few questions with your permission. Mr. Shapiro, are you one of the first uh, general counsel who is not a former FBI agent when you assume that post? I am the first, sir. You are the first. Um, in your opinion, how should the Department of Justice react if a representative of the FBI on his own shares FBI information with an outside party that bears on the party's possible testimony or other derogatory information or leads that would assist that party in thwarting the government's inquiry. How do you think the Justice Department should react to that kind of a situation? Mr. Gilman, I shared the information with someone who was Kathleen Woolman in the White House Counsel's Office, who I was not aware uh, was giving testimony one way or the other. As to the hypothetical question you put to me, uh, I believe that obviously if the Department thinks that someone at the FBI is interfering with investigation, it's a matter they should take very seriously. And how do you, what do you think the uh, Justice Department should do in that kind of a case? Well, in this case, since the allegation, I believe, would be interference with the Independent Counsel's Office, I think they would defer to the Independent Counsel's Office, uh, which, if they felt that there was a concern, would conduct their own inquiry. They obviously have uh, both the full authority and the wherewithal to do that. And do you think some penalty should be applied in a situation of that nature? Well, that goes to intent, sir. As you know, that's really the issue in the criminal law. And uh, I don't believe people should be penalized, uh, certainly not criminally penalized, uh, for matters that are not intentionally done uh, to interfere with any investigation. Uh, I think that that's the touchstone of, of criminal liability in this country. Uh, and. Uh, and it's frankly the touchstone for most purposes for any administrative liability. Do you think sharing that kind of information with the other party would breach the confidence of the FBI and affect the prosecution? Under the hypothetical you gave me, sir, or under my actions in this case? Under the hypothetical. Under the hypothetical, I believe you posited that it would do that. Uh, so it would be hard for me to disagree. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, using your time, may I ask you, Mr. Shapiro, if in fact did you alert anybody in the White House that uh, they should not divulge that information that you were relaying to Ms. Wallman to anybody else? And were you aware that, in fact, there was an enormous uh, dispersal of that information to a whole variety of people? I was not aware of the dispersal of information. I neither advised the White House nor the Congress who they could contact with the information we made available to them. Do you think it's appropriate that that number of people were made available or made aware of this information? Uh, I'm not sure I'm in a position to say, sir. If I might, uh, if you would yield just for one more inquiry. Um, Mr. Shapiro, wasn't there an ongoing grand jury inquiry I'll give her uh, on the files and on Livingston at the time you made your telephone calls? There, well, I'm not sure, I'm not obviously not fully aware of what inquiries there are. I understand that the Independent Counsel's Office was conducting and is conducting a grand jury investigation into uh, what, into the request for an acquisition of FBI files by the White House. So at the time you made your call, you weren't aware that there was a grand jury investigation? I didn't say that, sir. I said I was aware. You were aware? Yes. The question is, what was the scope of the grand jury investigation? And at the time I made my call, as I said before, I did not believe that the information I was telling the White House Counsel's Office was, was within the scope of their investigation. Gentleman's time has and expired. Thank you. I thank the chairman. And the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I'd, I'd, I'd like to offer my congratulations to the FBI and, and to uh, FBI Director Louis Free. 
for the FBI's careful and sensitive handling of the tragic crash of flight 800 TWA. Uh, a friend and neighbor, Judith Conley Louvier, was on that flight. The crash has highlighted America's vulnerability to terrorism. It has forced us to recognize the importance of thorough security checks at our airports and other sensitive areas. The White House is one of those areas. So if these hearings lead to improvements in the way the White House handles security checks, we will have accomplished at the very least something that's very useful. Unfortunately, too often these hearings have degenerated into partisan uh, conflicts and attacks. After 20 hours of hearings on the FBI files, we have not heard any testimony or seen any evidence of any unethical or criminal behavior by anyone at the White House. Let me be clear, this uh, was an inexcusable and unwarranted intrusion into the private lives of over 400 people. It must not happen again. The White House and the FBI have instituted new procedures to ensure that it will not happen again. And that really should be the focus of these hearings, not who hired whom or who had the credentials to do what job, but how we can improve White House security checks. I am troubled by the inaccuracy of the list of White House uh, pass holders provided by the Secret Service. On July 14th, the Washington Post reported that the Secret Service had prepared a list of holdover pass, holder, pass holders uh, from prior administration that included President Bush, former Secretary of Education, Lamar Alexander, and others. Other reports indicate that in 1994, Secret Service files were not updated when departing employees turned in their badges. We should also find out why FBI files are filled with rumor, half-truths, lies, and sometimes gossip. Security checks help ensure the safety of White House personnel, of the confidentiality of sensitive information. They must be reliable. Uh, but Special Agents uh, Gary Aldrich and uh, Dennis uh, Scullimbrini do not inspire a confidence. We should uh, stop wasting our time with a politically motivated attack on the White House and leave the prosecution to Kenneth Starr. Instead, uh, let's find out what we can do to improve White House security. And with that, I'd like to begin uh, by asking Mr. Shapiro uh, about the recently implemented uh, new procedures for, for releasing uh, FBI information to the White House. Yes, uh, ma'am. Uh, do you believe that these new procedures would prevent the release of FBI files on former employees? Yes, I believe that, that, they, that they will. They require, in almost all circumstances, the consent of the person whose file is being uh, retrieved from the FBI and disseminated to the White House, and uh, it seems very unlikely that one could acquire that consent. Uh, one obviously can never, never make a foolproof system that someone couldn't intentionally circumvent. But um, I believe that the reforms that we've put in that, that I designed in consultation with the director and the deputy attorney general and with the counsel to the president, um, that those reforms will go a long way towards making it uh, very unlikely that anything like that could recur. Do you believe that there are any additional changes that should be made? Well, my staff and, and staff at the council's office have been in continuing dialogue uh, about some of the administrative procedures to, to effectuate and to ensure uh, that these procedures are, are working smoothly. We've also asked and begun a dialogue on uh, whether those files should be permitted to remain at the White House or, or even whether they should as now be uh, accession to the archives after administration or whether they should rather uh, return to the FBI. So there are a number of questions that we're still examining, but I believe the basic process uh, has been dramatically altered and in a way that will prevent uh, the either inadvertent or uh, short of a uh, truly uh, intentional criminal act, it, it would uh, stop uh, these this sort of uh, dissemination of files without authorization. Do you believe that we should put the force of law behind these procedures? Uh, as you may know, Mrs. Uh, Curtis Collins has legislated these procedures into law. Have you seen that legislation? And do you think we need to, to pass laws to make sure that it's uh, upheld? Well, in one respect, let me say the force of law, uh, we note in the, on the document itself for the first time, uh, we make someone certify subject 
to the penalties for false statement that this is sought for an official purpose. So uh, in that respect, obviously, we are putting the force of already extant law uh, mm -hmm. into place. We also put people on notice that any unauthorized disclosure or, uh, in a recent change, any unauthorized request could be a violation of the Privacy Act. Whether or not, uh, I'm not sure I have an opinion uh, on whether the, these procedures uh, need to be implemented by statute. Um, obviously, we wouldn't have an objection to that. My only concern, of course, is it makes it harder to change them in, in light of evolving circumstances uh, once they're legislatively enacted. Do you believe the information in FBI files is reliable? On the uh, whole, On yes, the whole. I do. Um, and when information is in raw files, an awful lot of information is there based on what people tell us. Uh, that's primarily what comes from. Well, what, what, but, but what measures you are taken uh, to verify that the information is true? If you say it's, it's, you rely on what people tell you, how do you verify it to know it's true? How is it reliable unless you know it's true? Well, that, that's the whole nature of the investigative process, is to uh, talk to multiple witnesses to see whether they corroborate uh, the statements or allegations that are made by one, uh, to see, and we do that if it's a matter of any materiality. There is, of course, someone may make a, uh, some sort of statement that is really not material to the inquiry, and no one makes much effort to determine as to that its veracity, but uh, our entire job is taking information from different sources, uh, often conflicting, and through the investigative process, either through multiple witnesses, through objective evidence, through forensic evidence, uh, trying to see uh, where the truth lies. Mm -hmm. Well, my time is up at this point. time has expired. I now recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Shays, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shapiro, we're here because many years ago, the White House fired seven individuals from the travel office, uh, which they had the right to do. And then when it turned out not to be a, p a popular decision, they sought to justify their decision by seeking prosecution of these individuals. They went to the IRS, they went to the FBI, they didn't go to the Justice Department. And as a result of that, they ultimately had to do an internal investigation and apologize to the American people for the misuse of the FBI and the IRS. They also, this government has also had to refund money to some of these seven individuals. That's how this sordid affair started. And it involved the coziness of the FBI and the potential intimidation of the FBI to misuse their office. And that's why you're here today, because there has been a continual cover-up of information that may or not lead to someone's guilt, but the fact that they sought to cover it up leads us to be suspicious. So we are suspicious. I'm suspicious. And I'd like to just uh, to ask first off, you are, what is your exact position? I'm the general counsel. Right. And you, you graduated from what law school? Yale Law School. Which I consider to be one of the finest law schools in the country. So you, you have a pretty good idea of the law, I, I think it's fair to say. Uh, I try to, sir. And you are not a political appointee? No, I am not, sir. You're not a... You are no, a professional I'm, employee I'm a of the FBI. career Justice Department employee. Now, we have the FBI, excuse me, we have the White House Travel Office Management Review, their own review. And they said, Kennedy said that he needed to hear from Bork within the next 15 minutes, and that if the FBI were unable to provide guidance, Kennedy might have to seek guidance from another agency, such as the IRS. That's from the, uh, that's from the, the federal government, that's from the White House's own document. We have a, a 301 form that the FBI interviewed Patrick Foran. He was ho Office of Professional Review, uh, and this, I believe, he was an FBI re uh, uh, employee. Is that correct? I know of Pat Foran as an FBI employee. Right. Okay, he said Kennedy did not want to talk about it on the telephone and asked for a meeting with someone from the FBI headquarters as soon as possible. Kennedy did not want the FBI to send an agent from the field office, noting it was most urgent matter being requested by the highest levels at the White House. That's pretty scary. So we have that kind of on the record. We then seek to get in more information, and in the process of getting more information about the travel office, we find out that the FBI gave 300 files to the White House on people who no longer worked at the White House. 
And subsequent, the FBI has apologized for that. Then we learned it was 400. Then we learned it was 500, maybe 700 to 900. It gets pretty scary. Now, what concerns me is your conduct and the conduct of the FBI, excuse me, the conduct of the FBI in first uh, the information of the Aldrich book, which is also scary, one for what it says and for how Mr. Aldrich seemed to have done a review of the first family, which I think was done very unfairly. And I can now understand if his basis for deciding the Clintons weren't capable and qualified to be to get a White House pass based on the innuendo and so on that he had in the epilogue, I understand why we don't want people to see FBI reports, if that's the basis of it. But I want to talk to you about this. Evidently, we were asked, you were asked a question, excuse me, this is your, um, Mr. Shapiro, this is your deposition. It said, asked, um, can you tell me if there were any other conversations about the Gary Aldrich book with, with anyone at the White House? You said, yes, approximately a week or so later, I could give you the exact date for this too. Mr. Quinn called me to advise me, excuse me, I'm gonna start earlier. On February 96, you gave uh, the Aldrich uh, copy to the White House. And uh, the question was, and did you communicate the substance of that book because they were an interested uh, Was that Jane also? No, it was Jack Quinn. Now, the question is, define to me who an interested party is. I'm sorry, sir. Can you identify what page you're on? I am on page, uh, I guess, 81. Yeah. I see that. 81. But the bottom line is, you were asked if in a line 11 and 12, and your line answered on 13. You said they were an interested party. Well, actually, Ms. Olson said that, and I said, yep. Okay, um, you said, yep. They were an interested party. The bottom line, the answer is the same. They were an interested party. Define to me an interested party. Well, let me define what I meant there, if I might. Uh, what I meant there is, as I've said before, the first draft of Mr. Uh, Aldrich's book, even more so than the draft that was published ultimately without authorization from the. That's FBI. not the question. The question I'm was, were they? The no, no, you're not answering the question. The question was, were, were they an interested party? And you said yes. How is the White House, as someone with your background, how can you tell us that the White House was an interested party and define interested party? That's as, the question. As I was about to say, sir, and I will continue, the first draft of his book contained numerous lengthy passages about internal White House procedures, White House security matters, and the text of interviews of White House people. Those, I told them that I could not ensure, and ultimately was unable to ensure, that Mr. Aldrich would comply with our requirements as to what material could be published and what material could not, that it could be published any day without prior notice to us, as it was, and that I thought, given how much it divulged about internal White House processes, they needed to see it. So you're defining an interested party because? Because the book was replete with internal White House information. Wasn't it replete with other information that would affect other people? Why did you decide it should only go to the White House? Who else do you have in mind, sir? Any other interested party? I'm not sure. Mr. Walters wrote a book about his time at the White House, sir, and it was about the and White it, House and the White House. Well, what about all the people that were mentioned? Weren't they interested parties? Let me get on to the next that question. Did time. not disseminate. How about book. the Secret Service? That Did you time. notify the Secret Service? I'd like an answer to that you question. You can answer that question, then the gentleman's time has expired. Were they not an interested party? Well, I don't know whether they were or not. I think what, if, if what, we, weren't they mentioned? Weren't they discussed? I'm sorry, I can't hear. What no. The, the gentleman's politics. time has expired, and the chair would now recognize the gentle lady from Florida. I'm coming back. Cillian Ross Leighton for five minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I would, I would draw the, uh, the yielding to Ms. Ross Leighton and then recognize the gentleman from <laughs> Pennsylvania. My colleague from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fatah, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Shapiro, you are the lead lawyer in the FBI, is that correct? Yes, sir. General Counsel, you're a career employee of the Justice Department? Yes, sir. And not a political appointee of the Clinton administration? No, sir. The only political appointee... Now, the FBI is somewhat busy these days. You are handling the investigation into the a terrorist attack on... American military troops in Saudi Arabia, is that in, correct? In Dahran, yes, sir. Do you have a role in that, either in terms of issues of international law and matters pertaining to that investigation? 
Uh, I not infrequently have a role in that and, and some of the other investigations we have going on when, when my other obligations permit it. And you, the FBI is handling the investigation into the bombing in Centennial Park at the Olympics? Yes, sir, and I have been twice daily, aside from when I missed it for deposition for this committee, I've been twice daily in participating in uh, conference calls uh, involving lots of obviously uh, important legal issues in the investigation that's proceeding there. And as has been mentioned by uh, my colleague, Mr. Gilman from New York, there is an investigation taking place there uh, that at least in part is being conducted by the FBI. Um, because of the potential uh, that there could have been a criminal act that brought down the uh, Flight 800. Yes, sir, and I've been involved in that on almost a daily basis. I traveled up to Long Island last Friday with the director on that issue. So can you remember a time during your tenure that the FBI and the general counsel's offices had uh, this, these levels of uh, very prominent investigations going on simultaneously? Uh, I, I think this may may be the top of it, sir. But the only other thing I can think of is that in the two or three weeks immediately after the Oklahoma City bombings, I essentially didn't go home then either. So on the list of fairly important matters that you may have to handle as general counsel, I assume you have to pass on the legalities of a whole host of matters dealing with these investigations. Would that, would that be correct, that there are matters in which absolutely. you have to give guidance? Yes, sir, absolutely. I've, uh, two of the last four nights I was, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> woken up in the middle of the night on, on matters such as that. Now, this committee is conducting a hearing today about some FBI files that the White House requested that has to do with some uh, a earlier investigation into the travel office. Are you aware that the Congress passed an independent counsel's law so that when the, when the Congress felt that there was something improper that has taken place that there could be an independent investigation? Are you aware the independent counsel is at? Yes, I certainly am. Are you aware that the Congress has determined um, that there's some matters that sometimes you need an independent counsel and that in this particular matter, as it relates to these travel employees and the FBI files, that the independent counsel's office is conducting an investigation? Yes, I am, sir. Is there any reason that you know of, given your high uh, position in the law enforcement establishment, that this Congress should not have confidence that Mr. Starr's office is capable of investigating these matters? Uh, I don't have any reason to not have full confidence in Mr. Starr and his office. So the fact that we would take from your time in the midst of these other pressing investigations uh, to question, uh, even after you've done a deposition, you about this matter, uh, do you have, is there something that was left out of your deposition? Certainly nothing intentionally. I t testified for about four hours, sir. Well, let me, uh, th there is, in these documents that I've read, a number of issues that come to light. One is that uh, the agent involved, Mr. Scalabrini, is that his name? Scalabrini. Scalabrini. Yes. Uh, Another FBI agent suggests that he had some personal acts to grind, he had some political problems with the White House, and then particularly that he took it very, very hard that these travel office employees were dismissed, uh, he believed unfairly. And that he, in his memorandum, suggests that perhaps he, because of his uh, leanings in this uh, regard, may not be the most reliable person um, at all. There's a lot of back and forth, and I think that's what we want the independent counsel to try to figure out. Because and when you do investigations like this, you have to take all of these different pieces of information and try to figure out where the truth lies. And that's essentially what the FBI specializes in doing, isn't that correct? Yes, sir. And so either side on this, whether the White House is innocent or guilty, whether there's some hideous conspiracy going on, that's what Kenneth Starr's office uh, with a very substantial budget. He, he has this, at his disposal a number of FBI agents, isn't that correct? Yes, I believe approximately 30 FBI agents are assigned to his investigations. And as best as I can determine, he's multi-millions of dollars have been spent by Kenneth Starr's investigation investigating a whole range of matters. Uh, he's been fairly successful in some uh, guilty convictions and others related to uh, 
uh, investigations back in Little Rock. And again, I just want to, for the record, because I'm confused as to why we're holding this hearing, especially why we're holding you hostage in this hearing, when there are so many very important matters that the American public is, depending on the FBI. You know, we spend a lot of time attacking the White House or attacking each other here. This is a little new twist that we would now spend a day uh, attacking the FBI uh, when the American public is really depending on you to be able to get to the bottom of some of these real criminal acts that have taken place. Um, so the independent counsel, again, we should feel comfortable that, uh, based on everything that you know, that there would be a complete and thorough investigation of these matters. I feel comfortable that the independent counsel will thoroughly and completely investigate the underlying matters. I also feel comfortable that if they have concerns or continuing concerns about any actions by me, uh, that they have it fully within their authority and their capability to take whatever steps they need uh, to investigate that and, and to address that. The Thank you. gentleman's time has expired. The chair would now yield to the gentlelady from Florida, uh, Ms. Eliana Ross Layton. If she would yield to me just to ask one question. Of can. course, Mr. Chairman. And the question is this <laughs> uh, I think there's been an effort uh, in the preceding days and at this hearing to discredit uh, Agent Scalambrini on the grounds that he had some bias or other. I just would want to make the point that the interview that he conducted uh, with uh, uh, that Mr. Scalambrini uh, conducted was done at a time long before any question had been raised uh, with regard to the uh, firing of the travel office individuals. There had been no evidence of that. This was early in the administration. So to suggest that somehow because of bias of Mr. Scalambrini that he was distorting an interview he had. Uh, over the hiring of Mr. Livingstone and, and misquoting uh, Mr. Nussbaum, I think, stretches credulity. I mean, this occurred way before there was any question of, uh, of impropriety or firing of the White House 7. Isn't that correct? This uh, interview did occur in March, did it not, of 1993? Yes, and that's before that uh, David Bowie memo. Um, it is, and I, I don't mean to take issue with anything you said, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Aldrich in his book, uh, attributes to Mr. Scalambrini uh, some, uh, I think it's fair to say, negative attitudes towards the White House from as soon as the Clinton administration came in. Yeah, I have the book here, sir. Uh, on uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, the gentle, the gentle lady. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Time. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Shapiro, I want to follow up on uh, some something in your deposition talking about your uh, lack of political experience or that you didn't understand politics, we hear, we read in, in your deposition on page 125 that you haven't had a, a political career. It appears that you seem to use this to, to justify your uh, uh, unseemly uh, contacts with the White House, not just to uh, give them the heads up on a piece of information that uh, should have rightly, rightly gone to the independent counsel, and I'm speaking about the uh, Bernie Nosmom's uh, FBI interview, saying that uh, Craig Livingstone is tied to the First Lady. Uh, you called Jack Quinn and, and told him of this, and, and not just to personally hand deliver uh, a confidential, unauthorized draft of Gary Aldrich's book. I, I see that you've gone now to the bookstore and purchased your own copy. I would like to uh, ask you uh, later on about uh, Director Free and whether his, what his role was in that, if he had asked you to do this. And now we hear uh, from this letter of uh, July 25th by Jack Quinn uh, to, to your director, to your boss, which attacks the chairman of this committee and purports to uh, question the FBI. We hear that you uh, personally helped Jack Quinn edit this letter. And this is uh, too much uh, for us, for some of us, to accept that you didn't see the political consequences of, of your actions. And I'd like to ask you a little bit about your background on, on political affairs, et cetera. D you worked on campaigns in college. Is that correct, Ms. Mr. Shapiro? Well, could I be permitted a moment to address uh, some of what you said already? Well, I just have this one question, and we will continue, and you'd be glad to uh, answer the questions that I have. We're asking now about your political experience in college, if, if you may answer that. I may answer it. I would like to note that uh, as a career employee of the Department of Justice, uh, I would generally consider it, uh, and in fact, by law, by this Congress, it would be inappropriate for me to ask questions about uh, private political activities of 
uh, any of my employees. And speaking uh, about your position in the Department of Justice, you were sworn in as an assistant uh, United States attorney, and it's a stretch of, of my imagination at President least to Reagan. believe that an assistant uh, uh, USA, the highest position of that organization being political appointments, that, that you've never had an understanding of improper uh, political behavior. I've were, never suggested you, that I didn't have that understanding. I answered a question put to me and I answered that question as to whether I was a political appointee, as to whether I made political calculations. Well, you were warned then of, of uh, the dangers of political prosecutions during your career, of political vendettas, of, of political uh, favoritism. And, and so I, I'd like to ask that about was Director was never Freeze. an issue raised or an accusation ever made in any respect about any investigation I conducted uh, that even the slightest suggestion. Uh, I've worked under three presidents and four attorney generals of both political parties uh, and have conducted myself at each time without any regard to political consequences. And had in that I been long more experience attuned, that you've had, uh, Mr. Shapiro, were there any other times when you were asked to edit the letter uh, from the White House I was that not is going asked, to your boss? Or is was, this the only instance that you've had the uh, opportunity to participate I was not in asked, such a... Uh, I was not asked to edit this letter, which was a matter well, I let, asked let for it to have a moment to respond to. What I said was, he read the letter to me beforehand. He asked if anything in its tone would be offensive to the FBI inadvertently so as not to create a separate issue. And he asked me, was it, did I have an opinion based on where I sat as to whether it was appropriate for that letter to come from him as well? Right. I know exactly what you said because I have the deposition here and on page 138 you do talk about uh, uh, what you were asked whether you had an opinion on who that letter should come from from the White House. You discussed whether it should be Jack Quinn, Leon Panetta. You talked about the tone. Uh, why didn't you just say thank you very much, have a nice day, and hang up? I mean, I would seem, it would seem to me that in this wonderful career that you've had with all this great experience, that the appropriate response would have been, this seems to be an inappropriate uh, conversation and hang up and even not even say have a nice day. Why did you continue this conversation and help edit this, uh, this letter, which, as I say, is, is a, a personal insult to our chairman, who I think has conducted this hearing in a very uh, fair way, well, as and, you yet, and yet you say know, that this was not a political part of your job? Mr. Chairman. Let her answer a question, uh, ask her question. Can the witness also have a chance to respond? Well, I think he's going to have plenty of... Fair? Of well, course. I not... just want to make sure that he understands my question. Based on your testimony, you said that you conversed with this gentleman, talked about who the letter should go to, talked about the tone, and I would say that you had a very direct hand in the drafting of this document. Well, you would be wrong, I'm sorry to say. I did not have a direct hand in the drafting of that document. The document was entirely drafted at the point it was read to me. I did say at the beginning I had some awareness. In fact, I think I, the first thing I said to Mr. Quinn was, I will conduct this conversation with you about matters I consider appropriate. Why didn't you, you should up? assume, excuse me, Mr. you should Quinn. assume that we will be deposed about this conversation, uh, and I'm conducting it on the, on the assumption that that's going to go on. Uh, so you think that understanding that you might have a deposition related to it is more than enough justification for you to continue uh, with, with a, in a conversation about the drafting of this letter. Again, I don't the, believe that's what I said. The gentle lady's what, time has expired. You may complete the thank answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what I was, the letter was read to me in uh, complete form. I was advised of uh, a dispute internally as to what one word should be and asked whether that word would uh, create problems they were not seeking to create at the FBI. You will note, if you've read my deposition, that as to the allegation, the comment about Mr. Klinger, I went out of my way to say to them, that's not a subject you should discuss with me, and I will not have anything to say about what it, you propose to say about the committee or Mr. Klinger, yep. and that, too, is in my deposition. At the gentleman's time has expired. The chair would now recognize the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. Wise, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I would yield my time to uh, Ms. Collins. The, oh, I'm sorry, to Ms. Maloney. Uh, okay. The gentlelady from New York is therefore recognized. Well, my question was, well, do you want to pass? Yeah, if you want to. Would you yield? 
Well, then I yield to Mr. Fatah. Thank you. <laughs> wow, wow, Mr. Robin. Shapiro. Oh, bouncing around. Would you start the clock again, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> Mr. Shapiro, you were, yes, uh, in the last uh, series of questioning, uh, trying to be responsive. You were accused uh, a number of times of e editing this letter. Uh, and you've stated now for the record that the letter was read to you in its complete form. It was read to me in its complete form. I was advised that there was a, uh, that they had a question about one word or one phrase right. and that they were recommending, I, I told them that I agreed that the form they were recommending uh, would be less troublesome in terms of anyone at the FBI inadvertently taking offense at something that they did not mean to say. And you also suggested that when you had the, your appointment uh, at the Justice Department that you, uh, as I think Deputy uh, Associate Counsel, Assistant Counsel, that was in the Reagan administration? I was uh, hired by Rudy Giuliani as an Assistant United States Attorney in the Reagan administration. I held that position through uh, the Bush administration and left uh, at the conclusion of the Bush administration and then came back here under the Clinton administration uh, into my position at the FBI. Mr. Would Mr. Fatah yield some time to yes, I the gentlelady from New York? Yes, I would gladly Thank you. Uh, Robert uh, Gelman, a prominent uh, Washington uh, lawyer, argues that providing FBI files to the White House is a violation of the Privacy Act because the White House is not an agency. And what is your opinion, Mr. Shapiro? My opinion is uh, I have a lot of respect for Mr. Gelman, but he's wrong. Uh, that the uh, uh, routine use notice that puts people on notice that we are, uh, among other things, going to disseminate these documents to the White House um, is uh, not using agency in the narrow technical term as used in one portion of the Privacy Act. It's in fact used in different ways in the Privacy Act. Well, do you believe that it'd be a violation of the Privacy Act for a member of Congress to disclose information contained in an FBI file to the public? As far as I'm aware, the Congress in drafting the Privacy Act did not cover the Congress by the Privacy Act. Well, well do you believe uh, that the chairman's disclosure of uh, raw FBI background files without uh, uh, supporting evidence violates the spirit, if not the letter, of the Privacy Act? I don't believe I'm perhaps in the best position to answer that question. <laughs> well, let, let me phrase it another way. Would, would the FBI make this type of uh, information public without supporting evidence? The FBI does not generally make public avail information from background investigations, whether it has or it does not have supporting evidence. Would the general aid yield to me? I certainly will. Just to, to make the point, however, that the FBI did disseminate this information to individuals in the White House who in turn disseminate outside of the White House to private individuals. Isn't that yes, correct? I didn't add that. I sort of assumed that was well understood by everyone. Um, uh, Mr. Shapiro, are you aware that uh, Craig Livingston's mother, uh, Gloria, has denied knowing the First Lady? I have heard that. Are you aware that the First Lady has denied knowing Craig Livingston's mother? Yes. Are you aware that in sworn uh, statement before this committee, Mr. Nesbaum has denied saying that the First Lady wanted Craig Livingston hired? Yes. Are you aware that in a sworn statement before this committee, Mr. Kennedy has denied saying that the First Lady wanted Craig Livingston hired? Yes. Uh, did uh, these denials at least uh, raise the possibility in your mind uh, that Mr. Scalabrini's note in uh, Mr. Livingston's FBI file might be wrong? It raised the possibility that it might be inaccurate. Again, I don't want to suggest that we thought or, or considered, really, that he may have intentionally falsified it, but it raised the possibility that it may have been inaccurate, and that's why we sent two agents to interview him. Do you believe that the White House had the right to know that this committee was uh, given access to Craig Livingston's file? Uh, I've given that a lot of thought over the last few days, as you might imagine. Um, uh, I think it would have, under the circumstances and the appearance that uh, were created, it would clearly have been better if I had not advised them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I, but uh, I was motivated entirely by the good faith belief uh, that that was the best way to be even handed and to advise them of the fact that information we had gathered for them uh, was being provided to uh, the Congress for use, presumably, in a public hearing. 
Uh, do you believe that the FBI did anything illegal or unethical in releasing the FBI file summaries to the White House? Are you talking about my release or the earlier release of the files? The, the 400 files. Both. Um, I don't believe that the FBI did anything illegal in any either situation. Um, and I guess I don't believe the FBI did anything unethical in either situation. In both situations, um, I think we could have exercised better judgment. Uh, going back to uh, Mr. Gelman's uh, uh, point that he raised, uh, do you believe that uh, there's enough confusion to warrant the issuance of new regulations specifying that a federal agency includes the White House? You bet I do. In fact, I've instructed our people to uh, redraft the routine use notice to ensure that it includes the words uh, any agency including the White House. I, I would note that on the same page where the routine use notice uh, appears in the Federal Register is a chart of the different indices and who they get disseminated to, and it says White House Special Index yeah, well. disseminates information in background files to the White House. It is, it is inconceivable to me that any citizen consulting the Federal Register for wanting to know the routine uses and seeing that chart on there that says White House Special Index information will be disseminated uh, would not be on notice, which is of course what the routine use notification is for, that the White House was one of the agencies. Uh, contrary to Mr. Gilman's uh, point. The gentleman's, mm -hmm. a gentle lady's time has expired and the uh, chair notes that the vote is in progress at the present time and the uh, committee will stand in recess until 1.20. Uh, the Committee of Government Reform and Oversight will resume uh, its hearing, and the chair would recognize for five minutes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Shapiro. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I've heard you refer to yourself as a career employee uh, uh, at the FBI. Uh, in fact, uh, of the Justice Department. Of sir. the Justice Department, and you have. Uh, I guess you work with uh, Louis Free back uh, uh, in your previous uh, professional experience. That's, is that correct? Yes, sir. We were uh, assisting United States attorneys together in the Southern District of New York. Well, you didn't come on as a uh, originally as a uh, career employee, unless uh, this press release is wrong that I have. This press release says that uh, you were teaching uh, at. Uh, law school and uh, would take a two-year leave of absence, is that correct, I've, initially? I, I've, I have a break in service, but I was hired into a career position, Mr. Mike. Are you still on a leave of absence? Yes, I am. They keep extending it for me. You're a career, uh, and you've converted to career civil service. I'm in the senior executive service. I'm not certain of your status and whether you can do that. I chair the House Civil Service Subcommittee. I'm going to ask our subcommittee to look into uh, those terms. As, as you know, Mr. Micah, the FBI has its separate SES Right, statute. I know it does, yeah. and we're going to check into that. But I've, I've not heard of that kind of a relationship where your career and also on a leave of absence of and it may, we may need to change that uh, because <laughs> for all intents and purposes it appears that uh, you can subvert the political appointment process and uh, someone can uh, put someone in a position uh, such as your position uh, who is a friend, create a car uh, to career and also give them the advantage of uh, staying on a leave of absence which I'd have some questions about. But I want to take a minute and and talk about the sequence of uh, events on Monday, uh, July 15th. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, Maggie Owens, uh, who's the uh, FBI Congressional Affairs Liaison, uh, was notified by our committee uh, of a congressional uh, <coughs> request to review Craig Livingston's background file. Is that correct? Yes, I believe that, she received was, a call that morning. And that was mo Monday morning, and then she told you, uh, she told you about that? At some point that morning, she told me about that. 
okay? And uh, what did you tell her to do? Well, I'm not sure I told her to do anything, but I, she doesn't work for me. I did ask her had she checked with the independent counsel. Then what'd she say? She advised that they had no objection to providing the information to the Congress and that they had declined uh, her offer to make the file available to them. So you were concerned uh, at that point, just from a congressional inquiry, that in, in fact uh, she should uh, check with the independent counsel, right? It's not that I was concerned. It was that we had agreed with the independent that's counsel. Mo that's we, Monday morning. We had agreed with the independent counsel, sir, that before any information was provided up to the Hill that we would check with was them Was that first. Monday before noon, you'd say? Yes. Okay. And uh, when did you and Mr. Kelly look at that file, the Livingston file? I believe it was sometime in the mid-afternoon that I looked at it. On Monday? I first saw it around uh, 2 o'clock. And so did you see it? At a little bit later than that, maybe 3 o'clock. Uh -huh. So who did you think you should call first, the independent counsel or the uh, congressional committee make them aware of what you'd uh, found? Well, I knew the congressional committee was scheduled to be over within an hour or so and didn't need to be prompted to do so. I w took the earlier comments of Ms. Owens to mean that the independent counsel was not the scope of their investigation did not extend to uh, these matters. But you asked uh, her to contact uh, the special counsel and check that, or did she do it on her own? I had asked her if she did check that. She said she had done it oh, on so her own. So she did it on her own. And you were concerned at that point uh, that that be checked out. But you wanted to contact the White House first before, the, and, and you looked at the file about 2 o'clock, and you looked at it. Uh, what time? I don't remember the time. I, would, I thought it was closer to 3 by the time I saw it, but I don't know for sure. By 3 o'clock. What time did you decide to send the FBI to Mr. Scalabrini's house? The following day. Now, now wait a second. That, that can't, at 9.15 in the morning, uh, the agents called. You testified that at 9.15 in the uh, morning, the next morning, uh, they said they were on their way. Well, we, now, did you? That's, did that's you? because I called them early the following morning. Pardon? That's because I called them early the following morning. You called them at what time the next morning? Before 9 o'clock, 8.30. So before 9 o'clock. So they were uh, then at 9.15 calling him immediately and at his house at 11 o'clock. Is that correct? That's my understanding, yes. And did you, uh, who was the paralegal that looked through the files? I believe Jim Stroud. And did Jim contact you first or... Uh, Mr. Shapiro first, his, Mr. His Kelly first. His unit chief, Paul Signoli, brought the uh, documents with him to a regularly scheduled meeting I have with my unit chiefs at 2 o'clock. And then did you contact, uh, uh, I want to know the sequence of, of who you contacted. Did you contact uh, Gorlick uh, uh, first after, you, a, after 2 o'clock? Did you do that, Kelly, or did you do that, Mr. Shapiro? No, when I would at some point, I returned into the office space. We share a suite as Mr. Kelly's meeting with his unit chiefs was breaking up sometime mm -hmm. 2.30, 3 o'clock. He brought it to my attention, um, and shortly thereafter, so, I... So who was contacted first, the White House or the uh, Gorlick, the Deputy Attorney General? The Deputy Attorney General's office. You're sure of that? That they were advised of the information first, yes. That, that who was advised? The White House was advised first or the Attorney General was advised first? Deputy Attorney General's Chief of Staff, Dennis Corrigan, was advised first when I finished that call. Before the White House? Before I called Kathleen Wallman. Gentlemen's time has expired. Following uh, consultation, which I have had with the ranking minority member, we have agreed to extend Rule 19 of the Rules of the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight through the last day of August 1996 for the sole purpose of conducting a deposition of David Craig Livingstone. We've had to do this to accommodate Mr. Livingstone's attorney who had other commitments, unbreakable commitments this week. It's my understanding that Mr. Livingstone will appear voluntarily and I would exercise my subpoena authority under the CNAMIS consent request only if a voluntary appearance cannot be arranged. And without objection, there is there objection, without objection, is it so ordered? Gentleman, gentleman from Indiana. Mr. Chairman, I ask CNAMIS consent to proceed out of order. I have to go to a meeting in the Senate and speak in just a few minutes. Without objection. I thank my colleagues for allowing me this. First of all, let me just say that uh, we are not attacking the FBI. 
we're attacking some things and questioning some actions that took place. The FBI does a great job for this country, and I don't think anybody should misconstrue our actions. Uh, Mr. Gilman said a while ago, or was during his questioning, uh, he asked you, Mr. Shapiro, about the uh, grand jury investigation. Now, the grand jury investigation was going on regarding, uh, we believe, Livingstone and Marcisa. You said you did not know the scope of the grand jury investigation or who may or may not have been involved, and yet you gave information to the White House, which ultimately went to at least 16 of the officials at the White House. Uh, since you didn't know the scope of the grand jury investigation, but you knew basically what it pertained to, don't you think that may have impeded the, uh, the judicial process or the grand jury process? Well, I have no reason to believe the information I, I uh, gave to the White House and that they chose independently to subsequently disseminate that, that it has, in fact, impeded anything. However, uh, I, uh, well, there's no however. You, you, you don't question that at all? I mean, there was a grand jury investigation involving two employees at the White House. Former employees. By the, four employees, by the independent counsel, and you gave information to the White House, which may have had an impact on that grand jury investigation. Uh, and as I understand it, you graduated cum laude from undergraduate school. You went to Yale. Magna cum laude from undergraduate school. Magna cum laude, excuse me. Magna cum laude. And you also worked in the Gotti case. Uh, you, you, you no, really, I did not. You did not. Well, you worked on a number of major cases, as I, I, I think I had a successful York. career as an assistant United States attorney. And, and for you to, to make a mistake like that seems very questionable to me. It, it has troubled me, too, Mr. Burton. I've, uh, it's not the first time I've ever made a mistake. And I, uh, well, you sure I, made I, a doozy I, this I wish time. it would be the last, but I can't assure you of that either. Well, it, it, it was a doozy if it was a mistake. Uh, incidentally, you, you said you came, you're a career employee, but let's make sure we have the record state, straight. You were not with the FBI before this administration. No, and I did you, not you, mean you, to suggest otherwise. You came when Mr. Free came, who was a political appointee, and he brought you with him from New York. Is that correct? Based on our having worked together as assistant United States attorneys together in New York. But the fact is, before that time, you were not a career employee. I mean, I don't want to mis mislead well, anybody who's paying attention to these hearings. <laughs> I was a career employee for the Department of Justice. I maintained a Department of Justice appointment, a special appointment, even while I was at Cornell Law School, and I came back into a career position at the FBI. But you were not a career employee at the FBI? No. Okay. No, sir. Uh, I, now, am, there, there I were, am now. I was not there. You said in testimony a while ago there are 30 or approximately 30 FBI agents working with Mr. Starr. Uh, yes, the, sir. The Attorney General said because of a possibility of a conflict of interest, she didn't want the FBI involved in this. And yet, even though Mr. Starr had 30 FBI agents, you chose, after Janet Reno said this, to send two FBI agents out to see Mr. Scalabrese. Mr. Burton, uh, you're asking me again about the ramifications of the same decision. Had I, had I uh, made the determination that this was a matter within their scope, there's a lot of things I wouldn't have done. Having made the determination, perhaps erroneously, that this was a matter outside of their scope, I couldn't refer it to the independent counsel. But I think it stretches credibility or credulity for us to believe that you, a man who has the expertise that you have, knowing that this has been turned over to Kenneth Starr, who has 30 FBI agents, to go ahead and of your own volition to send two FBI agents out to investigate somebody or talk to somebody who may have a bearing, who has a direct bearing on the FBI's investigation through the independent counsel. Well, I am sorry that it strains credibility, sir, because unfortunately it happens to be the truth. And yeah. I, I wish I could uh, convince you of that some other way other than to say, I make a thousand decisions a day, sir. I don't have four days after the fact to think about them. Looking back at it now, I can understand why it seems like an unlikely decision. At the time, making the decision on the fly, that's the decision I made. If Let it was me just wrong, say that this entire investigation, We've had case after case after case where people have selective memory loss, they've made mistakes, it goes on and on and on. And after a while, the committee starts saying, my gosh, doesn't anybody remember anything? Doesn't anybody take responsibility? Have for I failed actions? to remember anything, sir, in the last four hours? I'm not just talking about you. Okay. Thank now, you. has Louis Free expressed uh, concerns to you about what you did, or has Mr. Gorlick? Or Ms. Gorlick, rather? I haven't discussed this matter with the Deputy Attorney General or the Attorney General. Um, the, uh, the director and I have had a number of conversations about it. And what was his response? What did he think about it? Uh, he wishes I hadn't done it. <laughs> so do we. First, let's... Uh, so do let, I, let, me, let me get this straight here. Uh, the people you, you did not advise about this were the Independent Council, the Senate Judiciary Committee, or the members of this committee before you advised the White House Council, 
the Deputy Attorney General's Office, who has a lot of uh, uh, liaison and connection with the White House. It's widely known that since Mr. Hubble left the Justice Department, Ms. Gorlick, the Deputy AG, has the most intimate relationship with the White House, both political and otherwise. If you step back and look at the results of your decisions to notify the White House and the Justice Department, the Democrats who needed to perform damage control were made aware, but the Republicans and the independent counsel investigating the ma matter knew much later. So we, we gave the people who were trying to defend themselves a heads up first. Mr. Burke. That, now, let me just get my question. Yes, sir. Doesn't this fly in the face of your so-called policy of being nonpartisan and everybody e being equally informed? No, because uh, as you know, since I've testified about it perhaps four or five times this morning, my intent was, <coughs> excuse me, which was uh, subverted by the fact that uh, unknown to me the appointment had been canceled, was to make roughly simultaneously. Well, now, let that me may have been a mistake, sir, but it's a different mistake than the one you're accusing me of now. Well, I'm not talking about your intention. I'm talking about the bottom line, the practical result. The fact is you're asking this committee and the American people to believe that this was another bureaucrat's innocent mistake. And with your credentials, it just stretches my imagination to think a man with your, of your caliber and your background could make this kind of a blunder. It's I am appreciative, sir, that you have such a high opinion of I me do and my abilities. About your, uh, your background. I, and and I, I, I don't mean to, I'm not saying that at all tonight. I'm saying I, too, am capable of making, uh, from time to time, horrific blunders. And if I've made one here, and obviously to some extent I have, uh, I, I deeply regret that. I, am, I do not act flawlessly in this job. This and administration is rife, full of all these kinds of blunders. Have we you ever known after one after that wasn't, after sir? Week after week. Thank the you, gentleman's Chairman. time has expired. The chair would now recognize uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Blute, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I again commend you for holding these hearings, and, and I thank the witnesses for their testimony. Uh, as has been said, I think most of us and most Americans hold the FBI in very high regard, uh, view it as a, for the most part, professional law enforcement agency that has done great work uh, for the American people over its long history. And that's not to say that from time to time there haven't been problems with the FBI, and I think uh, those of us who have studied the history of it know about what happened during the Watergate era and the misuse of the FBI, and perhaps even before that, uh, some problems with the way certain FBI files were used by uh, various FBI people with regard to Dr. King, for example. Uh, these are problems that I think were corrected, and the FBI has moved on and again regained its high stature with the American people. I think this committee would like to see that trend continue, uh, and we find some of the things very troubling that have occurred here uh, not just here, but uh, uh, seemingly a pattern, and we look for patterns on this committee. I want to ask you about a pattern uh, in which uh, the FBI has been misused by this White House. We know about the Travelgate investigation in which the FBI was brought in very quickly. Uh, we know that Janet Reno spoke out very strongly about that and said it was wrong, it shouldn't happen again. Uh, with the regard to the FBI files, uh, Director Free has said that the FBI was quote unquote victimized by the White House and that this wouldn't happen again. My question to you, Mr. Shapiro, in your key capacity, uh, what kind of message were you getting from the top about uh, how to interact with this White House? It would seem to me that you would have gotten the word from Janet Reno, from Director Free, and from everyone on up that uh, it, would be, it would behoove you and the rest of the FBI to be very careful in your dealings with this White House, given the track record uh, that had already uh, begun. Yet, even with all of those uh, warnings, uh, the heads up still went to the White House staff on the uh, issue of uh, Mr. Nussbaum, uh, Mr. Livingstone's file and what was in it. And uh, Mr. Aldridge's book was still, uh, uh, the text was still presented to, uh, to the uh, White House staff. My question to you is, didn't you have some uh, sense that uh, you needed to tread carefully in this area? Mr. Blue, that's a very fair question. Let me say at the outset, I'm proud to have been an integral part of some of those achievements over the last three years, Oklahoma City, Unabom, the Freeman, uh, the investigations we're conducting right now. Uh, those are the things I normally spend most of my time doing. Uh, the, uh, let me say that, of course, I have received the message and, uh, and, and have heeded it uh, f 
for the most part, from time, day, to, day in and day out, about being careful with our relations with the White House. The director has been very firm about that, has been very strong about that. Um, uh, perhaps uh, in this case, I was insufficiently attentive to that. I mean, I, I think I have said that. In the files matter, as you well know, I wrote a report uh, that went on directly advise not directly addressing the White House's conduct, was a very hard-hitting report, and one that didn't make the White House by any means happy, as one could tell from their subsequent public statements. They, haven't, they didn't talk to me about it. Uh, it Maybe in that context, I, I uh, allowed myself to think that there would be less likelihood that someone would challenge my independence, my veracity, my integrity, uh, and that in my effort to be even-handed here, I took a little bit too much for granted the fact that I had staked out a very independent position. Let me ask you this. What kind of a relationship do you have with White House staffers, White House counsel? I mean, how often did you talk to them on the phone? Did they periodically call you up to chat about various things that were happening over there at the FBI? Were you the go-to guy in the White House There's for to get uh, a sense of what was happening within the FBI? No one calls from the White House to find out generally what's happening in the FBI. There is no go-to guy. There is no normal channel. Uh, their connection is with the Department of Justice. How often now, would you have conversations with Jack Quinn, for example, the White House counsel, a kind of a parallel position? I, I spoke to Jack Quinn uh, on a number of occasions in redesigning the form of White House requests because they're the other side of that and the pieces have to fit together. If you exclude that, those conversations, which probably were five or six or eight, um, I've probably spoken with him over the years that he's been in there fewer than uh, five or certainly fewer than ten times. It is an unusual occurrence. And those just, were conversations about uh, well, I think we've discussed most of them ongoing, here. Uh, uh, two about situations. the Aldrich book, um, uh, uh, one where he called to see who the appropriate person <coughs> to send this letter, not for me to edit his letter. I'd like Let me to ask know. you how you made your judgment, and, and you've discussed it to some extent, but I want to get a little deeper on the, the what we're calling a heads up to the White House uh, with regard to these files. Uh, again, in light of the fact that Janet Reno had stated that, uh, the, that the FBI was improperly used during the Travelgate investigation, in light of the fact that uh, Director Free had said very strongly that the FBI was victimized during the, the, the FBI file request thing. I mean, wh what kind of process did you think about uh, this as you thought and weighed in the balance whether you should have revealed uh, this to the White House? I think it is clear in retrospect that I didn't think about it nearly enough, period. Um, that I became aware of the information. I knew it was the subject of, of, of considerable public controversy and dispute before. Uh, I knew this was information that we had, of course, originally gathered for the White House, and knowing that it was going to the committee supposedly that afternoon, within an hour, uh, there's, there's not more anything more to it, Mr. Blewett. I, I, I wish I had thought through it in a, a little more depth. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, this committee uh, has a responsibility to the American people to get these facts on the, on the record and to indicate uh, our concern about the misuse of the FBI whenever it occurs and to continue to urge the FBI and its internal structure to put up significant firewalls between a political operation at the White House and a legitimate law enforcement responsibility that the FBI has. I think those firewalls, uh, at the very least, have been breached. Uh, perhaps we have to think about building higher walls. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman from Massachusetts. I now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, uh, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's been a long day for you. I'm going to try to just get through a couple issues. Um, listening to, to your responses today, um, I get the impression that one of the agents up here who has been maligned by some of the, in my judgment, maligned by some of the other members, uh, Agent uh, Scalabrini, that instead of defending him, you seem to be going out of your way to cast doubt about his credibility. I, I don't mean to be doing that, sir. Okay. I do mean to explain the basis why I sent agents to interview him. I had. You were, asked that. you were asked that question, and that's, yes. and that's that's fair comment. But but I think people have taken those that hedging and run with it. And I'm going to just ask a couple other follow-ups yes, on sir. that, just to give us a chance to re, to clarify this and put it because he's not here to defend himself right. at, at this and point. I, and I do not mean to personally attack. Yeah. Uh, but for, for example, in response to the, the Chairman Klinger's questions um, of Mr. Scalabrini doing the background interviews well before the travel office firings, before there were any issue at all. 
you, at that point, it seemed to me you gratuitously almost referred to something in Mr. Aldridge's book. Do you remember what I'm talking about? I do, sir. Yeah, let me, I mean, first, what's in, I've re I read the book. I was going back in an airplane, and this is the only book in my bag, and I, I read it, and it, the quotes from Mr. Scalabrini are third-party quotes. They weren't under oath. We don't know if he actually said them and at, the, at that point. Uh, he wasn't under oath at the time. Um, could you put this in a context? Of yes, sir. And I do not mean to rely on in any great extent or to, uh, to suggest that I have much confidence in the content of Mr. Aldrich's book. However, uh, uh, what I understood the chairman to be asking me was whether there was any basis at the time, anything I'm aware of at that time that would have given rise to those concerns. The one indication I am aware of is in Aldrich's book. And for all the serious questions that I have and I know others have about Aldrich's credibility, Dennis Scalabrini was his friend and partner. I didn't, uh, I have somewhat partner, less reason. Not partner in the book, was he? Was he partner I'm sorry? In the book? No, partner. no, partner at the White House. Right, okay. I had less reason to believe he would slander him or, or, or falsely praise him. Um, if that's how he sees it, I don't know how Mr. Aldrich would see it. In any event, uh, but you're right to note that, and I didn't mean to be relying as a authoritative text on Mr. Aldrich's book. Do you, do you question his credibility uh, at this point, Mr. Scalabrini's? Uh, do you question the credibility of the writing he put forward in those uh, notes of March of 1993? And, and let me just add. He would write down what he heard, as most FBI agents would do. That doesn't mean what they heard was correct. Absolutely. Somebody could be telling him, and that one thing we've learned in these hearings is that there's a lot of hearsay in these files that are told to agents they write it down, file them. But we don't have any basis at all, do we, for thinking Mr. Scalabrini manufactured this? I question the accuracy. I do not question his credibility in it. it did, as I said during my deposition, I was asked that question. It never occurred to me that he falsified, fabricated that information. It did occur to me that it was distinctly possible that he had transposed what one witness said to him in the course of interviews into another witness's mouth. In fact, he does this insert not immediately after seeing that one witness, but after seeing a series of witnesses mm -hmm. and goes back and types it up. Now, I don't know exactly when he did it because it's not dated. Nothing wrong with that. It just makes it hard for me to know how much after the fact he did it. And as I said in my deposition, I did not have reason to believe, and I do not now, that he intentionally got that wrong. Um, Does which, anybody else have any comments on that up here at the table? Anybody else have any any uh, uh, evidence uh, or any thought that somehow Mr. Scalabrini was putting something here that wasn't uh, that he didn't feel was accurate? Uh, my thought process is essentially the same as Mr. Shapiro's. Uh, what we did <coughs> was look to see whether or not there was anything that would corroborate what he wrote in his in his um, insert by asking whether he had made any notes. That's one of the primary reasons we sent somebody out there to see if we could tell from his notes whether it was properly attributed in the uh, insert. Yeah, but generally you wouldn't get, uh, you know, I don't want to get in the investigative phase of this uh, either, but generally you wouldn't keep notes on something like that, would you? This was a small factor at the time because this wasn't an issue at the time. That's true. And generally, as he told us, uh, he generally kept his notes for a few days to make sure that everything went well in the filing of the report, and then he tossed them. There would have been no reason, I mean, he had no idea at the time that this would blow up, that the travel office uh, employees would be filed. Fired, uh, that Mr. Livingstone would rise to Providence and that the very innocent comment made to him that, that, that somehow this could have uh, been anything else. I cannot see how he could possibly have known that. Okay. I just want to make sure of that. So we don't have any real reason to doubt him at this point that what he put in there was accurate, do you? I don't. Okay. Do you, Mr. Schroer? I'm sorry. Any reason to doubt him? You don't have any reason him? to doubt that what he put in there was as he heard it. Well, the only reason to doubt it, it which is as available to you as to me, is that apparently everyone involved in it denies it. The chairman would yield on that. I'd be happy to yield. Just to ask the question, you're suggesting that he may have heard this from somebody other than Mr. Nussbaum in the course of his interviewing for the background, whether or not to give uh, Mr. Livingstone a... But doesn't that suggest that he, in fact, heard it from someone? It absolutely does, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it absolutely does. And that uh, and you know, whether it was from Nussbaum or somebody else, there's no question that he heard he would not have put that information into that background report unless well, he heard it from somebody. I don't have a basis to disbelieve him on that. In fact, he says he heard something like that from Livingston himself. And that's obviously one possible. Well, let me just ask, uh, how long after an interview are FBI agents required to dictate the results of an interview? In, if it is a normal 302, an investigation, there's a five-day rule. I don't know if there's a separate rule for applicant procedures. Faster, because there are deadlines associated with them. 
So that generally this would have been done the next few days? Within the next few days, I think it's fair to so say. So his mind, in, in theory, would have been pretty fresh at this point. Uh, sure, although I don't know how many people he would have seen. And the only, the only reason that you would reflect up here, at least to us, any kind of uh, doubt at all is the fact that uh, we've had testimony under oath that's different. Yes. But other, other than Mr. Nussbaum's comments uh, on this and denials by the administration, you have no basis. No independent basis, no, sir. Okay. And just one other question. The, uh, I, I just want to, I think it's important to clarify that both for you and for Mr. Scalabrini. And I see my time's up. Let me just ask the indulgence to one other question. In the letter that Mr. Quinn wrote to uh, uh, Director Frey, yeah, to the director, uh, and where the uh, chairman here was, uh, was under attack, Mr. Scalabrini was also under attack on that. Did you share your concerns at that point about an FBI agent being under attack as you did about Chairman? In, in fact, I did. In fact, the one comment I made, which I've been accused of editing or drafting this, which of course I did not do, was that the draft said, uh, acu used the, 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 what they read to me that was two versions, whether they had falsified or whether the information has been claimed to be false. And I said, we have no basis to determine that this has been falsified, and that would be taken as an affront. Thank you. I, I'm glad you got a chance to do that. I appreciate the opportunity to say that. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, I understand from uh, uh, counsel that we don't have a copy of the letter that was just referred to, to Mr. Quinn. May we have a copy of that letter for our, our uh, side of the aisle, please? The a copy of the letter from Mr. Quinn to, to for Mr. Mr. Free. Uh -huh. Copy, but I would assume that you, well, you don't. Well, I don't know it. why you don't treat me right. <laughs> <laughs> I will well, personally I give you I my thought, copy. I would assume that uh, since Mr. He he sent it, Mr. Quinn gave it to us, he would have given it to as well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the uh, chair would now be pleased to recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter, for five minutes. I've got a, a number of concerns I want to uh, address here at the beginning that we've been through many different hearings. Uh, we and who are freshmen on this committee tend to be at the tail end uh, of that and have heard many questions and sometimes some of the questions get repeated. But it's an eerie experience that uh, brings a lot of things back from when I was in my politically uh, formative years, uh, whether it's the a kind of casual sharing of information between the FBI and the White House that may not be uh, directly related to a, a law enforcement question, the, whether they be uh, what we used to read about uh, J. Edgar Hoover uh, and uh, Martin Luther King files and a way to ingratiate himself. Uh, this certainly, while it may have been an accident, uh, looks like it could also be attempt to ingratiate himself. It's too early for us really in this process, which brings us back to the other uh, formative experience when I was in college and that uh, was watching the Watergate hearings. Quite frankly, in the first year of that, there was, it looked like mostly a political charge and that the first people were not necessarily uh, coming forth and a lot of Republicans stood up and asked softball questions and defended and and weren't really interested necessarily in getting into what happened but rather in engaging in a, in a partisan debate. Hopefully for America this will not be a repeat of that and in fact in the end we'll find out that there was no bad intentions. One of our concerns however and I think members on the other side need to be careful with this too is whether or not there's been an orchestrated, and one of the things that was learned from Watergate was not that we shouldn't repeat errors, but that we have to manage them more. One of the most disturbing episodes that I've been through was sitting through some of the deposition with Jane Sherborne. Not because I know that she's done anything wrong. In fact, I don't know that she has. But the chart that's up there, the chart that's been uh, distributed and put in the record, uh, suggests a level of insensitivity to how oversight works and an insensitivity to the American public's uh, concern about whether their government is straightforward. She said, with a very soft but nevertheless arrogant approach, that of course I would have talked to people before they came to the oversight hearing. Of course we talked to people who weren't even employees anymore because we went out uh, because they were calling in, wanted to know what they could say and couldn't say. I'm a good attorney, uh, of course I did this. Furthermore, she said, of course I debriefed everybody as they came from the committee. Now, it may be because they were worried that there were gonna be political charges and it's an election year. It also is how you do a cover-up. It, and that 
it is impossible for us as an oversight committee to get to this kind of information if it's all the time being orchestrated what comes up here and doesn't. And the arrogance in that process has been very frustrating, not so much the personal arrogance, but that. And the point about this was a mistake, everybody makes mistakes, including people who were in Watergate made mistakes. But they had to pay for certain mistakes, even if they didn't have malicious intent at, at the time of those mistakes. And the other thing is, is these mistakes seem to be repeated in certain areas. The mistakes seem to be repeated over and over where it happens to be politically potent mistakes. And at some point, you, you say, well, individuals can make the mistakes and they can make them in multiple departments, but will they make the same type of political mistakes in department after department? And what I want to do is review a little bit what we've had as a result of your actions, Mr. Shapiro. Those who would need the information in the Livingstone file for damage control purposes were alerted first. May have been an accident, but in fact, that's what happened. And those who were investigating knew last. And no explanations or excuses can change the basic fact. Even though you acknowledge you wish it hadn't happened, that's in fact hindered our ability. The last we, was, of course, about 12 hours later, but 18 hours later. But they had, in a system where they already were doing this whole type of approach, those hours become important to being able to get to witnesses, know where the information is, and as an oversight committee, tremendously restrains our ability to get the fact. We've also learned that you shared the Aldrich manuscript with the White House. It had political materials. Once again, it was coming out in public, but it went to them first, which means they had the opportunity to control witnesses before they came to this committee. But that's you not say, why it went to them. You said you, said you uh, helped uh, edit a letter for the White House counsel, which attacked both our chairman and your own FBI agents. Now, you say it wasn't editing. You were consulting. By almost any definition of editing, you had the opportunity to edit. You say you made some changes. By most definitions, that's editing. And it was a political letter with which you should have withdrawn from. I did not say I made some changes. I said they advised me you of said two there were versions. Two uh, excuse me. Yeah, they said they advised me of two versions. They said they were inclined to go with one. I said that would be less offensive to us than the other. That's not were, actually. Were you read the whole letter? Was I read the whole letter? Yes. I, I don't actually know. I was read much more than that. I do know, as I pointed out before, that when they got to the part about the Congress, I said it would be entirely inappropriate for me to comment on that. If at there all. were other things that were incorrect, would you change them? If they were, if they incorrect, I wasn't. If, if there were statements in there that you felt were wrong, would you have changed them and notified them? Would you have notified them that there were errors in it? Uh, that's editing. I was not, but that's not what I was doing, sir. I was asked two questions. Was the tone of this letter sent from the White House to the FBI going to be inadvertently offensive to someone in the FBI? Because that's not what the letter was supposed to be about, and that wasn't the intent. Second of all, would the director be offended at receiving a letter from the counsel to the president, should it come from someone higher? And if the answer would have, if you felt that was the case, would you have helped change the letter? I would have answered those questions. Then you yes. edited it. That's a definition of editing. It doesn't mean that the then I to be would changed. have edited it. Not the, then I did. No, an editor doesn't necessarily make changes. An editor has the opportunity and the authority yes, to make changes. Yes, but one who okay. edits changes something. You, in effect, signed off in the letter. You sent a high-profile. You sent high-profile agents to, to visit Mr. I Sean signed Brady's off on one aspect of the letter. That I refused to comment on the aspects that related to the that's, Congress. That's correct. You well, that, that's correct. an important I, distinction, I think. But in effect... I assume the chairman would consider it very important if I signed off on the ports of it that addressed his conduct. By participating in the signing off in a letter, you in effect signed off on that portion, too, in spite No, of your I did not. I explicitly yes, and vehemently an made clear that know. I was not signing off on that. That is an absolutely... Uh, unfair allegation. Uh, well, uh, uh, people who are listening to this can make that uh, uh, I, I am confident how they'll make that. You, you also sent high-profile agents to mi in visit uh, Mr. Shalombrini's home, which you say was not intended. Did you also, by the way, um, have agents uh, uh, go through his house looking for the notes? Go through his house? Did they, did they look for notes in his office? They did not. They didn't look for any notes in his office? Oh, in the field office? Yes. Yes, they did. In the did field they, office file. Did they notify him that they were going through his files? Those aren't his files. Those are the FBI files. So you went, <laughs> do you notify people when you go through their files usually? Those are not his personal files. Perhaps you don't understand. Okay, in in me, each field office, when someone does an investigation, they send their records to, my answer is what my answer is. They send their records to be filed in the field office. Those are not their personal property. It's not what's in their desk. It's not what's in their drawer. Did you and, search the desk? No. There was no desk search, no files, Mr. No, Kelly? None that I'm aware of. Certainly Mr. no Kelly. one was asked to. 
Yes, his work area was searched, as far as I know. Is that standard operating First procedure? No, because I went to the file. I could not find any notes. I had him look at the file, and I said that they said, well, we'll check his work area. I said, thank you very much. Is, they that, checked, what, they is that what happened? Was he aware of that? Was he aware that the... I don't think so. I don't think he's on duty. I wasn't even aware of it. So is that a standard operating procedure when you... I can't find something in the file to go through people's desks without notifying them? We go through their work areas if we're work looking areas. for work-related material, yes. Without notifying them, you're doing that? Well, or if he had been in the office, we'd have notified him. We would have asked him to do it. Um, my main point, and I know my time is up, time. Is, is that this certainly appears political when combined with the other things, even if you say that isn't your intent. Uh, combined with all the other things, I, don't, I think it's hard to draw a conclusion otherwise. The gentleman's time has expired, and the chair would now recognize the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Gutnick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I want to ask a few questions to Mr. Kelly. First of all, Mr. Kelly, you, you were with the, uh, the FBI how long? 27 years. So you're, you're a longtime professional employee. Yes, sir. H how long have you served in your current capacity? 11 years. Did you know Mr. Scalabrini before uh, this, these recent events? No, sir. When you were, he, as I understand, he was assigned to the White House in 1980. Is that correct? I don't know. Well, that, that's what our files show. It also says that uh, he was a senior agent assigned to the White House. Historically, what kind of people would be assigned to that kind of a role? I don't know that I'm the expert on that subject. I know that they generally send senior agents over there, and he uh, is a 20-year veteran. <coughs> but you wouldn't, uh, I guess the point is you wouldn't send somebody over there who was a... Uh, who had, been, had a lot of problems or was a third tier. I mean, you would send your best people, right? Isn't that a pretty important assignment? If I was in charge of it, that's what I would do. But I don't know who the agents were that were over there. Do you know anything them. about how he was rated? I mean, what, what were his ratings uh, throughout the years as an I FBI agent? I have no idea, sir. Do you know why he was reassigned from the White House? Uh, I thought it was in connection because he had an accident, but I, I, I could be wrong about that. I don't know is the answer. It didn't have anything to do with the fact that he had been subpoenaed and testified in the Billy Dale case? If that was the case, I'm not aware of it. It was just coincidental as far as you know? I don't even know that it happened. Okay. Uh, a question, too. Uh, apparently, uh, Mr. Shapiro came to you when, and I'm not sure who first became aware that there was potentially incriminating information in this file. Is, is that exactly what happened? Did somebody come to you? How did you learn that, uh, that someone may have made some comments in, in the file that didn't square with it, what we had sworn testimony to? When did you learn that? Okay. Uh, the incriminating part threw me off. Uh, I learned of it around 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Monday the 15th when the unit chief in charge of the Civil Discovery Unit, who works for me and who is responsible for preparing the documents... And, and that is whom? Paul Signoli. Paul Signoli. He came right. to you and said what? He said, we're getting ready, we're getting these documents ready for the uh, committee. And they come out of Mr. Livingston's file, and he said, the analyst who was looking at it pointed this out to me. And he handed me the first page of the report. And why was the analyst looking at the file? He was preparing it to take out information where people had uh, specifically requested confidentiality. <laughs> so he was going through it page by page, and he came across this insert. And... The analyst is one who reads the newspapers and who recognized that this statement, thank you, recognized that this statement uh, had been uh, denied publicly by, the, by people like the First Lady. So he saw the conflict there and he put it in front of me. Signoli did. I read it. I personally had heard the First Lady deny this particular statement, so I brought it to Mr. Shapiro's attention within the next half hour. I was having a meeting at the time, so the time slipped a little bit. And why did you bring it to Mr. Shapiro's attention? For the same reason, because it's an FBI file in which there's recorded information, which is with, at odds with what I had heard publicly, which that alone suggests to us that we may have a FBI issue as opposed to the credibility of the parties concerned. That is, are we accurately reporting the information we're getting? Did you think it was a good idea to take that information to the White House? Well, Mr. Shapiro asked me, or didn't ask me, he said to me, I'm going to send this up to the White House. Uh, we had been dealing with the White House and the committee on issues relating to documents. Uh, I'm like Mr. Shapiro. If I had thought about it a little bit longer, perhaps I would have reached a different conclusion than the one I ultimately reached, which is that it was okay. So you advised uh, him that it was okay to give the information? I did not interject any, uh, I didn't object to it. 
You did not object. That's Silence right. gives consent. Exactly. So you gave your consent that the information should go to the White House. What about the, uh, the transcript of the book? Did you uh, recommend that that go to the White House? I have never even seen the transcript of the book. Were you aware of it? I knew it was in the House being reviewed. Did you know that it went to the White House? I did not. Okay. Um, just one last question, and, and, and uh, you have been involved in other criminal investigations. Um, it, it just strikes us all as rather odd that here you have information that tends to suggest that potentially someone may have perjured themselves, and yet that information was given to an individual who was, in fact, I think within the next day or two be, being called before a grand jury. I mean, if you compared that to almost any other circumstance, wouldn't you think that that was awfully odd for the FBI to notify someone that there may be potentially criminal, uh, criminally, uh, there may be some information in their file which could cause them some criminal problems relative to perjury? Well, uh, to share that with that individual, don't you think that's a bit bizarre? Well, I thought the information was publicly known that there was this divergence of opinion because Scalambrini's, some of Scalambrini's statements had been contrary to this particular version of, of events as well. That's number one. Number two, I did not know there was a grand jury investigation underway. I knew the independent counsel was conducting an investigation, but I thought it was limited to the issue of how the FBI or why the FBI was providing files to the White House. I did not understand the parameters of their investigation. I, I certainly did not know there was a grand jury being paneled. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognized the gentleman from Illinois. Mr. Flanagan. Thank you, Chairman. I, uh, I have attended all of these hearings, and I continue to remark <clears throat> that if this were written in a novel, no one would believe it. Uh, today, we have all kinds of folks, some of the smartest people alive, you know, and they've made colossal blunders, I think was the correct quote. And today is salted in with, a, with a, a special agent who was hit by a propeller blade from a plane. Uh, it's, it, it continues to get curiouser and curiouser, but not, not in a, you know, in a, in, a, in a nefarious sort of way, just in an unbelievable way. It just gets stranger every day. Um, and some of the smartest people alive continue to make mistakes that fill gaps that cover nicely. Uh, I, I remain deeply incredulous of, of the entire panoply of testimony we received from the beginning to the end because it all builds upon each other and, there, and, and where you, you come to a point where you may actually have something, you, you have a person who cannot remember or someone who at least has a plausible excuse for being unable to remember. We have contemporaneous notes taken on particular pieces of information that are currently, now, refuted and disregarded. Um, and we have some of the best trained people alive who make mistake after mistake and, and are very good at standing up and, and beating their breast and doing a mea culpa, but uh, continually and endlessly, inexcusably, uh, filling the void of information on this with, well, we screwed this up, or, or we can't remember this, or we can't remember that. And it all comes back down to the same place, is that we have some folks at the White House who went through some files they shouldn't have, had some files they shouldn't have had, and that really is the base question we're at here. And I think today's testimony, today's questioning, today's depositions, today's sworn to statements, um, are, are uh, an interesting diversion from the base question, but I don't know how it gets us any closer to finding out how those files got over there and who had anything to do with them and whatnot. I think the, the behavior by Mr. Shapiro in, in trying to appear to be fair and clean and honest is reprehensible. I'm sorry, that's what I think. Uh, I, I think it goes beyond a mere mistake. I think it's, it's appalling. Uh, but that's that. It, what's done is done, let's move on. Uh, I have no questions for this panel, Mr. Chairman, and, and I will yield to, uh, I was going to yield to Mr. Horn, who's not here, so I will yield to the chair if he chooses to use the balance of my time. Well, I thank you very much uh, for yielding uh, the time to me. Uh, <clears throat> we have been involved, Mr. Shapiro, in attempting to receive documents from the White House over a long period of time, some of which have been claimed for executive privilege. Uh, when we did get them, they were severely redacted. In other words, we've now been arguing about those redactions and whether they were appropriate or not. My question to you is, in view of the fact that you were interested in letting the White House know that there were 
things involving their procedures that were very delicate, very sensitive, and so forth that might be spread upon, spread apart to the world with the publication of this book. But there were other uh, allegations in that book that were, uh, you know, suggested that there was wrongdoing had, had been engaged in by individuals in the White House. Uh, it strikes me as very odd that you would not have undertaken what the White House Counsel's Office has taken in responding to us, and that is to redact those elements that would alert or potentially alert the White House uh, to the fact that there might be uh, some, uh, some involvement, and indeed that the FBI might ultimately be involved in investigating those allegations. Didn't it occur to you that you perhaps would have redacted that manuscript before you sent it to them? Uh, Mr. Klinger, I was not then and I am not now uh, aware of uh, any sort of new allegations of criminal conduct in that book. Um, uh, none were brought to my attention. I never sat and read it from beginning to end. Portions were brought to my attention. None of those were. Uh, I take your suggestion. It, it, it might have been a better practice to have done that. Of course, you're comparing what I did here with what the White House does in supplying documents to you. I don't believe the documents you've received from the FBI have been heavily redacted. Uh, no, I, but I'm suggesting that in the event where you actually might be involved in a continuing investigation of a criminal nature, that it might be wise to redact those elements if you're dealing with the potential uh, criminal activity. I agree entirely with the premise of that. I'm not aware that this book made okay. allegations of criminal misconduct. It makes all sorts of allegations about all sorts of people's behavior, um, and th those that have been brought to my attention don't relate to criminal behavior. Let me ask you this. Uh, in the earlier testimony, you indicated that, uh, you know, everybody had disputed uh, Agent Scalambrini's uh, recollection of this, that, uh, that all of the, the parties had, in fact, uh, disclaimed any knowledge of it. Isn't it true that the, the, the only individuals who have a contrary view from Mr. Scalabrini, in other words, state that he is in error, were the First Lady and Mr. Nussbaum and possibly Mr. Livingstone. And I'm, and I'm told through press accounts, Mrs. Livingstone, his mother. Oh, uh, right, and, that she did not know the First Lady. And right. I, Bill Kennedy to some extent, although mm -hmm. that's, a, that's sort of related, him saying he didn't do it. But yes, the, but those are the only people involved, as I understand, sir. I don't know who else would know. Okay, we will now recognize the gentleman from um, Ohio, Mr. LaTourette, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to the uh, panel, I want to thank you for your patience today, and if I seem happy to be asking questions, it's only because when you get to this part of the dais, uh, you have to have a lot of patience, and our friends on the other side of the aisle, they, I think they send uh, messages through their, uh, their cloakroom that the guy with the beard from Ohio is about to ask questions, so they bring some members back to do the committee wrap-up hearing, and, uh, and uh, it sort of makes you feel like a fifth wheel on a four-wheel wagon. I, uh, I want to praise uh, Chairman Klinger for having this hearing. Every one of these hearings that we've had is, has been instructive, and we've sort of built a, a case uh, of, from where we started with Travelgate, the unnecessary and cruel firing of seven longtime federal employees, through today, and, and Mr. Shapiro, if I can chat with you for just a minute, I, what, what's always concerned me, regardless of whether or not you made a mistake or not, is this, this chart that uh, was shown earlier in the hearing, this sort of starburst effect that you had no control over, but when you made that, that phone call to the White House, this is what happened, whether you intended it to or not. Uh, and, and what bothers me about it is this, that this entire set of hearings has been about uh, the fact that uh, we have been told that these FS-86s or whatever they're called, these uh, personnel background sheets, contain the most personal information there is about a person, whether you're HIV positive, whether you've had an extramarital affair, whether you have a problem with drugs or alcohol, uh, whether you've been fired from a job. Uh, all your darkest, deepest secrets can be included, including rumors and some untruths. Uh, and so when a, a starburst like this has a potential, that that's really what's always bothered me about this case. Could I, I address just, that very briefly, well, sir? If you could, because I only have five I'll minutes. I'll be very quick. Could, sure. Uh, uh, there was no personal information conveyed to the White House. No, no, no. I'm, I'm not talking about you. I'm, I'm, okay, I, but again, I mean with that no, 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 no. What, what's bothered me about this Filegate mess, as it's been called, is that 
the potential for a starburst like occurred when you passed your information on. That wasn't personal information. But all of these 400, 600, 700 files in their summaries contained, I believe Mr. Livingstone said, what the, what the FBI and the White House Counsel's Office is most concerned about is the derogatory stuff. Why would this person be a potential embarrassment to the administration if we hired him or her? Yes, sir. And, and so the, the worst of the worst is yes, what's sir. sent over to the White House. Absolutely. And, and, and if this starburst can occur in, in your phone call, it could have occurred in, in any one of those 700 contacts where files were requested of, of Ms. Larson to be sent over to the, the White House. And everybody's agreed that there was no business uh, to request these 700. That's what's always been the, the bottom line. And what we're told is we should, we should trust the guy, Mr. Livingstone, who, whose best reference on his resume was that he orchestrated Chicken George sightings during the 1992 president. Well, that makes me nervous. And if I was one of the 700 people whose files had been disclosed to the White House, that would make me very nervous as well. That, that, that truly is, is what's of concern. The question I have to you is that uh, you wrote a report, uh, you're the author of the report of 61496, uh, yes, and, and it's a fine report, and people have said nice things about you, and I'll say that that's a, that's a swell report you wrote, and I think you did a good job. Um, if you could follow, uh, I'm not as swift a lawyer as you appear to be, and so if you could just follow a hypothetical with me. Uh, it's my understanding that at the White House, prior to this administration, a woman by the name of Jane Danahauer uh, ran the White House Personnel Security Office, in effect, or, or was in charge of ordering and receiving the files. She struck me when she testified a lot like Ms. Larson, a career professional, someone that knew how to do their job, someone that was ethical, someone that simply processed documents because th they needed to know what was in them. Let's say, however, that Mrs. Dannenhauer was replaced with not another fine person like Mrs. Larson or Mrs. Dannenhauer, but with a political operative who, again, has made a, a career out of being political. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. And they decide that either because they receive directions from above or because they're incompetent and goofy or because an administration is having trouble uh, getting their, their mid-level employees cleared by the FBI because they have some questionable lifestyle uh, activities, drugs and alcohol and things like that. And so they say, hey, I have an idea. Let's look at the Reagan and Bush people to see if maybe we're being uh, uh, sort of uh, given uh, the short shrift by the FBI or, or any, any number of things. Uh, and they begin to request stuff that they're just not supposed to have. What safeguard was there at the FBI? We asked the White House counsel this. What safeguard was there at the FBI that would have prevented these folks whether they're stupid or malicious, from getting files that they were not supposed to have. And you're asking me then as then. opposed to now. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, absolutely yes. none, as far as I can tell. Okay. And, and as you know, I criticized the absence of that quite severely in my report. Okay. And, 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 I, and that's right. And that's why one of the things that I thought was good about your, your June the 14th report. Is it my understanding now that you believe, I mean, anybody can get around anything, but the changes that you recommended to the Attorney General and others that you believe that this situation cannot occur again? Yes, or is extraordinarily unlikely to occur without someone taking heroic efforts. As you say, anyone can get around anything. Okay. Mr. Thornton, if I could turn to you for just a second. Were you advised uh, or alerted to any difficulties with Mr. Livingstone's potential employment in this sensitive position in the White House? Uh, no, sir, I was not. Were you ever, uh, and one of the, the weaknesses that I think Mr. Shapiro points out in his June the 14th report, he doesn't criticize Ms. Larson, but he criticizes those who apparently supervised, were in a supervisory position uh, to Ms. Larson for, for not, uh, it wasn't Ms. Larson's job to figure out whether or not these folks had left the White House. Uh, that was for someone else to flag. Would, would that have been you? Uh, at the time, I did not realize that it should have been, but in retrospect, looking back on it, uh, Yes, I should have reviewed the procedures in place at the time more carefully and anticipated that something like uh, the release of the files um, that occurred might occur and ensure that there were procedures in place to prevent that. Right. The, the FBI had, had done a background check on Mr. Livingstone, had they not? I have no knowledge of that. Yes, sir. Okay, so, so someone at the FBI would have had the information uh, that, that may or may not have raised a flag as to his, his uh, suitability for that employment? Well, uh, sure. I mean, we do not make evaluations. We just set forth the facts and send them. But someone obviously conducted that investigation. Whether, whether or not they knew what position he was getting is a separate question. That is the investigation that we're talking about here, that this information came out of. And what we do is we conduct an investigation for the client. In this case, the client was the White House. 
They make the evaluation. Right, but, but, but in this case, if I could just beg the chair's indulgence, in this case, the, the client held all the cards, because they could ask for any file they wanted from you fellas and, and ladies back before you, you made these changes, and, and you would have handed it over, no questions asked. I, I think that's essentially correct. That's pretty sad, and thank you for your honesty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Gentleman, time has expired. I'm going to recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin. Before I do, I would ask unanimous consent that about, on the conclusion of Mr. Barrett's questioning that the time for the questioning of this panel would be concluded in 20 minutes thereafter to be divided equally between myself and the ranking minority member. Without objection, so ordered. And the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Shapiro, just a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Um, it's my understanding that former FBI agent Harlow uh, was convicted last year of falsifying at least 50 interviews that he claimed to have conducted. Is that correct? that I don't know exactly what his conviction was for. He was convicted of criminal offenses and he did admit to fabricating uh, somewhere around 50 uh, of those interviews. I just don't know whether in the ultimate plea bargain that was something he pled guilty to. Can you explain to me why the FBI began investigating, investigating him and his interviews? I believe, to the best of my recollection, uh, there were maybe a number, that... Uh, Information came to light to us from a source that uh, that they had never, sort of by happenstance, that they had never been questioned in the course of a background. Um, someone was talking to them about something else, I think, or, or whatever, and asked them, hadn't they previously provided information to the FBI? And they said they had never been questioned. And when we started looking at that, we saw that Agent Harlow had written a report of an interview of that person as if they had been questioned. Uh, it turned out that they that it was a complete fabrication. So he had not actually interviewed that. Per it wasn't a case of him interviewing a person and then changing it. He had simply not even interviewed it. He completely fabricated it of of, a, of an interview he had never conducted. And when we started looking further into that, you know, we found not me personally, but obviously the <laughs> agents investigating this found numerous incidents where he had simply fabricated reports, and he ultimately admitted that. They okay. simply took his investigative reports and went out and interviewed the people who allegedly had been interviewed and determined that about 50 of them had never been contacted by him, despite the fact that there were interviews in the reports. So it was when you, when you went back to these people when you realized that there was a problem. All right. Did, did that play any role in, in the decision um, to interview Agent Scalambrini? Sure. Yes. Maybe you can elaborate on that. Let me do it. Uh, because I'm the guy that recommended it. Fine. Mr. Kelly, let's hear what you have to say. Um, between the time, the, uh, first seeing it on Monday evening and Tuesday morning, I was driving to work, I was thinking to myself, this could be as much of an issue for the FBI as it is for the parties who are quoted in this document. That is, if it is incorrect, if it was fabricated, if it was attributed to the wrong person, any of those things would be very bad for the FBI. Therefore, I thought it appropriate to ask Mr. Scalabrini what he recalled about it and whether or not he had any documentation uh, to corroborate it in the form of notes, for example. Mm -hmm. So I asked Duncan Wainwright, who was an agent who had worked on this report for Mr. Shapiro, to contact Mr. Scalabrini and ask him those questions. My concern was for the FBI's processes at the time. And, and that concern for both of us was informed by our knowledge of uh, the Harlow conviction. Not, that, that, not to suggest that Agent Scalambrini was at all responsible for Agent Harlow's conduct, but that was another agent who had been assigned to the White House, and it would make it more, you know, this was a concern for the FBI. Well, and you'll have to excuse me for not having been here throughout the entire hearing. There's a lot of other things going on. I understand. <laughs> if, if you could tell me, when, when you said you just decided to discuss with, with Mr. Um, Scalambrini, did he have notes, or what, what did he have to document his statement? He did not have any notes. He said that his practice was to prepare notes, keep them for a few days, and once the report was finalized and accepted, to destroy them. That's what he told the agents I sent out to interview him. And after, after your discussions with the agents, what did you conclude? Uh, I concluded that we had a matter here that could not be resolved as easily as I'd hoped, because he didn't recall conducting the Nussbaum interview at all, and he had no notes to corroborate it. So what did you do at that stage? I asked my people to put that into an FD-302, a written report of interview, uh, which was submitted to me the next day, which was ultimately given to the independent counsel. 
And, but can I say yes. uh, that one thing is, I think it's important to note that we did not do was advise the White House of that. Mm -hmm. uh, to this date, until our testimony, we never advised the White House. In fact, the first person we advised of that uh, was staff for this committee uh, and uh, subsequently sent a copy of that report to the independent counsel. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, we will now proceed on the closing uh, questions, and I'll recognize myself for three minutes. Uh, there have been obviously efforts made here to sort of tar Mr. Scalambrini with uh, the brush of, a, of another agent who, in fact, uh, has been fit, found guilty of wrongdoing. Uh, did you, Mr. Kelly or Mr. Shapiro, have any doubts about other background investigations that Mr. Scalambrini had conducted? Was he questioned about other files or was the, the uh, subject of the interrogation limited to this particular background file because of the discrepancies of other witnesses? It was limited to this particular interview. Mm -hmm. So you had no reason to question whether Mr. Scalambrini was a bad apple or a uh, a rogue agent. No, sir. Thank you. And Mr. Shapiro, you noted that people at the White House disputed what Mr. Scalabrini's notes said, but are you aware uh, that Mr. Nussbaum uh, has disputed the accounts of a number of individuals who have testified under oath to statements he has made and actions he has taken? Are you aware that there have been people who have, who oh. have uh, disagreed or taken exception to Mr. Nussbaum's recollection? Uh, I was advised of that by your counsel during my deposition. Okay. Mr. Kelly, are you aware of those yes, kinds of discrepancy? Are you aware, for example, that Mr. Nussbaum disputed accounts provided by one of his associates, Steve Newworth, the person he had brought to the counsel's office himself, that he had disputed an account by Mr. Newworth? I, I was not aware of that, sir. Uh, were you aware that Mr. Newworth made statements about the First Lady and Susan Thomas's being concerned about unfettered access to Mr. Foster's office uh, about his death and that Mr. Nussbaum denied those statements of his own to his own associate? Uh, I was aware that Mr. Newworth had made those uh, statements in, in a and that, hearing. Right. Yes, sir. I was not aware that Mr. Nussbaum had denied it. Are you aware that Mr. Nussbaum had disputed accounts of conversations that former Deputy Attorney General Phil Hyman uh, testified to under oath in which Mr. Hyman said he had a heated conversation with Mr. Nussbaum saying, are you hiding something, Bernie? Uh, when Mr. Nussbaum changed the agreement on reviewing Foster's documents and that, in fact, Mr. Nuss, uh, Mr. Uh, Nussbaum denied that that conversation. I think place. it is safe to say I was at least generally aware that there was a dispute between Mr. Hyman and Mr. Nussbaum, yes. Yeah, that was reported in the press. And are you aware that Mr. Nussbaum claimed to have shown the Vince Foster Travel Office notebook to everyone in the room on the day that Foster's office was reviewed and, and they were going through it, and that none of those individuals uh, that we have been able to discover have, uh, have can, can validate that they saw that uh, travel office memo at the time? Uh, I didn't follow it closely enough to know that, sir. And are you aware that Mr. Michael Shaheen of OPR stating that the White House Counsel's Office under Mr. Nussbaum declined to provide requested notes, failed to mention the existence of any handwritten notes by Mr. Foster in the travel office despite their request for such records? Uh, now that you mention it, I believe I was aware of a press account of Mr. Shaheen saying that, yes. And are you aware of Mr. Shaheen testifying that the Counsel's Office under Mr. Nussbaum engaged in an unprecedented <laughs> lack of cooperation and candor? Uh, I, I don't recall that specific uh, statement, but I do recall right. that Mr. Shaheen was critical of Mr. Nussbaum. Well, what I've t been somewhat offended by here is the suggestion that it's taken for granted that Mr. Nussbaum is, is uh, to be, to ta his veracity is not to be questioned, that, uh, that uh, it, it clearly had to be something in the FBI, something that uh, Mr. Scalambrini slipped a cog somehow, and that uh, somehow Mr. Nussbaum was not to be challenged or questioned, and I, don't, I think that the, the record that we've spelled out here in these questions would suggest that Mr. Nussbaum indeed should be questioned on these. I, I, I would just like to say that's a fair comment, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't think we took for granted what Mr. Nussbaum said. We knew that it wasn't just, of course, Mr. Nussbaum who denied it. Uh, we knew that there was this dispute, and as Mr. Kelly said, that this dispute could become an issue for the FBI, not just for everyone else. Um, I, surely, uh, it would not have been a good idea for me to have gone out and questioned Mr. Nussbaum about this. Uh, my three minutes have expired, and I would uh, turn to 
Mrs. Collins to use such of her time as she might desire. How much time would you yield yourself? Three, three minutes, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Sh Mr. Shapiro. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think you were asked earlier whether or not uh, you thought the firewalls between the, the statement was made that there were firewalls between the White House and the FBI that may have been breached. Do you think the firewalls between the White House and the FBI have been breached? Well, I certainly think the firewalls between the FBI and the White House were breached in the provision of the 400 plus files. Uh, and we've erected new higher walls to avoid that. Um, do I believe the firewalls were breached in terms of my dissemination? Yes. No, ma'am. Uh, I communicated to them information that was already very public. Do I? That's a separate question from whether I believe in retrospect it was a good idea. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that the questions that the committee has asked you today have allowed, have given you the opportunity to uh, fully explain all that happened regarding uh, the FBI and the, uh, the files? Those who allowed me to answer their questions, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Exhaustively. Exhaustively, yes. I'm sure the, four, the whole panel feels that very same way about it. I have introduced legislation, and the number is H.R. Um, 3785, which uh, pretty much um, codifies what you have done. And one of the things that it does is to um, um, it does four things. First, it uh, it was sent back to the FBI the security records of individuals, no longer the White House. That's number one. Secondly, it would require the written permission of the individual whose record is requested from the FBI before the FBI could send that information to the White House. Now, this requirement uh, could only be waived under extraordinary circumstances at the written request of the highest officials. And thirdly, the bill would extend the criminal sanctions of the Privacy Act to the misuse of these records. And finally, it would require the Secret Service to develop accurate lists of individuals in need of access to the White House. Now, I'm wondering whether you think it would make sense to enact this type of legislation, Mr. Shapiro. Well, I'd obviously want to study it a little more carefully, but each of the points you've mentioned are points that I think are important and that uh, I personally, but more importantly, the FBI institutionally support. Again, my only hesitation uh, about legislation is it in an area like this between uh, and among the executive branches, it makes it a little harder subsequently if, uh, if uh, events evolve and facts change to, to make fine-tuning adjustments to it. Uh, but as to the principles you've announced, uh, that I, I support them wholeheartedly and without reservation. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, how much is, is the clock working on three minutes? I didn't yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure whether the clock was still on five minutes or three minutes. Let me say this, that uh, as you say, you've been here exhaustively, and um, I, I, just, I just want to commend you, first of all, for having uh, sat here through all of this. You've certainly been very clear about the things that you have done about the fact that uh, there, there isn't any smoking gun, as far as I can see. There's been no cover-up, as far as I can see. There's not been any political motive, as far as I can see. So I think that um, what we're doing right now is trying to figure out who, uh, who killed Cock Robin. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mrs. Collins. Uh, you yielded not, you yielded to your three minutes. I reserve my time, time, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, I now recognize uh, down from Connecticut uh, for four minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Shapiro. Mr. Scalabrini does not uh, back off anything that he said in his report. Is that true? He doesn't say one way or the other. He has no recollection did, of it. Did he back off from his statement on the report? Does he stand by his report? I don't understand what that means, sir. He does not recall that interview. He does not say it's false. He, okay. he does not recall the interview. Did he back off his report is the question. Does and, he deny and I'm sorry the report? I don't understand other than the way I've answered it. See, I'm going to use my four minutes. The only question I asked you was, did he back off his report? I, it's I, a simple question. The answer is either yes or no. Well, I, I, I'm sorry. What does that mean? Did he back off the report? He said, I have no recollection of it. Okay. Is that backing off? If it is, yes. Did, if did, it's not, did, no. did, did he write the report? He does not recall writing the report, to the best of my recollection, but believes this is in the format. Is the FBI suggesting he did not re write the report? No. Thank you. But that's not the question you asked me. Uh, that's just what I asked. 
Now, uh, I'd like to know if anyone in the White House asked you to interview Mr. Scalabrini or anyone on behalf of the White House? No. Did no. anyone in the White House ask you to verify his report or anyone on behalf of the White House ask you to verify his report? No. Okay. Did, um, no, nor did we give them the results of the interview. Pardon me? Nor did we advise them of the results of okay. the interview. When they read to you the letter, what were your two choices? What were my two choices? Yes, when they read you the letter. They gave the, you two options. Two, That's two questions. One, was it uh, sufficient, would it be considered sufficient if this letter came from the counsel to the president? To which I what say. What were your two choices in terms of, the, of what was worded in the letter? Well, I need to uh, look at it, if you don't mind, yeah. if we have it. In the. fourth paragraph, if I'm remembering correctly, in the first sentence, as it presently reads, reads the implication that the FBI background investigation might include a false report. Uh, the other formulation of that I was advised of was that an FBI background investigation might have been falsified. So they were suggesting to you that this, that the report that Mr. Scalabrini did was falsified. And I objected to that. You objected to the fact that it was, why would they going to ask you whether it had been falsified? If they didn't, why would they have asked you that? I don't believe they were asking me whether it was falsified. What I understood them to do was, was to be checking the tone of the letter and seeing whether some part of it would be inadvertently offensive to the FBI. I said accusing an agent of falsification in the absence of evidence would in fact be offensive uh, to the FBI. In terms of the um, fact that you gave the Aldridge book four months uh, before the general public saw this book, uh, and you said it was in the, uh, it, the White House had an interest, did you ask the White House to do anything? No, sir. Then what was the purpose of giving it to the White House? I believe I've answered that before. I'm happy to do so again. The purpose was for, for them to do as they saw fit with the uh, information in there that disclosed uh, all sorts of sensitive internal White House procedures. And what would you suggest that they saw fit? What were their options? Well, for instance, it made reference to uh, the phone systems of the White House and how, how one might go about penetrating them from the outside. I thought that was something uh, that if in fact the book came out, they might be prepared to address so that their phone systems not be easily penetrated. When uh, you gave them the book uh, and they con Mr. Quinn contacted you, uh, would you relay that conversation again? What was the bottom line to that conversation? He called me two days later after I gave him the book on February 23rd and said to me, um, and I thought I had my notes of it somewhere, which is what I'm looking for. Well, since for. my time is running out, I'll, I'll withdraw that question. And uh, the, the question I would then ask you is, uh, is it your practice to, uh, did you give the book to anyone else? Did the FBI give this uh, book Outside to of the FBI? Outside of the FBI. No, sir. Is it your practice when people give you, give you books like this that you uh, would disseminate it to the people who it's written about? I've never seen a book like this, sir. Okay. But the FBI has never written a book? No, the FBI, is, an agent assigned to the White House has never okay. written a book divulging all sorts of inside sensitive information about the White House. And I'm not aware of an agent assigned to another post divulging all so sorts of sensitive information. So now I've read the book, and your point is that every, in, in that book there is sensitive information divulging how you can crack? We've read the book after Mr. Aldrich did remove a number of things we objected to in the intervening four-month period. It's your testimony that he w did withdraw it? Did withdraw what? Did with uh, did not print certain things? Oh yes. That well, th well, then why would you have had to show it to the White House if you were? I, because wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Sorry, why sir. would you have had to show it to the White House until you and Mr. Allwood had agreed to what you were going to print? Well, why we, did, would you we never agreed. Why would you show him certain things that were not yet going to be printed? We never agreed to what he would print. I, I showed it to them because, as I predicted to them, as it turned out presciently, he might go ahead and publish it before he received approval and clearance from us. As it turned out, he made some changes we asked him to make and then went ahead to publish it before he received clearance and approval from us. That's exactly why I showed him. In fact, I said to them explicitly, I cannot assure you that despite the fact that he's purporting to act in good faith here with our procedures, that he won't go out and publish it tomorrow. I have no way to stop him from doing that. And in fact, ultimately, though he did make some changes we recommended, that's exactly what he did, sir. Thank you. Time has expired. I recognize the gentleman from California, uh, Mr. Horn, for three, four, five, six.
six, seven, two minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Thornton, let me ask you a question. Yes. Uh, Mrs. Larson reports to you when you were in that role at the FBI. Was that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Any time, either with Ms. Larson or other employees, where someone came to you and said, you know, I think we've got a problem over there in the uh, White House Security Office. Uh, Mr. Livingstone is acting this way or that. Did you ever get any information from any member of the FBI or anybody in a reporting line to you about Mr. Livingstone? Uh, not that I can recall. I say no, sir. I did not. Uh, you've heard a lot of this hearing. Uh, do you have any recommendations you'd make, having been in the role where you knew what files were going and coming, uh, that ought to take place? Are you talking about the changes in the procedure that yes. are being recommended? Yes. Uh, you agree with those? I, I agree wholeheartedly with those, yes, okay. sir. Okay. Don't have anything to really add to it? No, sir. Okay. Let me ask you, Mr. Shapiro. You've yes, testified sir. you knew Mr. Aldrich addressed at great length in his book the problems with the White House officials in the Clinton administration getting background checks uh, and failing to get them. Isn't that correct? I don't believe I testified to that, but I believe it's correct. That, yeah. That and then the GAO study confirmed that, and I believe you're aware of that study, aren't you? I was aware of it not at the time uh, that I reviewed the Aldrich book, but I was aware of it at the time I wrote my report. Yes, sir. Yeah. They noted that 190 White House employees took over 100 days to fill out their SF-86s, and 36 took over 300 days. Are you aware that the GAO study also shows that most people didn't get their permanent passes until 1994? I don't remember the exact facts, but that's consistent with my general recollection of it, sir, yes. Yeah. When you received Mr. Aldrich's book, did anybody look into these problems, because they're mentioned in his book, to see if there were any ongoing problems that the FBI ought to know about? Well, among the people we gave the book to was our people handing the background checks and the internal uh, the reviews of the White House. Uh, I, and I don't know exactly what they did, but it was brought to their attention. I discussed it at the highest levels of that division of the FBI that these were issues now. And was there follow-up? I don't know exactly, sir. Okay. Where, who did you discuss it with at the highest level that might well, Tom, have Tom Coyle, who's the assistant director of the personnel division and, and okay. is overall in charge of that process. Okay. Were any of the issues raised in Mr. Aldrich's book regarding a lax approach to passes investigated by the FBI? And I take it they didn't to your knowledge or what uh, not to my knowledge no sir have you heard of any investigation that someone else might have done I knew there was at one point a congressional inquiry into it. right now why are you investigating allegations by the White House but not those of your own agents that are supported by a GAO report in other words shouldn't we be looking at the role of those files going back and forth with the White House do you feel the, uh, that's just one question, do you feel the new procedures will assure that we can catch something like this in the future? Let me, that's a somewhat complicated question, sir, and I'll answer as quickly as I can because I know everyone's sensitive about time. The new procedures, I believe, will address a large part of this, but not, they will not address the internal White House problem of how quickly they get themselves cleared. That's not a matter, I believe, within FBI jurisdiction. That's not a criminal issue. That's not something that we could investigate as the FBI. We can investigate ourselves all the time, and we do. And we take any allegation about an FBI agent very seriously. I could not, and it would be wrong for me to suggest that I could dispatch FBI agents to look into the, how the White House handles their own internal security. That's a matter between the White House and, to some extent, the Secret Service. It's not at all a matter unless it becomes criminal uh, for the FBI. And so. That was not something we would have sent agents into. Did the Secret Service ever express concern to the FBI about the slowness and really nonchalance of ever getting security clearances by a good part of the White House staff? Uh, I'm not aware of any such communication on any formal le level. Uh, I'm not even really aware of any informal level, except, again, in the, Mr. Aldrich's book where he relates some conversations. Gentleman's time has Thanks. expired. The gentlelady from Illinois. Chairman, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Uh, Mr. Shapiro, uh, getting back to the Aldrich book, is there anything in that book that after review the FBI would have required him to take out? There were a number of things we required he took out, which he did took out, there, take out. There were a number of other matters still pending that we had objected to that he published without taking out. I believe there were six 
uh, somewhat lengthy passages that we had standing objections to from the beginning through the date of his publication that we never consented to their being published. Mm -hmm. You felt those were extremely sensitive or what? Uh, I don't recall the exact ones, but we, we felt that those were ones we could not compromise on, either because uh, they related to uh, the internal security of the White House or directly to the conduct of FBI operations and thus were uh, information learned directly from an official investigation and therefore not something that should be subsequently disseminated publicly. Well, since he went and put those in the book anyway, is there is the FBI considering any kind of recourse against Mr. Aldrich? Yes, we are, Mr. Collins. We have uh, recommended to the Department of Justice that if sustainable, and they are reviewing that, that a uh, civil suit be brought uh, for non-compliance with the pre-publication review process. We've done that last year with another retired agent, uh, and the nature of that suit is a breach of contract suit. Uh, it seeks to uh, recover and disgorge profits from violating the, uh, the pre-publication agreement. It's really the only recourse we have. He is, a, he is, of course, a retired agent. I see. It, it is a basis. It, I'm sorry. I was just noted that that pre-publication agreement is part of the employment agreement for all FBI personnel. That was going to be my next question. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Your gentlelady yields back the balance of her time. Yes, I do. And I would now recognize the gentleman from Illinois for one minute. Gentlemen, I had not intended to ask a question today, but Mr. Barrett and his questioning leads me to just one. Uh, what faith and confidence do you repose in the information in your own files now? Uh, you know, the, the, the criminal prosecution that was I'm there. I'm sorry, before. I can't hear you. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I've been told I'm fairly soft spoken. What faith and confidence do you repose in the information included in your own files now? Uh, the, the specter of Mr. Scalabrini's uh, contemporaneous information included in the file, now being suspect because it's denied by everyone and their brother having anything to do with this, and everyone and their wife, at least, having something to do with this, uh, and their mother. And Mr. Barrett now says that there are some, uh, uh, there's a criminal prosecution of some other who created information in the file. What faith and confidence do you repose in the information in your files now? Well, I think, and I, I honestly believe that's the question he was asking in the end. Well, I think the answer to that is we have 10,000 FBI agents out there working day in and day out to conduct first-rate criminal investigations. Every once in a while, in my years, I've seen maybe five instances in which an FBI agent has been accused of this kind of conduct. And when we see it, we prosecute it. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened in this case. Did you prosecute all five of those? I can't tell you that because it goes, it goes so far back I can't remember them all. Uh -huh. But we have certainly fired them when we could okay. and prosecuted the ones we could as well. I don't think anyone suggests that they would be perfect. Uh, but I, let me ask you one more, and with the esteemed panel of attorneys in front of me, you'd know this. If Mr. Scalabrini were not with us today, if he had passed on, would not his, note, his contemporaneous notes be taken as near gospel? Uh, the, the, we have never challenged Mr. Scalabrini's I understand that. I understand you haven't, but others have. And I'm asking you, but, would they not be taken as gospel? Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not sure exactly. The, if, if the question is uh, because of his death, now, if he had passed on and was unable to be interviewed because of his current uh, affliction and his inability to remember and other things that are with that, if he had just passed on, just assuming, broadly, hypothetically, if he had passed on and these notes were in his files, would they not be taken as factually uh, true? No, I don't believe no. so. I don't believe this is a reference to the dying declaration rule of evidence. No, uh, no, I'm, the, not in, I'm not talking about dying declaration. I'm talking about contemporaneous recitation. We, we try and generally take... Uh, and I think that experience suggests this is the appropriate approach. We generally uh, have a great deal of confidence in what's FCI files. Mm -hmm. it, but even had Mr. Scalabrini been uh, deceased, uh, if we had a case where everybody else involved in it denied it, we'd still have the same questions. Okay. Can, can you point to any example of that ever happening anyplace else? Where an agent's right. Where everyone denied what questions? an agent wrote and you believed everybody else but not the agent. We didn't say we didn't believe the agent. I didn't suggest that you did, but you said you, this would happen should that happen. We, we would have that question. Uh, there are other cases, including in, uh, in criminal matters, where one has questioned 
uh, whether an agent got it right in a particular case, this committee or a subcommittee of this committee raised some of those questions and we took them very seriously in connection with the Ruby Ridge investigation mm -hmm. as to whether a couple of those FBI 302s maybe reported information that wasn't completely accurate. We've looked into that. We took that very seriously. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's just did, one of them. Did you thing. find that that information Time wasn't accurate? Time is uh, expired. I believe that there, as in here, we were left with a he said, she said, and no way to ultimately resolve it. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair would recognize the gentlelady from Illinois for any closing statements. She may oh, wish to make. yes, I have a closing statement. Mr. Chairman, today's hearing has proved to be yet another detour from our investigation of why the FBI files of former administration employees were requested by the White House and whether they were improperly disseminated. To the extent that testimony was received on that issue, as I said before, we might as well have spent the last six hours trying to ascertain who killed Cock Robin. All we have generally learned today is that the FBI employees who processed the forms would not be in a position to decide whether the requests were appropriate or not. This hearing has focused on the narrow question of who hired Craig Livingston and whether the FBI did something wrong when it told the White House of a document in the FBI file of Craig Livingston that indicated that Bernard Nussbaum said that Mr. Livingston had the backing of the First Lady who was allegedly a friend of Mrs. Mr. Livingston's mother. What we have really learned today on this matter is what? Well, first, as I've noted, this allegation has been denied by every individual involved, including Mr. Nussbaum, the First Lady, Craig Livingston, and his mother. With respect to the agent who wrote the note, Mr. Scullin we know that he has no independent regulation of this information. To the contrary, he has stated under oath that he thought it was Mr. Livingstone who was the source of the information. On other occasions, he has testified that William Kennedy was that source. We also know that the committee had an FBI memo indicating that Mr. Scalabrini had a strong bias against the Clinton administration and that an agent was concerned about Mr. Scalabrini's truthfulness in his upcoming testimony on behalf of Billy Dale at the Dale trial. Therefore, I think it's fair to say that there are reasons to at least have some doubts about the credibility of the uninitial summary report by Mr. Scalabrini. I would note that this at his, uh, that at his interview with the Senate, Mr. Scalabrini began by alleging that Mr. Kennedy had told him of the relationship with Mrs. Livingstone and the First Lady, but by the end of that interview, admitted that he may have just inferred that fact. With respect to Mr. Shapiro's decision to notify the White House, it appears to me that the FBI was really trying to stay out of the political fight, not get into one. The implication that the question of who hired Craig Livingstone was the subject of an independent counsel investigation that has no foundation. There's no reason to believe that the independent counsel would consider this relevant, and we know that the independent counsel told the FBI they had no interest in the file, nor did they seem concerned that a congressional committee could review the file and disclose its contents to anyone, including the White House. And finally, with respect to the interview of Agent Scalabrini by the FBI, it seems normal that the FBI might want to confirm whether he recalled the Nussbaum interview and whether the inside document was in fact his. In light of questions being raised about the accuracy of FBI investigations, the FBI could have been criticized for failing to check it out. Mr. Chairman, as I have said in the past, I will support your efforts to get to the bottom of the FBI files issue, and by that I mean uh, why the files were requested and how were they used. To date, we still have no other evidence that it was anything but a terrible error, but I'm still willing to keep looking. However, these diversions into this issue of who hired Craig Livingstone suggest to me that the, that the committee has come to the end of the road in its initial investigation and is now looking for new issues to embarrass the Clinton White House. Uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I'm s I know this committee is serious, and, but if the committee is as serious as they say they are about these kinds of issues with the FBI, I hope that they will seriously consider my bill, which is H.R. 3785. And in fact, I'm going to send a letter 
to each member on the, I've already done the Democratic side, but to each member on your side of the aisle to ask them to co-sponsor my legislation and hope that they will because I too hope that they are as serious as I am about preventing this in the future. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady for her uh, closing statement. Uh, obviously, there are differences um, on, among members on uh, the issues that have transpired in, in recent weeks and uh, the significance of those of those actions that have been taken uh, by the FBI and others. I would note that in 1994, uh, the FBI director, Mr. Free, stated, as we examine the past to make the future more productive for law enforcement, I want to cite the lessons that must be learned from an event that occurred shortly before I became FBI director. It concerned a White House official calling directly to the FBI with instructions to investigate alleged wrongdoing by employees in the White House travel office. It was an unfortunate incident and an example of matters that we will avoid at all costs. When I was asked to become FBI director, I told the president that the FBI must maintain its independence and have no role in politics. President Clinton fully agrees. All of us must keep this policy uppermost in our minds at all time. No politics in the FBI, no exceptions. Unfortunately, I think uh, some of the events that have taken place with regard to notifying uh, the, FBI, or the White House of, uh, of the fact that uh, I had observed and looked at the background file involving, uh, taken by Mr. Scalabrini and the uh, giving of the uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Aldridge's book to the White House four months before it was published, I think raised the specter that uh, politics is still uh, a factor in, uh, in, uh, in the picture here and is giving the perception at least uh, that uh, the FBI's actions and documented record uh, conflict with the testimony, which I think we've heard today. The FBI wants us to think uh, would hope that we would believe that this relationship with the White House has ended, but uh, we have seen, unfortunately, that that has not been the case. The litany of actions, however, contradict it. Frankly, I'm very skeptical about the Bureau's protestations that this was a series of further innocent bureaucratic mistakes. When viewing the results of what has happened, the heads up to the White House, sending two high-profile agents to visit Mr. Scalabrini, sharing the Aldridge book with the White House, at least participating in, and having discussions with uh, the White House counsel about the letter that he was going to send to the FBI. Uh, that certainly suggested not, not an arm's length relationship. Searching through Mr. Scalabrini's work area without uh, advising him of that, giving a heads up to all who needed to do damage control long before uh, this member or this chairman uh, was advised. All of these actions uh, point, at least in my view, to a continuation of the Bureau's relationship, uh, and I think an inappropriate relationship, with the White House. There needs to be a clear firewall, a clear distinction between what goes on uh, in the FBI and the White House. And I don't think that that has been established. We would promise such a relationship would end, and yet it doesn't appear that it has. So the bottom line, I would say, uh, is that a result of Mr. Shapiro's actions, those who need and yet it doesn't appear that it has. So the bottom line, I would say, uh, is that a result of Mr. Shapiro's actions, those who needed to do damage control first were notified first, and those who were investigating were notified last. Uh, and obviously that does not sit well with, uh, with those of us who felt that our, our responsibility was to conduct this investigation and to, uh, to point out that there were serious discrepancies in testimony that had been given before this committee and uh, statements that had been given to an FBI agent. Uh, I think that the effort to sort of vilify Mr. Scalabrini, not by you, because I think you have, in fact, indicated that uh, you had no reason to doubt his word, but there have been serious efforts made to discredit Mr. Scalabrini, uh, I think is clearly uh, wrong-headed uh, and uh, inappropriate. So I think that we've had a, uh, a helpful hearing. Uh, I do, however, believe that uh, we need to pursue this matter uh, further. Uh, and I do feel very strongly that uh, the actions that uh, Mr. Shapiro has taken in this regard really uh, call in question uh, his ability to have credibility as the, uh, as the general counsel of the FBI. With that, the committee will stand adjourned.
morning, we'll air a portion of this hearing again on White House access to FBI files. The hearing airs at 4.30 Eastern Time here on C-SPAN 2. Now a look at our Campaign 96 coverage on both C-SPAN and C-SPAN 2. Next Monday through Thursday on C-SPAN, live from San Diego,